<clears throat> so, welcome uh, back. Are the people still coming? Or you can go? Okay. So, welcome back, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here uh, today. So, it's uh, my great pleasure to start this morning um, our first panel titled Globalization Beyond the West. And leading the conversation, we have uh, Professor Geoffrey Jones from Harvard Business School, and as panelists, Annette Hansen from uh, Aarhus University, Isaac Odom from Carl Carlton University, and Marlos <laughs> van Weyenborg. I hope I pronounce, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I'm hopeless, uh, from Harvard Business School. So thank you, let's give a round of applause, and uh, I leave the floor. So I should start, right? Yes. Okay. Ah. Yes. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I'd like to say just a few words before I turn over to our, our very distinguished um, panel. So the theme of our panel, right, is globalization beyond the West. The motivation is that globalization is often portrayed through a Western lens, uh, which devalues and fails to learn from many other lenses, including the lens of interactions between regions. So I work on the past and present of um, multinationals and global business. And the Western lens story is very prominent in, in that area. There's been a literature since the 1960s on multinationals from developing, developed countries investing in the developing world. Um, and far, far fewer studies of interactions between developing countries. That's beginning to change just now because of the Chinese investment in, in Africa. As a business historian, I know that ignoring these interregional flows seriously distorts our understanding of how globalization occurred. Late 19th, early 20th century sees really a vast informal network of traders and financiers um, linking together Asia and Africa through ports like Zanzibar and other places. And that's hugely important and hugely neglected in the mainstream, mainstream literatures. Um, but of course, telling this story is um, harder <laughs> than explaining the problem. Like, what exactly is the West? Uh, does it include Latin America? Does it include Japan? And Africa and Asia are continents, but they are hugely diverse in their cultures, societies, levels of of development. Are they even the correct unit of analysis? Anyway, <clears throat> my, uh, I'm the mere moderator, and my function is to, um, is to now to turn over to our, our panelists. Um, so I'll stop talking. Each panelist will talk for about five or 10 minutes. We'll then start a conversation up here, and at some stage we're gonna open out to everyone else. So our first panelist is Annette, and the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much um, I, uh, for this opportunity uh, to discuss Africa-Asia relations in North America. Uh, as an oral historian of Japan and global history, I would like to begin with a quote from Mr. Dafour, a Ghanaian alumni from Japanese management courses held under the auspices of what is called Association of Technical, or oh, sorry, Association of Overseas Technical Scholarships, uh, and he attended in 2003. I interviewed him first in Tokyo in 2009, and then in Accra in 2015, when he was working for the African Development Bank uh, with his own office in the Ghana Ministry of Finance. Uh, so, quote, when we stayed at the dorm in Tokyo, we learned time management in a way that stays with us. If you got to the dining hall one minute past lunch hour, your card for free lunch did not work. And if you got back to the dorm one minute past curfew at 9 p.m., your entry card did not work. I have taught my children and my coworkers to value time the same way." End of quote. Now, my own way 
personal way into the topic of Africa-Asia relations has so far taken me to Akka in 2015, Dar es Salaam in 2018, and New Delhi just last week. This means for me that both the concepts of globalization and the West pose significant problems, and I therefore suggested alternative panel titles, such as Circumventing Europe and the US, Enriching African and Asian Studies uh, through the study, or by switching perspective, or reframing our conversation. I think that's actually what the whole day is about. But each of these titles reflect my own response and reasons for engaging in these conversations on four continents. I strongly believe and have experienced that Asian studies in Africa and African studies in Asia have greatly benefited and enriched Asian studies and my own research in Japanese history. Currently, I'm based in Europe. The Eurocentrism attached to the two concepts of globalization and West is ripe and reflects not only a sentiment and a legacy in Europe, but also a continued interference and attempt at controlling a discourse. For me, the Asia-Africa conversations reframe my own work to encompass different understandings of time, personal relations, network making, priorities, and not least a history of the two continents and their relations that predates European power plays by millennia. Not to avoid guilt and recognition of the fact that Denmark, where I'm from, as wealth built directly on the triangular trade, but to acknowledge the very long history of relations between the two continents where Europe was either not involved at all or was at the periphery of any engagement. The conversations I'm coming from today have taught me immensely about my own place in Africa-Asia relations, but also allows me to be the observer and learner. At the, Nexus, uh, at the new Nexus of Knowledge Conference in Akka in 2015, I presented a paper on the implications of historical networks on contemporary relations between African and Asian countries and was put in my place by a question from the floor. Where's the non-aligned movement in your narrative? And ever since, NAM has occupied a central role for my understanding of the Africa-Asia relations during the Cold War as well as later. The Asia-Africa nexus is much inspired by the non-aligned movement, a movement of which most Europeans are utterly unaware. The movement, as especially Ghanaians, Egyptians, and Indians, uh, see as extremely successful in proving to themselves and others that Africans and Asians do not need Europeans or the Cold War superpowers to accomplish their goals. This was explicitly voiced repeatedly at the Rising Africa Conference in Delhi last week. However, the framing of European scholarship in the work of African and Asian scholars alike was very linear rather than circular, which intrigued me. I'm still trying to come to terms with the interpretations and the way it affected their calls for current and future Indian and Japanese involvement in African countries, where natural resources, capacity development, foreign direct investment, and security took the floor and ignored any sense of repetition of European patterns of engagement. My role as a European scholar is not to steer or direct, but rather follow, observe, and interpret what scholars based in Africa and Asia publish, present, and discuss. However, I am allowed, as the outsider, to ask the difficult questions such as, how do you expect to rid yourself of the colonial discourse and priorities if your framework seems very similar to the European and North American involvement in Africa and Asia. One of the answers is the perception that as opposed to Europe and the US, Asian tigers, India and Japan can be technologically advanced and industrialized without giving, giving up on traditions. Turkey can build an airport and a mosque in the center of Akha in Ghana. Now time as an historian, this is closest to my interest, and I acutely experienced the value attached to time, as I was also quoting Dafour, um, relational time, I call it. It's, it's time, and, and it leads me to questions such as, is time for closeness and immersion more important than being on time? Are delays worse than accidents because of somebody hurrying? What is the significance of the bonding around African time and Indian time? Perceptions of time is also seen in perceptions of the modern and tradition. When did tradition exist? Where is it now? And how does tradition relate to the modern? 
what mattered. In, China, no, sorry, in Ghana, industrialization is still on the agenda as my co-PI, George Achampong, convinced me after I expressed my initial hesitation because to me the term was so inherently connected to 18th century Britain. Now, that is perhaps where Japan, India, and other countries come in because within capacity development, Japan and India focus on specific skills, paving the road for future foreign di direct investment to enhance local opportunities for industrialization. In 2019, Japan announced at the Tokyo International Conference for African Development, TCAT 7, the first TCAT, um, Tokyo, oh, sorry, the first TCAT was uh, held in Yokohama in 1993, that Toyota would open an assembly plant in Ghana, providing jobs and a chance to assemble Tokyo cars for the Ghanaian market, but also markets in other African countries. Based on my own research, I would claim that this was a decision prepared by Toyota for close to 65 years. During this period, Toyota has, in collaboration with the Japanese Association for Overseas Technical Scholarships, which is financed partly by Toyota and partly by official development assistance, challenged through the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, as it was called, called most of these 65 years, offered courses for professionals such as Mr. Dafour in more than 140 countries in technical skills, specifically in technical skills and management philosophy, ensuring that there is an employee base within countries such as Ghana to run an assembly factory according to Japanese standards and values, not least people who understand the value of quality and time in the same way as Toyota. This way, most importantly, with the, the sort of very focused uh, capacity development, um, means that Africa-Asia relations offer alternatives to contact steeped in the colonial past or represent what Professor Biswas last week referred to as an organic relationship because of shared experiences of being colonized. One example of alternatives and a multitude of options I take from our own research project on port effectiveness and public-private cooperation for competitiveness in Ghana, uh, PEP2, which I try to lead in as equitable a manner as possible when the money comes from Denmark, mm -hmm. and we can certainly talk about funding. Our team of six Ghanaian and two Danish researchers explore research questions related to governance, communication, and sustainability in the port of uh, Tema in Ghana. One of our findings is that in spite of the many strong Ghanaian actors in the maritime sector, they often hesitate to plan because they await foreign investments. We have identified numerous foreign actors, such as Japan in designing the master plan of the port, France and Denmark in managing the concession of a new terminal, which they, France and Denmark, hired the, Jap no, hired the Chinese company, Czech, to construct. And South Korea in providing the digital software for running all shipping in and out of the terminals. In my opinion, I see this sorry, hesitation among qualified Ghanaians as the largest obstacle to independence. In 2008, Morten Elfiave and I wrote an introduction to our edited volume, Aid Relationships in Asia, where we developed the concept of donor management as an opportunity for aid recipients to choose between offers. In the case of economic development, the many potential investors can be managed, but it requires strong direction within states. Now, as an historian, I do not attempt, sorry, to predict the future or suggest trajectories, but I personally benefit from the reframing of research questions within our field through the introduction of new perspectives and strongly believe that the sharing of multitudes of perspectives and ways of engagement also in economic devel development will affect change and have followed some of these changes closely in Ghana over the past eight years. I now look forward to our conversation as it develops during the day, and will be happy to answer specific questions to my research in Ghana, India, and Japan as well. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac. OK, thank you so much for uh, having me this morning. So I want to start by broadly speaking in the context of uh, the team for our conference. 
to look at competing views about um, globalization, economic globalization, and how that connects to uh, Africa, Asia, and specifically uh, Africa, West Africa, I mean, China, Africa relations. And, and I, I would also make reference, like I to, to Ghana uh, later on in my, in my discussion. There is, in my view, an establishment view that suggests that uh, economic globalization played a crucial role in China's economic transformation. And, um, and that is how, in the last decade, China has been able to move uh, millions of people out of poverty. And now this argument does not suggest that economic globalization hasn't had negative effect across the world, right? It has. There are um, several examples out there to talk about. Um, but we should also mention that the growth in China's economy is not just because of uh, economic globalization. I think it's important to also highlight the role of uh, hardworking Chinese uh, nationals, but also the role of Chinese leadership in uh, opening China's economy gradually to uh, the world economy. And so th that's, that's uh, an important thing to make. But China <coughs> um, hasn't only benefited from economic globalization. As President Xi has mentioned, China has also contributed to economic globalization. And uh, it has added to the momentum of world economic growth and specifically has contributed to economic uh, development across the global south and specifically across Africa. Uh, and of course, we have seen this through the provision of global goods, such as uh, fast and cheap infrastructure project across, uh, across Africa. And of course, one concrete example that we can talk about here is uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, basically aims to uh, bring infrastructure development investment uh, and deepening of trade ties, but also uh, investment across uh, or between China and its partners in Europe, in Africa, uh, and in Asia. So, so that's, that's one view. And then there's also the, what you can call anti or anti-establishment view uh, that suggests that, and, and you can, this view, you can get this view in China and, and also elsewhere, that the West has tried or tries to um, use globalization to universalize its model of liberal democracy and uh, market-based capitalism. And, and the argument here is that um, this view points to the, uh, both the, uh, the uh, what you may call the um, hypocritical and hegemonic nature of this project of universalizing um, uh, Western ideas and Western thought and Western framings. And what do they mean by hypocr hypocritical uh, aspect? The emphasis on the hypocritical aspect is this idea that the West has written uh, or wrote uh, the global rules that governs uh, globalization and uh, expect other countries to follow, even though sometimes it does not, the West itself does not, and here broadly speaking, I'm talking about the West in general, that, and, and, and perhaps US in particular, but it does not follow the same standard that it set for, for the rest of the world. So that is the uh, hypocritical view of, of how, um, of uh, economic globalization. The other dimension of the hegemonic critique is, comes from this idea that uh, the West uses its power to promote one size fit all model of political, economic, and social um, organization around the world. And, and this critical view suggests that, or insists that, we should be able to have different models 
of um, of of globalization or of, of of engagement across across the world, and that the guiding principle of this model or different models should be multi multi uh, multipolarity, not hegemony. And so, this is where I think Asia and and Africa fit in within that context of looking for. Uh, uh, multipolarity or multiple, multiple uh, ways of, of life, ways of being. And so this is where I, in my research, where I come in and, and to speak about the nature of, or the changing nature of Africa-China relations in that, in that context, from, this, from, that, from that view. But it's also important to mention that uh, to really understand the nature and the evolving nature of Africa-China relations, broadly speaking, we need to understand the context of Africa's uh, own evolution since independence. Because the increasing relations between African countries and China is coming uh, after several decades of Africa's economic engagement with Western countries. And I think that, that context is, is also very important because it is on the, backs of, on the back of economic liberalization or uh, economic globalization that made Africa opened its, uh, itself or its market to China in the same way, the same imperative that motivated China's engagement across Africa, right? So it is within the same uh, understanding of, of uh, globalization. Uh, and so in, in my work, I tend to see uh, that what we are witnessing in terms of the increasing engagement between Africa, broadly speaking, and, and China, it's not really a paradigm shift. Uh, it is to a very large extent uh, uh, a power shift in terms of development cooperation. It is not changing structurally um, uh, Africa's economic base, not at all. Uh, at least we haven't, I haven't, we haven't seen uh, evidence of that. So, um, but that is not to say that the evolving relationship between Africa and Asia is not uh, phenomenal. It is fundamental. It is, it is recasting Africa's development landscape, uh, even more so uh, in, in recent times. But another catch is that China, and I'm, I'm focusing here on China, uh, its engagement across Africa, China is unique in several ways. Of course, China's interest, whether it is economic, political, cultural, social interest across Africa is no different from the West interest in Africa. What, in my view, seems to be different is how the practices and the additional motivation that China employs in it in legitimizing its engagement across Africa. And for me, those present, in my work, the opportunity for Africans to express their agency. And so later on, I'll, I'll be able to speak to some of my specific work and, and how it relates to this. But when I talk about China's uniqueness, uh, what I mean by that is China occupies a very ambiguous position across Africa. On the one hand, uh, China's own struggle with underdevelopment uh, and its status as a developing country with, who has no colonial history across Africa affords Beijing a historical legitimacy in the eyes of most African uh, elite. And this is what China leverages in its engagement across Africa. But my work and those of others is open to not viewing China as, or, or, or uh, uh, China's position in the South or China's position in, in, the, in Africa should not be seen as uh, any, any uh, more benevolent than any, any other uh, actors across, across Africa. So th this, is, this is how I, I tend to look at um, Africa-China uh, or Asia-Africa relations and specifically um, uh, China-Ghana relations over the years in my own, in my own work. And uh, if I still have more time, if not, I would, I would pass it over and then, and then come back to these conversations. Maybe we should move to Perfect. more or less. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Jeff, thanks so much for, for bringing this together. Um, 
I'm an economic historian. I work on comparative African economic history. I do comparative work um, with African and Asian economies. Um, and so some of my reflections today will kind of come from that perspective. So since I like thinking about, especially about economic change over very long time horizons, um, I think that um, the first thing that came to mind when I think about this is, what is the world going to look like in 2100? 80% of world population is going to be in Africa and Asia. And that is such a kind of profound way of thinking how important this question really is, because this is where the world is headed, right? Like this is going to be um, a big um, change, both in terms of the economic weight of the, um, of the world, in terms of the geopolitical weight African and Asian countries are carrying. Um, now, of course, this is largely driven by population growth on the African continent. Um, the African continent now counts about 1.4 billion people. By 2100, this is supposedly or expected to grow to about 4 billion people. And as a result, you know, Africa and Asia will be roughly um, equivalent in terms of population size. So that's one of the horizons I try to think about, like where, um, uh, what is the larger context in which some of these changes um, are occurring. So the next panel um, is going to speak much deeper about the historical relations. Um, but for me, as an economic historian, it's very difficult to think about questions of like, where are we in terms of globalization today without taking into account where we have been and where we are going um, uh, towards. Um, so in some of my later remarks, um, this will probably kind of shine through um, a, a little bit. Now, the, first, the second thing that came to mind is like, we have to be very careful, I think, when we think about the labels Africa and Asia, um, but for different reasons. I think um, both are very diverse parts of the world, but when we think about Asia, we can really think of like, there's one big dominant player that kind of dominates the conversation, the bulk of the, uh, of the trade, the bulk of the investment. Um, there's growing diversification, I think, between Africa and Asia, Asia but China is taking up a, 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 a large space um, uh, in this domain. So I think that's, um, and, and to the extent that we see that on the African continent, um, uh, there's a lot of variety, there's lots um, uh, of different uh, types of economies that are uh, engaged in these trade relations. Um, but I wouldn't be able to point to one that kind of dominates as much as China does uh, in, in the Asia context. Um, the second thing is that um, I think we should also be very careful as much as kind of the, the Chinese um, message of equal partners um, and we don't, um, uh, we don't take a position um, is that we are not talking about um, economies that are in the same uh, position. We are talking about one highly industrialized uh, country by now, um, and many countries um, that in terms of their um, overall GDP, in terms of their economic complexity and their dependence <laughs> um, uh, to the outs, to, um, to foreign investment, um, are, you know, in a, in a more vulnerable position in that sense, or they, they, they're, they're not, um, um, when they come to trade partners to the table, that is something to take into account, and especially African countries when they think about their own uh, position and, and their long run interest. So um, at this moment, um, it is China who exports manufactured goods to African countries largely. It imports raw materials. And China, of course, is trying to secure its access to what it sees as fundamental access, not just to um, natural resources, but also um, uh, to, to produce, to um, uh, food. Um, so I think that this is kind of the, the context in which um, um, I look at it. And, and the question I asked myself before coming here is like, what would be in the interest mostly of African economies? If we're thinking that there is one kind of like, you know, trading partner that's, you know, is trying to use its larger economic and political leverage um, to get the best deal. Um, are African countries doing the same thing um, when it comes to the table and what would be kind of like something they um, uh, should be kind of factoring in as they're going to the table. So one thing um, that came to mind is it, that it's uh, one of the, the kind of the blessings of course of this growing intensification is that um, it diversifies um, dependency from the West, but it's important to keep that in mind as well within Asia, right? Like to diversify 
um, trading partners um, in Asia in order to kind of hedge against some of the volatility that might come if there's one another big partner. Um, <coughs> and I think that we're, we're seeing growing signs of that. If we're looking at the, the latest kind of volumes of trade and the growing rate at which trade um, um, is occurring with Japan, um, with South Korea, um, with India, um, it's also important because um, the economic recovery um, in China has been, after COVID, has been uh, fairly slow, and that affects the continent, especially as it uh, integrates. Um, the second thing is, um, um, especially when taking out loans um, from China, to be very um, aware of some of the conditions. Um, in, in many cases that I have read about, um, I wish um, um, there were better terms for the African partners in terms of um, how much, um, uh, for example, um, should Chinese companies be a allowed to bring all of their workers over? Um, why are we not solving this enough on the ground uh, with, with African workers? Um, in terms of um, the, the penalties that come for um, when loans are not paid on time. And of course, internally, um, that uh, in African countries, there is a conversation between how much borrowing is responsible um, and is this starting to crowd out investments that should also be made inside of these countries in sustaining their own fiscal capacity, because in a way, this also relieves them of a more painful process um, of building um, uh, their own um, uh, and strengthening their own revenue base. And then um, the final um, thought that came to mind, and this is kind of basing a little bit on, on, on my own work I've done on comparisons, is um, uh, one of the things that um, I will be watching with very great interest on the African continent itself is how the continent has the promise and kind of shows the first signs of it of instead of always looking towards outside trading partners for a large share of that to strengthen its internal markets, and we're seeing signs of that with the, the foundation of the Af uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, but if we're looking at the infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure still kind of follows the very familiar pattern of colonialism, roads towards the exit of the continent, um, whereas this is going to be a continent of four billion domestic consumers. And China's historical growth path has in part been built on the fact that it was on a labor-intensive um, export-led industrialization model, but it also benefited greatly from having an internal market that was large and that was relatively well integrated. So um, should we be hoping that African countries follow some of the processes that have been um, uh, that have occurred in Asia? Is this the, the development model? Um, is this the way to grow, to grow out of poverty? And in order to answer that question, I think we need to look much more carefully towards the long run history of um, the African continent, which was historically um, labor scarce, land abundant, and many Afri Asian economies that were historically um, land scarce and labor abundant, and that fit in a, that was kind of a natural adaptation in some ways to deeper structures. There's great literature out there now, I think in my field, in, in global economic history, that takes this seriously. And I, I think this is going to be very helpful to every now and then take a step back and reflect on um, where are these economies coming from from a long run perspective and how can that help us think about optimizing um, under their new opportunities, there are also new challenges and new pitfalls. Um, so um, my um, big hope is that um, this is an opportunity, especially for, for the African continent, which in most cases will be um, you know, the more vulnerable trading partner um, based on the size of the economies, et cetera, um, that they're um, uh, creating good terms for themselves, that they cooperate with each other to, s to have a, a, um, a, a, a unified message um, and, and get the best uh, out of this, these new opportunities. So. Thank you very much, Malus. <clears throat> well, I have a feeling we're going to talk quite a lot about Africa and China <laughs> some, <coughs> somehow, but I, could I just ask, uh, Annette, uh, something? This, you, you very articulately described how still many problems are conceptualized in Western terms, right? Euro, Euro dominance terms. I, I, I was just wondering, do you think elite universities like Harvard are part of the problem or part of the solution? <laughs> well, hopefully, they'll be part of the solution. But I also think that some of the issues around 
solutions or as it's coming out of academia um, is a lot of the, um, well, everything from publications to, I mean, now mm -hmm. we, we try to, out of my project, we're, we're publishing open access. But it costs like three, four thousand dollars per article, which means, yes, it's open access, so everybody can read it all over the world. But they, there is no way that an independent scholar or any scholar at a university elsewhere that doesn't have a grant together with Harvard or Aarhus University or whatever can publish open access, right? So the knowledge coming out of other places is that's what I think Harvard's role is to try and see how, how mm. or uh, European universities, I mean, how can we give give these voices equal. I was also on a research council in Denmark where we were constantly discussing whether people could apply from universities in the global south or whether there had to be a PI from Denmark, mm. right, or from a Danish institution. And I was vehemently arguing that it had to also come from somewhere else. And then we were like, well, but the standards and the academic, you know, whatever. And I said, well, let's look at what the value is from these projects because who, who sets the standards anyway, right? I mean, also in the re reviewers and in journals or whatever. So, so I think that's really, it's somehow opening up the field that's gonna be the challenge <laughs> if these universities still have a role. I think there's a problem too with international conferences. They're often held in places that people from voices from the Africa and Asia can't be heard. And that just distorts the conversation so much. Or, or they're online. <coughs> And then there were the African participants were, were, were zoomed in, which was great. But um, mm. oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I mean, the people from 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 the African countries were, were zoomed in, whereas the Indians were there, right? So it gave an unbalanced uh, conversation, definitely. So let's open it up. Um, so you mean the, the role of the academy in terms yeah, of, yeah. of, of um, knowledge production? And well, in, 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 in my own work, one of the things that I've sought to do is to be consciously uh, intentional about um, who I'm hearing in terms of uh, uh, in my research on, on the African continent. Uh, but also um, who I'm not hearing. And so in my, in, in my work, I have sought to um, go beyond uh, uh, African um, elite and, and uncovering the stories of those non-state actors. But this is possible, or you, you're able to do this when you are engaged in ethnography or, or field research. And of course, uh, you need uh, funding to be able to do some of this research, to be able to uh, speak to a uh, um, research part participant or uh, colleagues, really. In some cases, these are not just <coughs> subjects that you go to for, for, for information or for data. But these, these kinds of field research uh, requires uh, money and funding and resources. And, and it's uh, either uh, university institutions or uh, funding institutions that do that. And the challenge is that a lot of these institutions that are funding uh, or that are interested in funding these kinds of research uh, are based in this part of the world, right? And so, uh, but the other dimension that I'm seeing in my, in my own work on, on uh, broadly speaking, on Africa-China relations is the emergence of uh, non-academic institutions uh, in Africa that are becoming interested not just in the teaching of uh, Asia-Africa relations, but also uh, the dissemination of information. Uh, so we are seeing a few numbers of uh, think tanks that are outside of the university mm -hmm. uh, that are springing up. So I, I, I was in Ghana uh, two months ago, and, and I, I met, met two of those institutions um, that, are, that are at the forefront of producing knowledge that is not tied to the academy or that is not um, even affiliated at all, have nothing to do with the universities across uh, Ghana. So uh, in my view is that there is some sort of knowledge that emanate from those corners that uh, perhaps speak more broadly to uh, people outside of the academy, uh, speak to 
um, policy makers and, and also speak to issues that confront ordinary people that are uh, on the receiving side, if you, will, if you want, on the receiving side of this uh, growing uh, engagement between Africans and their Chinese, in my, in my Chinese counterpart. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So Jeff, do you want me to speak so specifically about Harvard? Because that was the original question, or should I? <laughs> I, I should thought I of Harvard broadly? as like a... Why not? <laughs> and, and then we'll move away from <laughs> after. <laughs> It's their last Harvard comment, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the way, um, I think that there are a lot more opportunities that we're not using yet. Um, I, I just returned um, from a conference in South Africa uh, in my field in African economic history, um, and this was only the second time our conference was held on the continent. Um, this is a problem, right? This is because a lot of our colleagues um, that are coming when we are hosting it on the continent um, are from, from African countries themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are, there are opportunities um, where um, univer big universities with a lot of resources can find partner institutions um, and make this, help this um, um, uh, become more and more of the norm. Um, so it's, it, I, I think that we're not yet using all of the uh, the opportunities that um, that are out there to, to make this, you know, uh, it's we will not never get it completely right, but there there are a lot more more steps we can uh, say, and I think that it does make a difference. Like I, th the hybrid model you spoke about, right? Like part of it is also we sit with each other around the table, we have a cup of coffee, we make those personal connections. I think most people who, you know, live through the the Zoom era will say there is, it's very hard to replace those one-on-one -on -one conversations and it's just not a good practice when we continuously siphon that off. So um, I would put the burden on the universities with the, you know, the financial resources and the grant institutions to really um, put much more emphasis on um, bringing people together physically in a location where it is possible for as many uh, people to come as possible. So we continue the theme of knowledge, but it's an edge towards China and Africa. And I, was, I was wondering how, how deep our knowledge is of what China is doing in Africa and its impact. How much do we really, how much do we really know and what do, don't we uh, know? I mean, I hear all sorts of, I read casually all sorts of stuff about the impact on human rights, the impact on the environment. Um, as well as the impact on, on development, but I, uh, yeah, I'm no expert. How, so how deep is our knowledge and where are the holes in all of this? There's only one China expert here, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so two ways I can respond to this question. Uh, in terms of how much we know of China's activity across Africa, I think there's, I think we know a lot about um, what China is doing or not doing uh, across, across Africa. My, my, my view is actually that we don't know much about what Africans are doing uh, in, terms of what, in terms of their, uh, either how they're receiving or how they are responding or re reacting to Chinese engagement. Um, and, 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 but if you look at the trajectory of um, of the research on, on China's engagement across Africa, you would notice that, and I think Professor uh, Champon was speaking to this yesterday when he talked about 2007 when he held a conference here. This was the time where I think he, he, they discussed uh, Chris Alden's book, but since then, every, like I have an alert on, on, on Google Alert, every, there is no single week that you don't have any publication coming out of, of uh, uh, of Africa's, I mean, China's in engagement across Africa. There's always something coming out, right? Mm -hmm. But so there is, there is a lot that we know. It, it, it used to be that uh, there was a lot of focus on um, macro level, state elite relationship. Uh, that is moving. Uh, there are new themes that really is capturing a lot of the non-state actors. Uh, and and of, as we know, there are multiple Chinas across Africa, right? So. It's not just the government, and I'm sure those who talk about um, later on this afternoon will have those discussions. There is multiple Chinese, Chinese actors across Africa, and of course they are engaging diverse African actors. But there's, but there's a huge uh, body of work that is, that is going there. Uh, uh, my view is that there is not the same amount of work 
in terms of um, how, how Africans are responding to, to that engagement. So that's one part. The last part is, um, is how much do we know of China? I think there is a, there's a, a big gap, especially when it comes to um, uh, African decision makers' knowledge base on, 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 on China who, who, uh, and, and Chinese practices and, and Chinese politics at home and how that impact Chinese behavior across Africa. I mean, there are still some African leaders that um, does not appreciate the fact that uh, China is no longer uh, lending or is no longer going to be lending to Africans or Chinese institutions are no longer going to be lending to, you know, to African uh, uh, development like it did compared to uh, five or even 10 years ago, right? Some, some still, and I don't know whether it's just maybe they are not, they believe it differently and they're just speaking, speaking differently, but uh, there is, a, there is a, a knowledge gap on, on how much African elite know about China and how the China complex operates. And I think that's why a whole, a whole Ghanaian delegation <coughs> would think that um, a visit, just a, a mere mention of a visit to China would, would reconfigure China, uh, Ghana's indebtedness to China. That, that's, that's not how it works. Like, uh, and, and, and you cannot be planning a trip to Beijing at a time when, when China is having a, a national a Congress. It, there's a very, like sometimes it's very, it doesn't make sense, some of the miscalculations or misunderstandings of how uh, China, there was a recent Twitter X um, sort of episode where, uh, I don't have the details, I'm not going to go into it, but, but a Chinese official called one of Africa's leaders out in terms of, uh, of, of how they got even Chinese officials position, their rank and position and what they do, they got it entirely wrong. So that suggests to you that there is, there is a, a gap in terms of how much our African elite know about, about China mm -hmm. and, and how China works. So, nice. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I cannot say much um, more detailed uh, uh, than our expert Isaac here um, did. Um, if I think of it from the perspective of um, um, uh, African leaders, there, there's always a part um, when, you, um, when you trade and you engage with a trading partner that you don't know in advance, right? Like um, more and more information has unfolded over the last decade plus. Um, we've seen the, both the opportunities and the costs um, of in, uh, deepening um, trade relations and dependency uh, uh, on China. Um, I think that one uh, thing is, is, is very valuable in, in this context, and that is that instead of speculating about what is going to happen on the, on the side of China, what, but that, that there is a very clear um, understanding and strategy on the side of um, the African partners, what they want to get out of these partnerships and where the vulnerabilities could be. Um, so um, that, um, in that sense, that they're kind of hedging a little bit against risk. But like I said, I, I, I also think it's really important for, for um, countries on the continent to deepen their trade relations with each other and not just to kind of make Asia relations the kind of next um, frontier. It's, it's a wonderful development, but it's as important that internal um, trade and connections are being, being um, strengthened. So what are the obstacles to those, building those connections? To building those connections, I mean, historically, um, it, it, part of this is a little bit of path dependence, right? Like African uh, countries um, with starting, um, well, even before um, uh, um, colonialism, but of course there has always been a, a very strong um, export tendency um, outside of the continent of raw materials. Um, we're seeing now that that is more and more being diversified to trade um, with Asia. Um, all of the infrastructure was built historically towards, um, uh, you know, sea-bound external trade. Um, geographically, there are challenges. Politically, there are challenges. Um, and low population densities in the region also made it m probably less effective or less cost-effective mm. to, to, um, to invest there. But that is exactly what is changing in the century ahead. Um, so um, strengthening these kind of naturally growing internal markets um, should be part 
of the conversation um, and part of the strategy alongside with the deepening um, relations um, uh, with Asian countries. Anna, do you? Yeah, no, I just had a comment in terms of, of I mean, I completely agree with the intra continental and, and, and um, trade uh, relations, and that is very big with the free, free agreement, trade agreement now, and was also talked about very much in Delhi last week. Uh, but I think uh, there is actually quite an infrastructure. I think it's also that we are blind to it. I mean, the geography certainly makes certain things more complicated, but um, I think uh, not least the Sahel and the Sahara, the, 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 that, that kind of roots, um, I think, are, are, are very strong and much stronger than we see from the Europe or from the US. Um, I think the, the, the whole sort of towards the, the, the coast, certainly on West Africa, but it, because I think that's the, the, the real major difference is, of course, the difference between different parts of the African continent. And, and even in our discussion now, we've not really mentioned, well, we mentioned Ghana and South Africa, right? But we haven't, you know, otherwise diversified our, our uh, look into these different uh, countries. So I think, um, I, yeah, I think the infrastructure, we have to think about it also in, in, in different ways, because I think that there are, there are many ways in which there is actually um, communication and engagement across the, the continent. Just a reply, it's like, I, part of it is, I think it's, a, it's not just physical infrastructure, but it's also kind of like, um, uh, just the historic orientation has always been that. It is resonated by development agencies, right? Like it's, um, the implicit message often is um, the best strategy for development now is replicating the export-led oriented model um, um, that many Asian economies have, um, have followed. How to compete in the global economy. And um, I have serious reservations with whether that is the best um, development mm -hmm. strategy for, for African countries. Um, whether a, a heavier focus on um, um, de you know, um, developing manufacturing oriented towards the domestic market might be a better strategy than trying to compete in global export markets because um, as is, wage costs are not low enough for that. Um, it's like they have to, these economies have to so-called rise in a context where there have just been major competitors. So what do you want to do? Do you want to go on a policy um, of r wage repression? Is that in the interest of the larger development aims? Um, I think actually that internal, um, uh, internally oriented strategies, which will not generate growth as probably as spectacularly fast, but is probably going to be um, a more um, uh, sustainable um, solution. Wow. Yeah. Now, I'm not an economist at all, or economic historian, and I'm not a China expert at all, almost by definite choice and trying to, to focus on all the other Asian uh, players on the African continent. Uh, but certainly, I, what I'm seeing is, I mean, just with what happened in Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, whatever, I mean, and, and the Kuma's choices in terms of collaborators, there's certainly a lot of colonial legacies, but I'm also seeing <coughs> so many other ways of engaging across the continent that I think, but it's not, I would never be able to come up with the numbers because that's not what I do for my, um, it's much more in terms of personal relations and how people are interacting and, and transferring ideas, for example, and co-creation of ideas that I'm seeing in, in many different ways across the continent. But. I was thinking we should probably time to open it up for, for um, Q&A, because you've said so many things and we haven't. <laughs> we need, Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Han Luoyang, and I'm from uh, uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. And I, oh, yeah, so I would uh, actually like to uh, ask uh, what uh, Professor Van Wagenberg at the end said about this internal oriented uh, model. That's, uh, I would uh, say, exactly is what the Chinese are doing in Africa. Actually, the so called uh, export oriented model. It looks like it takes uh, the China's uh, path, but it's only promoted by the 
uh, some international institutes and also by Justin Lin, uh, so the World Bank former uh, chief economist. But actually, I did the uh, research, field research on the ground, and exactly the Chinese businessmen, they are not going, uh, following this, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, theories. They actually, from their own intuition and their own practical interests, they just uh, find the Africa this market was largely neglected by the global uh, this, uh, companies. So therefore, they are actually, what are they are doing in manufacturing or in uh, even agricultural processing? And uh, the, largely, they focus on the uh, domestic market. And in almost each African country, like in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, you can find hundreds of these uh, uh, producers just uh, producing for mainly for, it's actually also developing the local market. It's not just uh, import substitution, as previously these economists rejected, but it's actually to, open, to really discover the neglected demand and then to uh, actually it also brings a, have a lot of spillover effect to have this uh, uh, local competitors and uh, local suppliers to work together. So I just want to uh, really appreciate this point to explain actually uh, mainly uh, like a Washington image of Asia, but not the really Asia in on the ground. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for that comment. Um, so um, it, this, is, this is very helpful and it, it, it gives us kind of another window into what is really going on and what we're not always maybe seeing as much in the larger. The, the way I was thinking about it more is in like the, the larger development strategies are kind of pushing African economies on a, um, on a path of um, export-led growth, right? Like, you know, in trying to compete in these global export markets. And I think there are a number of reasons um, that are kind of deep, more kind of deep historical reasons why um, that's going to be very challenging for many African economies at this moment in time. And that the orientation on these um, domestic markets and uh, continental uh, integration is really kind of something that is probably um, a wiser development strategy than trying to compete in global export markets at all costs, because that's going to require a lot of um, um, things like wage repression. Um, there's newcomers still coming from uh, or kind of newcomers, latecomers um, in this global export market coming from Asia where the wage costs are so incredibly low. But this, um, so thinking about things, places like uh, India, Bangladesh, right? Like before, the only country that's that, that, that does it um, seems to be Ethiopia. Um, and that's where wage costs are probably among the lowest. So, um, but um, to, uh, to your point, it's, it's, it's I also think it's, it's um, uh, there's the part where the, the, the partner in this, so China um, is part of that conversation, um, African governments themselves. And I think also um, purely um, um, the, the sheer magnitude of the demographic transformation that is taking place is also gonna give a, uh, an, an impulse to this process because all of these internal markets are gonna become more and more dense and gonna require um, more and more goods um, to be um, produced uh, locally. It's going to solve the problem of, um, you know, uh, uh, very um, uh, markets that are not dense enough. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you for, for sharing um, this. Isaac, would you like to? Um, I was going to say something else on this, but, um, well, the, the thing, like, Tying two points together on this about the, the um, increasing intra-African trade and, and uh, trying to avoid uh, um, Africa becoming just uh, producer of raw materials to the external world, Th this is one of the main reasons behind the idea of the uh, Africa continental free trade uh, area. Now, the, the thing that we have to always take note of is that uh, Africa, as we have all mentioned, is not, it's very, it's very diverse. And th this diversity also relates to uh, political leadership and what they think and, and how they think uh, in terms of what the future ought to look like. And this goes back all the way right after independence when, when Nkrumah and others were calling for African unity now, right? There, there were other leaders who were opposed to it. But 
within the context of these uh, Africa free trade, uh, Africa uh, continental free trade area, one of the things you would notice is that there's an external component of the reasons why there has been a slow progress in terms of in intra-African trade. And, and beyond the borders and the geography and everything, there is also a component of uh, external uh, role. So for example, Nigeria refused to, to, to basically sign the, the agreement for, for, for a while because Nigeria, Nigerian manufacturing industry within Nigeria were very concerned about the rules of origin of goods, right? That the concern was that you, can, you, you would have product coming in from Europe to one African country, and then it goes from one African country to the other as if those goods were produced in, within Africa, right? So, so and, and, and then they were concerned about how that was going to flood out or uh, uh, push out local industry within Nigeria. So, because Africans have signed on to so many pact economic agreement, right, with, the, with Europe, uh, the African opportunities and growth out with, with the USA. And so the concern has been that uh, we really have to define the issue of, uh, uh, I mean, country of origin, for example, but also bigger issues of, like I said, national interest. Uh, not not uh, every country is in the same position uh, as the others, even when you talk about insecurity across, uh, across the continent. Uh, some countries, uh, as we know what's going on with uh, multiple coup d'etat, that the, the focus is not so much on, on, on uh, ec economic trade, of course, even though that, that is happening, but political stability and insecurity. Those are, those, you need that, that's what ECOWAS has learned. ECOWAS has learned that for in economic integration to happen, first you need to keep the peace, you need to have the peace and stability before you can even go into uh, any, any discussion about uh, trade at all, uh, at mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah. My name is Saifuddin Adam. I am based in uh, Japan. Uh, it was mentioned that China is unique in its relations with Africa, including in the ideational motivation of its economic engagement. A source of this uniqueness relates to the fact that China has never colonized Africa or has never had colony in Africa. But China never colonized Africa doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have, uh, or rather it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it doesn't want to be a new colonial power in Africa. <laughs> in fact, China's new diplomacy in Africa could result in new, new, new imperialism mm. fueled by China's hunger for Africa's resources, in my view. Uh, however, this doesn't mean that China is going to fly Chinese flags on African territory or build schools to produce Mandarin-speaking Africans or uh, in, in, in the same way as uh, European, Europeans did uh, in the 20th century. And my second brief comment relates to the relationship between uh, or, or uh, relates to the question of how much do we know about Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, of course, a lot of publications about China in Africa, as already mentioned. But does that necessarily mean that we really know about Africa as much as we should know? What the growing number of publications actually suggest is that there is growing interest in the subject. But I think a case can be made that the intellectual output about China in Africa today is mostly uncritical discourse about the engagement. Thank you very much. Mm. I, I okay, I, yeah, I, I want to <laughs> respond to uh, Professor Adam's uh, comment. On. Uh, so starting from your last point about that a lot of work that are coming out are not critical of the engagement. I, I mean, I would agree with you on, on, on that front. Uh, although I should, I should also mention that um, really, I, you don't expect to have uh, common, common or similar views of people in terms of what, what's happening uh, with China's engagement across Africa. And, and you, you wrote uh, about 
those who are uh, sino pessimists and optimists and pragmatists, right? You wrote that. So, so there, are, there are competing views out there. And, and so there are those who will not be critical uh, in terms of uh, what they are seeing based on where they are standing, their positionality and everything. But when I made a comment about the uniqueness of, of, of China in Africa, uh, I was referring not necessarily in terms of, uh, um, I, my, my point was to highlight the fact that, number one, that uh, broadly speaking, on the, on the general level, China or, or China's interest across Africa is no different <coughs> from any other external power's interest in Africa. That's number one. Number two, I mentioned that, but the, the, the instrument, the mechanism, the, the, the rhetoric that China deploys in, in its engagement with Africa it's, it's different from how, uh, how African leaders perceive or, or Africans perceive how their relationship uh, uh, with, with Europe. And, and, and let me give you an example. In my own work in West Africa, one of the things that I've noticed is this idea, uh, and, and, and this is changing, but I want to highlight that first. There is this view among a lot of uh, African elite and, and, and policy makers that um, China's attitude and and, and Chinese rhetoric is more attractive to them, uh, at least in, 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 I mean, to them, um, compared to the kind of rhetoric that comes out with their engagement uh, historically uh, with, with, with European powers. And what do, I, what do they mean by that? They talk about it. China does not make a mention of what the so-called salvation discourse. It's not in Africa to save Africa, right? It does not use the same pseudo-emancipatory discourse. Right, but they talk about win-win mutual benefit uh, rhetoric, and 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 of course, when you peel down, you would know that that's not really what's happening. Uh, but so I guess that's that, that's part of what I was I was referring to. There is there is that ideational uh, part that we often overlook, and and that in my view, were some of the earliest uh, attractive attract, attractiveness to Africa uh, that attract attract African leaders to to, to China. But we should, know, we should not make any uh, mistake to think, like you said, that there are not elements of exploitation, even neo-imperial relations uh, in, 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 in China's engagement across Africa. But of course, here, we are all sort of generalizing. But we know that these outcomes are going to be very different depending on which African countries or even which sectors of Africa's economy that we, that we are talking about. So. Yeah, I just wanted to add, at the conferences I was at, both in Accra and in Da in 15 and 18, I would say that the predominant sort of uh, presentations were, or most of the presentations were on China's engagement on the African continent in various countries. The, the researchers came from many different countries in Africa. Um, and they were highly critical. I mean, there, there were a few that were sort of presenting it as something positive, but by far most of them were very critical. And I think that is actually also leading to, to this question of the think tanks or the Harvard's role or academia, because I think that we, if, if we fight hard enough, I think we still have academic freedom also at most universities at the, in the African continent and in Asia, so that we, we can actually go in and question things that think tanks might not quite be able to because think tanks are often researchers that are appointed by certain policymakers who are really looking for a certain outcome or a certain advice, right, and, and evidence to back that up. So I think actually the African study, no, the Asian studies programs at more and more different African um, uh, universities actually display a very critical way of looking, not just at China, but at all kinds of engagements and all kinds of topics for that matter. So, so I think um, that's, at least for me, very enlightening. What were the major criticisms? Well, the criticisms have to do with um, ways in which you, I, I, I mean, I, I am not an expert on this, so I can give a, a, a few examples, but basically China, I always focus on the other Asian countries. So, but I mean, the panels where I was listening in, um, there it was things about um, the mining uh, and how individual Chinese would go in uh, sort of under, not as multinationals, and then the difference in how they, they engage with the local population and, 
I, I mean, that was certainly one. And then the thing about, as, as uh, Professor Doom also mentioned, the thing about coming in with a whole crew of workers and then leaving again, so not creating jobs around the port constructions, especially, is what I'm familiar with. So, so those are some of the, the main trends, but um, yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to ask um, from a different point of view for so globalization, uh, economic globalization. I just wanted to ask you the impact, the cultural impact of China in Africa. Say, for example, in Ghana, you, you know, if you live in Africa, you see, unlike colonial powers today who continue to provide charity, defend, all sorts of European Union grants to ordinary people, the relationship between Chinese workers, like in Uganda, for example, is just, you see, young families, young people running shops or working with working class women, some of them not well educated in markets. The relationship is very commodity consumption <laughs> and very, very kind of cheap commodity. You buy something today and tomorrow it's broken, so it creates a lot of environmental damage and a very grubby level, actually, with low income people. There's no so, sort of cultural relationship that you can't see visible science and technology, innovation, industrial development, local people. There's a pocket of people here. Th just on everyday level, I mean, for example, if you see influx of people going to Europe, going to, you can't go to China, all these people are leaving, running away. And the only level of transformation culturally is evangelical, Western evangelical Christian churches. But I want to ask, what do you think is this impact on everyday life, in ordinary people, in terms of education, innovation. The language is, diff there's a cultural difference. The people, Africans don't tap into Chinese, there's a lot of Chinese innovation and cultural food and stuff. Can you talk to this impact of economic development, which is not just commodity, cheap commodity consumption, a real meaningful sort of social, cultural hmm. exchange. Does it make sense? Yeah, yes. Uh, edu in education, in science and technology, and other, other cultural projects. So, yeah, so th there, are, there are several dimensions of, of, of your question that uh, I can speak to. But uh, increasingly, what, what we are seeing is, is and I think uh, um, Lena's work on, on how many Africans are going to China uh, over the years and the knowledge transfer. So, so there, is, uh, there is some level of people-to-people um, -people engagement that is happening that is really increasing this cultural competence, which is why I was making reference to the idea of the knowledge gap in terms of how much African policy leaders know about China and how China operates. But, but we are seeing uh, that increasingly there is a growing uh, sort of uh, um, uh, cultural competence, but that is, that is also a ten, an area of tension. So I, I, I was in Ghana in the summer, and, and I, I was with the director of the Confucius Institute at the University of Ghana, and, and he was telling me about some of the programs that they are, they are doing there. And it's, it's amazing the number of people that are signing up to, to take lessons in, in Mandarin, uh, from primary school to secondary school to universities to and they are actually leveraging on the expertise and knowledge skills of Ghanaians who have studied in China for, for years and have come back home. So, so there's a professional group called the uh, China Trained African Professionals. And, and, and so he, they have become more like a, 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 the catalyst between the, the Confucius Institute and the Ghanaian public, public, uh, the general public in terms of educational program that they are doing. Uh, and so you can, you can, I mean, obviously see some sort of uh, um, cultural competence that is, that is happening there. <coughs> not, just, not just the language, but they, they come back to Ghana and they are eating some of the food that they brought home. At this event at the Confucius Institute, um, we, we all had Chinese tea. And, and so that, that is happening. But that's not to say that there are not areas of, uh, of, of tension. And those tensions are also happening 
especially in what, what um, uh, 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 Professor Liu Kuan Yu talked about uh, raw encounters, right? Where you would have, at the workplace, there's raw encounter in terms of cultural differences. I have done research where uh, the, 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 the Chinese um, um, manufacturing company owners cannot understand why the Ghanaian worker wants to go to a funeral on Saturday instead of coming to work, right? But funeral is a key aspect of, of the Ghanaian way of life. So, so that was, but that, that's, we are moving, I, I think that that is something that is changing uh, in, in that context. The last one I, I want to also mention is that there's a lot of inter, in, inter, intermarriages between Ghanaians and Chinese happening uh, on, on several, several areas uh, in, in the mining communities uh, that I've, 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 I've been to. Uh, and then there's also, which is where my research is now, uh, digital, Chinese digital technology influence. Uh, and that is really giving, um, apart from the access to Chinese uh, digital product, like phones and what have you, which some, sometimes may have it quality issues that it, we, we talked about, but there is a whole um, uh, technology literacy that is happening across West Africa largely influenced by the role of Chinese technology in, in those spaces. Have I the view of Mongus? No, I think this is um, uh, something um, that you've seen very up close mm -hmm. and, and can speak much better to than I can. Um, I do really love the question though, because that's of course a dimension um, of these, uh, this heightened engagement and that takes place more at the micro level or at the social level than I can speak. I would also just, I, I mean, say from my experience in Ghana that it's, or, or, or in general, that I think it's also partly the difference between on-continent, you know, colonialism and the idea of transferring, like, the Francophone, the Lusophone, the, the Anglophone, whatever, culture or administrative um, structures, as well as religions, that that is not what I'm seeing from any of the, from China, from Japan, from South Korea, uh, but I'm seeing it from, for example, Turkey, from Saudi Arabia, from many of, of the other Asian uh, presences on the, on the uh, continent, also in Ghana, even in West Africa, not just in the traditional uh, places along the East African coast with the old East, uh, East um, African uh, city-states, for example, which dates back to well, 2,000 years ago. I have a question up there, yeah. Uh, from Johannesburg. I'm curious when you talked a little bit about how to. F yeah. When you talked a little bit about how to. Um, how it frames up to have like a different kind of. Um, the terms change for Africa, how Africa actually dictates better terms, be it for loans, be it for those negotiations. How does that shape up, I mean, realistically, I mean, when we say, actually, that's what we need, we need better terms so that it's a fairer deal. How do we get to that? And what are the barriers to why we don't have a fairer deal in the room? And I ask this, especially with the pressures of climate change that's gonna come hard for the Africa continent. And we know the extractive industries are a major part driving, obviously, our fossil fuel dependence. Um, so yeah, just some thoughts on that, because I know you talked a little bit about how that, yeah, how do we get to that fairer deal? Yeah, I think Sorry. you can start, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th th I mean, I think this is a great question. Part of this is also, you know, just learning from experience, right? Like the, um, uh, there are new opportunities out, uh, countries make deals, um, and sometimes you find out as you go through the deal that you didn't get probably, that there were a lot more negative side effects that you didn't um, encounter. So I think that this is also in part drawing on the lessons um, from it. Um, the other thing is like, it, it, when you have two partners um, trying to strike a deal, everybody's looking out for their own interests, right? So um, for, um, if I'm thinking from the perspective of, of, of African countries, one thing that gives you the most leverage is to make sure that you have alternative options, right? So like, so um, if not this trading partner, then uh, another, like in part, part of the partnerships with uh, China has given them more leverage towards trading with the West as well. So, so in part, this is a, a question I think of like just creating different options. 
learning in part from experiences and also be very clear um, in terms of your own development strategy, how does this fit into this development strategy, not just in the immediate term, but in the long run? Um, where do we want to be in terms of not just we, we need access to money right now and that helps in the next election cycle, uh, but we have um, an entire country um, with a lot of young people um, that are going to need well-paying jobs. Um, so what, how do we negotiate from, the pers from changing our horizon to the next five years versus to the, maybe the next 20 years? How do we make sure that this deal is not crowding out, for example, opportunities to um, build a um, strong manufacturing sector in our country if we keep on importing all these kind of ma manu cheap manufactured goods? Um, so I think those are the kinds of um, things that um, um, will help the, the experience from the past, but also to really have a very clear vision on um, where we want to be headed and what is in our long-term interest. That, that's certainly, I, I agree with this, this thing. That was what I was trying to say also, this thing about you know, actually sitting down in each of these states or possibly also across the African continent in some ways and actually have a plan and then have you know, the possible investors, whatever, either from within invest or have people from outside, but only invest in what there's already a plan for, unless it's a very good other option. So I think that thing is sort of the, in, but, but I, somehow I also see, think, see it as an ideal. I mean, why would, would um, Africa succeed in doing something that most other continents can't do, right? I mean, it's like, it, it, but, but certainly as a block, if, if most African countries or all of African countries could agree um, on how they're gonna play the other countries from outside, I mean, that would make it a stronger claim um, and, and make them stronger, but um, yeah. that's a lot of negotiation. Yeah, I, I I'll just say something briefly on this. So w one of the things that um, I I have and other scholars who are on this field are seen is that uh, relations between and uh, we we have largely been speaking at a very high level of the discussion. So I will just continue with that because I know we can go a little bit into deeper some of my own work. But it, it, Africa China relations is really recalibrating. It is it is it is evolving. Uh, and, I'm, and as a rooster, I'm very curious about how the future is going to look like because one of the things we are seeing is China's move away, even if it's temporary, move away from mega project that it was doing 10 years ago. And if you, my view is that a lot of Africans were very open to China because of the, its, its lending uh, uh, opportunity that China presented. Presented. Of course, it's going. It's, it goes beyond just lending. It's also diplomatic ties and cultural and everything. Right? But but the, the main driver is was the lending that opportunity that China's the China option presented. And and when, because that is changing, there is new research from uh, Boston University that is showing the decline uh, in in Chinese funding project across Africa. Of course, that may be temporary, but there is no way we are, we are not going back to those era of big infrastructure railway project like we used to have. So, so that's number one. Number two, the question on, um, on negotiation uh, and what can make the terms better is African, whether it is the government or African invest, investors that are engaging with Chinese counterpart, my view is they have to come from a position of knowledge mm -hmm. about, about the, the, the actors they are institutions they are dealing with. If it is Chinese uh, Exim Bank or China Development Bank or any Chinese actor, uh, the African negotiators have to come to the table with uh, uh, a high dose of knowledge and understanding of what, what, is, what, they, are, what they are into. That's what I, I think is missing. Uh, in, and, and it's interesting because it's not like there's lack of technical expertise on the African continent, right? I, I mean, this may be the wrong forum, but, but Scholars, we have, we have been studying China, uh, been studying China for more than 10 years, right? I mean, I'm based in Canada. I got called upon by the Canadian institutions to offer thought and reflections on what's going on. But on the African continent, there, there's not much of that going on. And, and research has shown that there's a large body of Africans and Ghanaians that have gone to study in China that have a, a deeper understanding of Chinese culture, Chinese way of life, Chinese 
I don't know, negotiation skills, but how much of those people are heading institutions in Africa's public spaces that can influence or bring their knowledge to bear, right? I mean, I'm, I'm an African, so I'm, I'm very, very biased in terms of uh, my, my view on, on this. But that, that, that is missing, and, and when, when that is missing now, that's always a problem. The last point I will make is the idea of uh, China serving as an alternative that if you have another, op another option, then it increases your bargaining power, right? But what we have seen <laughs> across Africa is that um, China, in, la in most cases, have become the option. So you, they actually play out the others, right, and come for China. So then it's, no, it's very hard, even though we are seeing some sort of co-founded project between China and the World Bank and others, right? But it's always... Uh, it has most, mostly is the China option, which is like the option that is used when the others that don't work, right? Or when, when for example, the World Bank refuses to fund a project because the, the project has environmental impact assessment that is not positive, right? So they will go to China in, in some instance. But then, so it's hard to have it on the other side where you go to China and it doesn't work and you go the other way. That doesn't happen a lot, so, um, yeah. So we're coming, coming to the end, but I mean, Climate change has been mentioned, and I'm surprised we've talked for 90 minutes without like, <laughs> mentioning the environment. Like, massive climate change problem, massive water shortage problem in Africa. And rule of thumb is globalization has made the world's environment far worse. Globalization and environmental destruction go hand in hand. In hand. So... Uh, I, I, I kind of wondered how a, the degree of awareness in Africa about environmental challenges. I think it's profound, actually. And, but I also think that it's, change, it's changed within, I mean, the project we have now, uh, we started in, uh, or I, we, we designed it in 2019, 20, and we said, okay, there'll be a work package on sustainability around ports. And some of my Ghanaian uh, partners were saying, ah, is that going to be so relevant? Mm -hmm. Within the three year period that we've been running the project now, it's been become extremely mm -hmm. relevant. But that is just in terms of ports. I see it also very much in the, in the uh, coups now in uh, Gabon and Burkina Faso and Mali and Niger. It's certainly an anti-France -Franc uh, movement, but it is also pushed by the Sahel and the climate change there and the conflicts between um, herders and, and pastoralists, I think it's called in English, uh, around, I mean, who has access to food, I mean, basically. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the whole issue around food security tied to the climate uh, is, is huge and there is a, a lot of awareness and I think the pushing out of France, just as one example in one region, um, is also because there is a belief that the interference by France and old systems is making this worse. That there are indigenous ways of dealing with this um, that will be more conducive to, to hopefully at least curb some of the consequences of climate change. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's how I'm interpreting certainly the Sahel and the Sahara region right now. Mm -hmm. Just a qu quick one. So one of the things I've talked about with the recalibration of Africa-China engagement is in the area, a lot of factors are leading to that recalibration. And one of them is uh, domestic issues in Africa, but also of course what's happening in China itself, right? So uh, China is at the forefront of the transition to green energy in Africa, uh, which is why we are seeing, um, I mean, it may not be like uh, directly related to this, but we are seeing a transition uh, to green, uh, green energy and China is at the forefront of this. Uh, in, in West Africa, in, in, in East Africa, and elsewhere. Uh, and so you would, you would see that one of the areas where there is, a, 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 there is a, a drop in Chinese um, lending or Chinese support is in the area of energy. And here I'm talking about, uh, especially in the fossil fuel industry. There is a drop in, in, in funding, in investment coming from China. There is actually an, an increase in um, China's uh, involvement across Africa in terms of transition to 
uh, renewable energy, um, uh, wind, solar, and, and what have you. But there is a, and, and that is based on what's happening, the, the, the issues that are of concern to African, African people, African leaders at home. And, and so I am, I am quite um, um, like, uh, I'm quite happy about that and expecting that to really go on because what, what we are seeing is, is that interest of, 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 when I say China here, I'm referring to Chinese, uh, um, Chinese uh, private enterprises that are interested in, in, this, in this sector. And, and we are seeing that um, grow over the years. So, well, yeah. thank you very much. And let's, let's end on a happy note. Thank you very much for our <laughs> panelists. <laughs>
morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we are coming to our second panel for our second day, uh, which is looking at Africa, Asia, historical uh, connections. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Champo. I had the pleasure of being with you yesterday and also at dinner. Uh, so we will uh, invite our panelists to speak. This is a, a panel on Africa, Asia, historical connections. And the description of the panel emphasized two questions that stood out for me. Uh, the first are, what are the historical linkages between Asia and Africa? And the second, how have these enduring connections shaped the current geopolitical and sociocultural roles of the two continents in the global landscape. Uh, and I think we have a range of scholars who will do justice to this, and they range from law to international relations, political science, and history. Uh, and as a moderator who's a historian, now and then I will sort of uh, uh, interject. So we'll give them about five to 10 minutes each uh, to share some reflections uh, from their perspective uh, and then I'll engage them in conversation and then open up to uh, include conversations from you guys. I think we have an hour and a half and we can plan to maybe save about 30 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. So with that, let me turn to uh, Saifuddin and you can start off with ten to five to 10 minutes of your reflections. Okay, thank you very much as the organizers and conceptualizers of this conference, thank you for the opportunity uh, to exchange ideas on Africa and Asia, the two largest continents on the planet, or as I and Ali Mazuri prefer to call it, Afrasia. I will begin <laughs> by a with an overview of the Afrasian connection. Uh, a simplistic reading of history and uh, uh, contemporary international relations suggests that Africa and Asia have been both political allies and economic allies. The real story may be somewhat more complicated. While colonialism helped to turn African and Asian countries into political allies, that same colonial experience prepared the ground for their economic rivalry by creating in the colonies economies of primary products. That is the competitive dimension of Afrasian relationship. The historical experience of Africa and Asia had a conflictual dimension too. <coughs> the issues that brought Africa and Asia into conflict included the age old, or rather the centuries old, Arab slave trade and Idi Amin's expulsion of South Asians from Uganda in 1972. But there was, in the middle of the 20th century, considerable optimism about the possibility of long term cooperation between Africa and Asia and the probability that they could rise together in the post-colonial period. But it did not out, sorry, it did not turn out that way, as you know. Asia lived up to that optimistic expectation, <laughs> unleashing what may be called the second wave of Asia's industrialization in the 1970s and 1980s. 
the first wave of Asia's modernization, of course, began by Japan decades earlier. The second wave of Asia's modernization occurred when countries known as the Asian tigers, namely Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, <coughs> registered spectacular economic performance. Led by China, Asia's third wave of industrialization is now underway. What is different about this wave is that Afrasian solidarity seems to be weaker compared to when the earlier phases occurred. But this is not surprising since the conditions that gave rise to Afrasian solidarity during the two earlier phases have either disappeared or changed significantly. These conditions included the end of colonialism and the Cold War, as well as the widening gap of economic disparities between Africa and Asia. Nevertheless, there is still some optimism that dynamic Asian countries, particularly China, will trigger Africa's economic renaissance. Another significant distinction between the second and third waves of Asia's industrialization is that unlike in the former, the latter has potentially broader goals and wider consequences. China's aspiration is not just to become a trading state or a rich nation, as important as those goals are, China wants to create a world order centered around itself. What are the implications for Africa? Is optimism justified under the circumstances? Well, I must categorically say, unfortunately, that I am pessimistic. I'm also pessimistic about something else. In some ways, I think the study of China-Africa relations is lagging behind China-Africa relations. Let me repeat, the study of China-Africa relations is lagging behind China-Africa relations. Since this is a major claim I am making, let me explain what I mean. It is a story of a seemingly quiet mini revolution, or one may even call it counter revolution, that has been taking place in the discourse about China, the West, and Africa's development. It is, in my view, a remarkable, a remarkable, a remarkable revolution that is <clears throat> least remarked upon. Three views have dominated the development debate in Africa in the second half of the 20th century, in the last 50 years. On the one hand, there was the view held by those on the left side of the ideological spectrum including Marxists and the neo-Marxist intellectuals, that global capitalism has the propensity to underdevelop Africa, and that the solution was, therefore, for Africa to disengage itself from world capitalist system. On the other hand, right-leaning intellectuals <coughs> saw the process of economic exchange between Africa and the West as a positive sum game, beneficial to both sides, even if the benefit was never equal. A variant 
or distant relative of the second paradigm, maintained it was just too late to disengage from, to disengage from global capitalism, even if it was desirable to do so. After China's return to and renewed interest in Africa, however, left-leaning intellectuals have begun reversing their position by advocating Africa's deeper engagement with China and by suggesting that this could accelerate Africa's own development. We can now almost say that if one is leftist, one is also likely to be a Sino-optimist. Let us assume, like Sino-pessimists, that decades from now, Africa's economic condition will not markedly improve or worsen in relative terms despite or because of Africa's expanding engagement with China. If so, the question is who would be the Walter Rodney of Sino-Africa relations? Walter Rodney was the, Guy the Guyanese author of the famous 1972 book titled How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And Rodney was, of course, a leftist intellectual. That is the first thing with respect to this emerging intellectual trend. And secondly, and even more concerning, the leftist intellectuals have yet to adequately explain why the logic of capital changes when the Chinese, as opposed to Europeans, are in the, on the driving seat. Is it not true, as one great scholar said, that the rhetoric of power all too easily produces an illusion of benevolence when deployed in an imperial setting? We are waiting for an adequate explanation. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, thank you to Arale and all the organizers for making this uh, wonderful opportunity to be in conversation with colleagues and friends and. Uh, and, and talk about these important issues. So for my intervention, uh, I would like to reflect on um, the role of historical narratives in, uh, in the broader um, uh, uh, Afro-Asia relations. And so uh, here I'm interested perhaps in answering the second question, Prof, that you mentioned earlier that the kind of the, 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 the panel description puts forward for us. And that's uh, to say, uh, looking at the broader utilization of uh, historical narratives in the framing and representation of Afro-Asia. So questions that are interesting to me uh, include, um, so how is the past remembered, right, in, 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 uh, in narratives and histories and stories uh, on, on Afro-Asia relations? Uh, and what, what past is remembered or whose past is remembered? Uh, what iconic figures uh, or moments or movements are celebrated? Uh, and what are the implications of these configurations of the past in today's uh, discourses on Afro-Asia, specifically China, Africa, uh, in, in my remarks? Um, and so, uh, in a way, this is looking basically at the role of the past. How is the past, how are memories of the past, how do they come back in shaping and discussing and talking about not just the, the past and histories of China, Africa, or Afro-Asia, but also in the present moment and the future. Um, and so I will highlight three main tropes that have inspired my uh, current uh, uh, book, manuscript research, and then try to thread um, um, uh, across them uh, some, some, some trends to discuss. And so, First of all, when we ask about the historical themes uh, that are recurrent, especially when we look at China-Africa relations, um, some of the main historical themes and the narratives uh, uh, that, that are recurrent and come up a lot 
include um, this sort of emphasis on solidarity, emphasis on uh, revolutionary friendship, socialist friendship, um, anti-colonial and anti-imperial uh, affects and dispositions also come up a lot in uh, thinking about sort of these big, bigger narratives about the histories. Um, um, and there's, there's a kind of a, a, a sense that's emphasized around how China-Africa relations sort of go back at least in the more recent uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, timeline, go back to these anti-imperial, anti-colonial uh, affects. Um, uh, so what's, what's really interesting to me about some of these expressions and narratives and representations is there is a lot of nostalgia that's infused into these narratives. It's uh, nostalgia and nostalgic uh, expressions Right, become, um, they take on sort of a modality of describing and discussing, especially China-Africa relations, that somehow really emphasize, right, so a very positive kind of narrative. They emphasize a, a narrative of, um, of, of shared history, of shared struggle, of coming from the same place, of having similar aspirations, of having sim same kind of, uh, um, ideas for what the future should look like, right? So, and that sort of nostalgic uh, motivations and nostalgic uh, memories of the past uh, becomes really interesting to me in the sense of understanding what, what the consequences of those utilizations of nostalgic narratives in shaping how we think about the world today and shaping how we think about not just the past of China-Africa relations, but also the future and how those are utilized and how they are basically um, uh, materialized, right? Um, and so this leads me to kind of interrogating sort of these historical constructions, right? So where do they come from? So doing a bit of a genealogical tracing of some of these narratives, where do they come from? How, um, uh, uh, how are they uh, kind of reflected in uh, not only today's rhetoric, but also really in the materialities? Uh, Sorry. How are they? How are they materialized, right? And so, some of the examples I explore in my work include um, include um, things like the um, the many sort of uh, archaeological excavation teams, for instance, that are sponsored um, by Chinese and Kenyan. Um, Tanzanian institutions to basically give material presence to sort of these Indian Ocean um, uh, 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 encounter stories about this very, very early kind of, you know, 14th, 15th century encounters between Min Dynasty sort of explorers and, and in, in East African Indian Ocean uh, uh, populations. And so the narratives that come from that uh, are narratives that situate China, Africa today presently as a very different kind of uh, kind of uh, relationship that is very different, that goes back all the way to the 14th, 15th century, but it does not go through similar kind of uh, uh, episodes of history that we know uh, come from European, African kind of encounters. And so the, 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 the here the importance of remembering these stories and bring them, bringing them up serve this role of positioning sort of China as a very different kind of power, as a, an alternative, as a... Um, so it's really interesting to me to also explore what are the material source of evidence that kind of back up these narratives. And so it's interesting to look at some of these works, some of these uh, um, ex excavation uh, works to look for shipwrecks of, of um, uh, Zhang He, uh, 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 t um, uh, explorations, and, 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 and to kind of really put a material face to those narratives that early encounters were more about <laughs> cultural exchanges, they were more about co commerce, they were about trade, they were not about sort of these kind of um, uh, narratives of slavery, of colonialism, of exploitation, of uh, pain, and, st and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and, and that's just one example, sort of other, other interesting examples that, that to me um, uh, I've been kind of interested in looking at and, and, and asking people uh, about uh, include, for example, this um, in the train uh, uh, station in, in Mombasa, 
the, 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 the railway, the sort of connecting uh, Nairobi to Mombasa, there's, there's a, a bust of Jalha um, that's sitting there as a mark. Uh, so this is a monument marking sort of this friendship and it actually, the caption says this is uh, a symbol of Kenyan uh, Chinese friendship that goes back centuries ago. And so it's really interesting to me to interrogate how those monuments and places uh, are experienced by people, right? So what, how do they think about these things? What is the role of these <coughs> materializations of nostalgic narratives in the present kind of thinking about sort of the, the, the present and the future of China-Africa relations? So it's, um, we also know, for example, about the Tozara Railway, which now under the Belt and Road Initiative, there is a, a new kind of um, interest in reviving, in refurbishing the Tazara Railway. So under the Belt and Road Initiative, there's a new kind of pocket of money that's being uh, fund, fund that, that's, that's going to, to fund a refurbishing and a reviving of the Tazara Railway. And so much of that has that symbolic nostalgic uh, uh, capital, right, that states um, in a very material sense the embodiment of this solidarity, of this kind of really different type of relationship that, that China stands to kind of really present in its uh, relation to Africans. And so it's really interesting to me kind of really to interrogate really how these memories uh, uh, of the past and how these narratives are kind of, they come back and they shape really um, how uh, the positionality, right, of, of and the geopolitics, right, of, of, of China, China-Africa relations. In a third place, um, it's really interesting to me that from preliminary kind of research, speaking to different people and, and asking people about what they, how they experience the, the bust, right, of Jokha, for instance, in, in Mombasa and other things uh, <coughs> of the sort, it's really interesting to me that, um, that these, nostalgic, um, these nostalgic narratives, I find, um, are used as modes of resistance. They are used as modes of critique of the current kind of global order, which is experienced as basically unjust and unequal, and um, reiterations of. Uh, oftentimes, when I see in my with my interlocutors repeating to me sort of these ideas that China and Africa, the relationship is, you know, framed, you know, through these narratives of solidarity, shared struggle. Those narratives are more or less um, narratives that are used as a critique of the current um, order, which uh, is perceived and experienced um, as an order that has excluded uh, states from the global south in the making of, of, of so many important institutions and so on. And so these nostalgic narratives are used as a mode of critique in this sense. It's a critique. Of, of, of the global order. It's not a show necessarily of a naive consum consumption, you know, of what Chinese center discourses look like in the continent, for example, right? So there is um, earlier in, in, in the formal panel, there was discussion about how China really is used in a way as, as thinking about as an, as an alternative. And I think that that's concurrent a bit with some of what I found through this research that these narratives are used to signal, right, that there is an alternative, that there is a need also for so an alternative way of relating to the global order, of thinking about uh, the position and the place of, of, of Africa and Africans in the global order. So that's, um, that's basically broadly kind of the way that I have been thinking about the, the, the place and role of, of uh, the past in shaping kind of thinking about uh, specifically, in this particular case, uh, China-Africa relations. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm, I'm going to talk now, like my, my short remarks, about uh, partly China investments in infrastructure in the past uh, decade and uh, the role of history in that. Because whenever we look at uh, BRI, for instance, and uh, Lynn already mentioned that, uh, um, we look at it as a present project of the 21st century. Uh, and usually a date of departure is like 2013 when the BRI started, or uh, attention in particular of Chinese investment and aid in Africa came in 2005 when China 
um, when Angola opted for a Chinese loan repayable through oil, oil uh, exploration rights uh, uh, and over, over an international monetary fund aid package that was contingent on uh, uh, governance reform. And so then is when kind of attention shifted to uh, China and these uh, new investments in infrastructure. Uh, and the past is almost, is, no, is almost ignored when we look at Chinese infrastructure financing and building in Africa. And often this uh, it seems as less significant uh, if compared to the huge amount of investment, the big numbers that we see in these past uh, two decades. Uh, moreover, whenever we think about uh, any uh, sort of historical um, uh, kind of legacy of like Chinese engagement with infrastructure, we usually refer just to the Cold War and the Tazara Railroad. There's not going back, right? It's just PRC, that's what China did, like, you know, this kind of investments. However, uh, China involvement in Africa development goes uh, beyond recent decades uh, and is deeply rooted in layers of historicity, histories, but also fictionalized history, as also Lena uh, was saying, shared memories, created memories, uh, and so forth. And these layers encompasses both ancient connections that date back to Zheng He, um, to most recent one uh, from Bandung Conference uh, and ideas of South-South uh, cooperation. And before the 21st century, China financed over 4,000 development projects worldwide. Uh, and uh, well before China emerged uh, as a global economic power, already played a key role in help setting railway connections in East and Southern Africa to break the, uh, the stranglehold of apartheid South Africa and it's allied over the region, creating links uh, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with broader anti-colonial struggles and movements. Uh, and this, of course, included the Tazara Railroad uh, that was built in the 70s, uh, which has been praised uh, by um, African nations, but also half a century ago, China constructed the King Kong hydropower station, Guinea first, uh, which also became a, a sign of uh, national uh, pride. Uh, but if we look further back, uh, this is not uh, the first instance uh, where we see Chinese workers uh, building infrastructures in Africa. And um, uh, we have to, uh, if we go back to the 19th century, we'll see how colonial powers uh, used uh, Chinese labor to build uh, uh, some of the railroads that they, they needed to their, uh, for their colonial enterprise. Uh, and this was not uh, directly um, uh, mandated by the Qing government, uh, but still the Qing government, uh, and this is the, the new work that I'm, I'm, I'm doing more on extraterritoriality, the Qing government was trying increasingly at the end of the 19th century to protect uh, its uh, workers uh, overseas. So it wasn't really mandated, it's different from the PRC period where we have uh, infrastructure really built uh, from the government, right? it's a government of down uh, initiative. But again, we, we shouldn't uh, underestimate uh, these legacies of uh, history, like these this very many uh, historical examples of engagement uh, and uh, building of infrastructure. And I, I, you know, there are many things, other things that are interesting, but I'm very interested in infrastructure. So uh, that's why that's, uh, that's my focus. And so the question is like, how can we understand uh, this historical precedence of China engagement in, with Chinese labor uh, or you know, with the state, uh, uh, sort of more mandated uh, infrastructure projects. What parallels exist between the infrastructural projects of yesterday and today? And uh, are we witnessing a completely distinct chapter in Sino-African relations? And how can we define such junctures or ruptures uh, in, in, uh, in history? And another aspect is that Chinese leaders consistently emphasize a shared past of anti-imperialism and anti-colonial struggle showcasing China's commitment to supporting other developing nations. Uh, and, uh, and this historical memory is vital for Chinese uh, leaders, for the image they're promoting, and this emerged also in the previous panel, uh, but also for Africans themselves, right? That they're starting to use, manipulate uh, this uh, uh, older uh, histories, uh, Tazara Railroad, Zheng He, uh, if you go to Tanzania, there are people that claim to be the son of, uh, sons of Zheng He, uh, you know, very, very proudly. So uh, there are all this, uh, this narrative, but um, uh, it's essential to dif differentiate uh, between real histories and fictional narrative that fuel the modern Afro-Chinese partnership. 
And uh, I think that there is a bit of lack of literature examining uh, uh, this, uh, this aspect historically, because if we look at the Belt and Road, there is this uh, completely invented thing of the Belt and Road, right? Dating back uh, like centuries and so forth, but nothing really that is done by historians to look at instead at these like workers, for instance, right? Or uh, PRC period, like really from the ground in a historical way, right? Um, and so, as we study these infrastructures and the order that they bring, it is very important to incorporate a historical perspective to go beyond static narratives uh, and better comprehend China current engagement with Africa in its infrastructure building. And infrastructure can have many different meanings, many different articulations. Um, and, uh, uh, and again, it's, it's really important to, to, to see this, the extent of these interactions well before the 21st century. Uh, and the history is not just a backdrop, uh, uh, but a critical element in contextualizing the ongoing infrastructure development by China and Africa, and it's uh, emerging, kind of constantly developing relationship. And in looking at this history, it is also crucial to delve into the real experiences of individuals and communities involved uh, in these projects. Um, and this uh, can help us uh, uh, moving beyond uh, uh, a limiting retros re retrospective views that uh, have overshadowed uh, Africa-China interaction, especially after the 2006 uh, uh, Beijing summit. And another aspect, when look back at this history, uh, it's uh, um, it's uh, to look at this uh, uh, infrastructure that have been built as Afro-Asian spaces uh, that stand as a testament to spatial practices that influence social dynamics, uh, territorial boundaries, uh, sovereignty, and also migration uh, patterns. And so in concluding, I think that the uh, prevalent presentism in looking at China-Africa relations, in particular uh, with reference to infrastructure development, um, uh, often overlook deeper, older historical connections. And uh, such an approach not only minimizes uh, older histories, but also runs the risk of shaping a teleological view, constraining our understanding of the present through narrow lenses and overemphasizing certain aspects, like including solidarity, right? Because we go back a bit in the PRC period and like we all focus on solidarity, but there was much more, and even solidarity was manipulated. There's so many different elements and aspects of this uh, solidarity. And uh, this is a work in progress. So it's just kind of a question that I have when I look at the uh, uh, current uh, infrastructures. Right? I'm very curious about uh, where they come from, the history of all this uh, relationship and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, uh, let me just make sure I have my time right. Okay. Um, so what I will talk about today is a, more of an experiment. <laughs> so it's not necessarily something authoritative, but I'd, I'd, I'm curious to see how um, other people react. And I'll start with thinking about um, what, is, what are different frameworks which we can understand the history of relations between the Asian and African continent? And then um, in the second part, I'll address sort of what I think is a crucial um, kind of insight that we get out of using the framework I, I prefer. The theme for our panel was given as historical ties that bind the African and Asian continents. Rather than taking the geographical spaces we understand to constitute Africa and Asia today, and simply going back in time to identify connections between these territories, I would like to discuss the constitution of Asia and Africa as coherent geographical units linked by interactions. To give an example of what I mean, there is a way in which any attempt to tell the history of Afro-Asian relations is futile. The two land masses are after all contiguous and many peoples, polities, and religious and cultural groups have spanned both continents. In this sense, any history of Islam of, in the Arabic language, or further yet, any history of the Ottoman Empire, of the Oman Zanzibar Sultanate, or the United Arab Republic is a history of Afro-Asian relations. But of course, that is not what interests people regarding the historical roots of current Afro-Asian engagement. I believe it is interest focused on a more limited conception of Asia without direct, dense, and continuous historical connections to Africa, that is Asia here, means a region eastward of Central Asia encompassing South Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. 
Even then, however, the tendency to speak of historical networks of trade and migration dating back thousands of years uh, through the so-called Silk Road or the Indian Ocean, for the most part, were mediated by Arab or Persian intermediaries. In this way, the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean, in my view, should not be understood as serious examples of sustained or structural engagement between historical peoples in Asia and Africa, but as alternative geographies. For example, the view from China in the early modern period, that is from the 1300s to the 1800s, uh, and this was a view that was largely shared by scholarly and bureaucratic circles in Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, was that the peoples of the Swahili coast existed as an extension of, so of um, the South China Sea and Indian Ocean circuit, while Egypt, for example, existed as an extension of a landward um, uh, circuit to the western regions. The organization of the globe was not according to continents then, but according to circuits of trade and travel, which placed Asian and African localities in the same groupings. And I could tell a similar story about, for example, um, conceptions of geography in Sahili and West Africa, but for the purpose of time, uh, I'll, I'll move on. An arguably more rigorous approach to Afro-Asian relations that some have taken is to take on the subject through the history of Afro-Asian solidarity as a political and intellectual movement that arose in the era of decolonization that followed World War II. And we've, we've heard a bit about this. Um, here too, Arab identity and Pan-Arabism uh, pan have contributed to cons constituting a political bloc and identity linking the two continents, though one could also emphasize anti-colonialism what was then known as economic underdevelopment and third worldism as touchstones of this movement. And one of the potent symbols, of course, of, was the Asia-Africa Conference in Bandung in Indonesia in 1955. What is significant about this Afro-Asian Asian moment was that it saw emerge for the first time a political imaginary that bound Africa and Asia conceived as continents. It called for a direct and durable relationship which seemingly, for the first time, would be without intermediaries. As it were, the political imaginary was, uh, was only partially, some would say minimally, reflected in the circulation of goods and peoples. While Bandung and the broader Afro-Asian movement may seem to some to be the starting point of Af Asia-Africa relations today, I view them as the end point of a process of structural engagement driven by labor migration, both coerced and uncoerced. Indeed, despite long-standing interactions between geographic spaces known today as Africa and Asia, it was not until the 19th century, I would argue, that Asia and Africa came to form coherent units durably joined singularly by labor migration and recruitment. Um, the standard story that is told of the relationship between Asian and African migration, uh, labor migration is one of succession. First, you had uh, the use of enslaved African labor by European colonial powers, and basically once you can do that, you turn to indentured labor from Asia, notably India and China. In my view, this relationship is better conceived as one of simultaneity and interchangeability. The number of Africans enslaved and brought to the Americas was never as great as it was in the late 18th century and the decades immediately preceding the Euro-American abolition of the slave trade. Moreover, the recruitment of African migrant labor, whether enslaved, indentured, contractual or otherwise, by both European empires and indigenous African state builders continued and even accelerated throughout the 19th century, though increasingly concentrated within the African continent and its surrounding islands. For European colonial empires and settler colonial societies across the globe, the question posed by the mid-19th century was where to get the labor to exploit natural and agricultural resources in, ex in emerging industrial uh, production um, uh, networks. While most settler colonial societies, and particularly th those in temperate regions, ultimately sought to rely on European settler migration, prohibiting Asian and African migration, in tropical regions, Euro-American empires from Brazil to Spanish, French, British, Portuguese, German, and Belgian uh, administrations across the Americas, Africa, and Asia turned to, sorry, let's see, <laughs> turned to, um, sorry, but they, they, they turned uh, to Asia and Africa as the places to, uh, to, to, to garner labor and thought of them uh, and debated this. Right? Where, do we, where do we seek our labor? Do we seek from, from 
India? Do we seek it from China? Do we seek it from, from, from Africa? And that interchangeability was key to bringing these societies uh, and these continents in, in, into contact in a relationship that some scholars have called that of co-colonial, 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 Coloniality, <laughs> is here in French. So the, 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 and I think this uh, experience of, 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 of co-coloniality is key to understanding both the elements of solidarity and the obstacles, or the, the elements of both competition and cooperation that were, 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 were um, mentioned earlier in this, in this 19th century moment of um, Afro-Asian uh, en- engagement. Um, so the the so, so basically in, the, in, the, in this time, um, yeah, they saw each other both as competitors and as uh, as collaborators. In a way, the working out of what that relationship would look like um, occurred in the moment of decolonization uh, and um, in in, the, in this uh, kind of. A moment of, of solidarity. But there's also a second way in which labor migration structured uh, Afro-Asian engagement, and it is that pan-African identity and pan-Asian identity also come out of these histories of labor migration and recruitment and diaspora. It is, it many, it's been written um, about how uh, pan-African identity comes out of histories of the slave trade. It also comes out of histories of uh, labor migration within the African continent, and the same can be said in, 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 in Asia, where you have both Asian diasporas outside of Asia who link to an to a Asian identity because they cannot link themselves to a post-colonial um, uh, st- a state. So you can think about uh, people of South Asian descent after partition that don't have an entity they, they link themselves to. But you can also think in terms of China, right? We, we talk about China-African relations, but we don't often specify which China we're talking about, um, which, which, is, uh, which is, is something to, 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 to think of. Um, and you can, but you can also think about in terms of the much larger migration, of course, um, uh, in the case of China, to Southeast Asia, but also uh, of, of, uh, in South, from South Asia as well. So when you have societies like, Malay, like what becomes Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, that identity, um, a- anchoring that identity in part on Asian identity is a way to overcome uh, potential tensions within the polity. And the creation of these pan-Asian and pan-African identities were crucial and at a second level to creating a sort of uh, idea or imaginary of Afro-Asian solidarity. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. The four of you, you've taken me in different directions. Uh, let me try and see if I can uh, ask four connected questions so that all four of you are in conversation. And, and, and you can take it in any direction. Uh, and then uh, maybe for about 10 minutes, and then we'll bring in the audience. So let me start with Seyfuddin and, and what uh, your reflections uh, sort of uh, raised for me. Uh, you, you described China's development. It's almost like a, a rising tide and we are expecting that it would lift the boats in Africa. And you ask the question why the logic of capital should change with China now in the driving seat. And it made me wonder whether capitalism cannot be modified. And isn't that what China is attempting? And isn't that what makes maybe the other countries, including those in Africa, think that something different is probably unfolding? So that is one. Two, uh, to Lena, and also connected to this, uh, as you share these narratives of nostalgia, uh, the, the, <coughs> the problem about that is that it creates a sense of familiarity, as if Africa knows China. China knows Africa, uh, and it can obscure a lack of knowledge. And for the past decade or so, one of my complaints as I travel across Africa is a lack of solid understanding on the part of governments about what China represents. 
And so it could be that in terms of the production of knowledge in this relationship, it is uneven. And I'm curious to hear from you. Are the Chinese studying Africa in ways that they are getting to understand the continent? And we are not because we've made this sense of false familiarity based on these narratives from Bandung and they build this and they build the... Uh, uh, they built an electrical uh, hydroelectric dam in Guinea and they did that and they came as barefoot doctors. Has this obscured the fact that we really don't understand who and what China is now? And that is uh, uh, an important problem. And then to, to Maria, when you uh, talked about uh, the sort of given some historical death to China's engagement and infrastructure. One of the things that I mentioned that excited me about China's early forays uh, was this infrastructure, this resource-backed infrastructural loans. You mentioned the example of Angola. And it, it was almost like trading. Uh, we, we, need, we need a railway, we have cocoa. So Ghana, we paid for our hydroelectric dam with cocoa and a few things. And, and the West, always dislike that because it reminds them of the 50s and the 60s when African countries felt they could have that relationship with Eastern countries who didn't have dollars and foreign currency. But they brought technical knowledge, they could build things, they could lend you things, and they also took cocoa and a few things. So it makes me wonder, two different phases in history, almost a, a kind of a a shared idea of how butter can facilitate trade. What, what is different between these two faces? Because after uh, governments like Nkrumah were overthrown, the West made sure to spell that successive governments should not do butter trade with the Eastern countries. And then... Idris, you, you, you uh, talked about the uh, you know, 19th century, what connected Africa, Asia, uh, <coughs> labor migration uh, and recruitment and, and others. And, and I also come back, let me say, go forward to the 50s and the 60s. Development economists felt that Asia was hopeless. When they compared countries like Zambia and Africa with South Korea, they thought the South Koreas were really messed up. In 2017, South Korea's trade with the rest of the world was more than all of the African continent combined. What didn't we, did we just see huge populations in Asia, no resources, they don't have much land to share? What, what did they miss <coughs> so that the outcome has become so different? Was it just teeming populations with no resources? And some other factors came into play that we did not anticipate. So I'll turn it over to you, and we can have a conversation for about 10 minutes, and then I'll uh, uh, reach out to the audience. And you can come in any order, because the questions are connected. OK, let me go uh, first. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, comment. Uh, basically, um, you. Uh, are counter arguing uh, that uh, capital, the logic of capital doesn't change regardless of who the capitalist is. Uh, I am of the view that uh, that is a questionable uh, uh, idea uh, uh, in terms of uh, specific uh, examples. Um, China is doing the same thing that European powers were doing in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, Africa is exporting primary products. China is, uh, 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 China is importing primary products from Africa. Uh, China, uh, and Africa is buying manufactured goods. Um, so in terms of investment as a whole, uh, 
the Chinese investment in Africa is as, uh, as uh, resource-seeking as the capital that was invested by European colonial powers in Africa rather than efficiency-seeking. And um, in, 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 in general, uh, according to uh, uh, the most recent uh, Pew uh, Center research survey I have seen, uh, it is indeed true that uh, China in Africa, or, or, or China in Africa is, or the, the opinion of Africans toward China is the most positive compared to other uh, peoples in other regions. And um, for this, uh, there is uh, uh, two, two reasons. One is tangible in the sense that uh, uh, China, China, Africa did, ga did gain a benefit from its engagement with uh, China, especially since the 1990s. Uh, and uh, between 2000 and 2014, uh, Africa's GDP did grow uh, twice as much as Africa's population and so forth. So there is tangible uh, aspect, tangible aspect of uh, what fueled Sino-optimism in Africa. But there is also another aspect that is less tangible and in fact shakier. Uh, and this is, uh, I could say that uh, uh, presumptions, presumptions uh, that are uh, hardly challenged or critically examined, including the idea that Africa or China did not colonize Africa. Uh, while it is true that China did not colonize Africa, as I said earlier, there is no uh, logic that it wouldn't want to colonize Africa. After all, colonialism benefited the colonial power, right? Yeah. And uh, the other uh, presumption is that China's intentions are different. Uh, of course, nobody knows you know, what China's intentions are. I mean, uh, 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 the best we could do is to try to decode uh, from, uh, f to d decode from uh, its, its objectives in Africa, meaning uh, that China has uh, the objective of, uh, or, or China has a quest for uh, raw, raw materials, resources, a uh, quest for diplomatic support, and um, so forth. It is uh, the actions China takes in order to achieve those goals that constitutes its, its intentions. Even that is very uh, in, indirect. So, uh, uh, in, in, in short, uh, I uh, do believe that uh, the logic of capital is the same, uh, regardless of who the capitalist is, judging by the outcome, potential outcome, as well as yeah, yeah, thank you. Point, point taken as I move on. I guess, as a historian, I've long been aware that people create institution constructions. Mm -hmm. Institution constructions don't create themselves but they come to gain a life over time that you think they cannot remove. So I always preach my best of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to imagine different. <coughs> and I think that that precisely ties into the, to the question you asked me about the sense of familiarity. I mean, it's, in a sense to me, I think that that's what's interesting about this nostalgia as a lens is that it shows that these narratives can take a life of their own. They manifest beyond fact, right? So at the end of the day, the excavation teams I was talking about, they were not able to find any material evidence of there being any shipwreck that can tie directly the seventh voyage or the, to the East A African Indian uh, Ocean coast, but that, did that change anything, right? So then kind of, uh, Maria, you mentioned earlier sort of these different citizens who proudly claim their heritage coming from all the way sort of, you know, uh, in Tanzania or in Kenya or in Mozambique, right? So that, in a way, I think it is that sense of familiarity precisely that we need to interrogate, right? So, and we need to interrogate it for 
the affective um, component of this sort of you know nostalgic remembering of the past, but also really in terms of the knowledge, right? In terms of um, this uh, knowledge being perhaps obscured by a sense of yeah, I'm comfortable enough with what I know, right? Um, so I, I, I think that to me, sort of taking nostalgia as a lens is precisely a way of critiquing these lacks, right? And it's not necessarily to suggest that. Um, it is, uh, these are kind of, you know, to be taken as facts, but to interrogate them really. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I agree with you in terms of the necessity to ask, you know, these fundamental questions, do we know as African either elites or peoples or uh, do we understand what China is today and how do we understand China is today? How is our understanding mediated, right? So and if I ask the question, how is our understanding mediated? So much of this comes from these affective representations and affective histories and telling of the past in, in these particular ways, but it's also mediated through materialities, right? Through the, you know, the trains, through the station, through uh, all of these kind of projects that do a very good job of telling a certain story of the past, right? So, but what I was, what I want to also mention is what I stay away from is a very kind of flat understanding that as Africans, we perceive China, we understand, we, we consume these narratives without being critical of them in a way, right? So we see performances of um, thinking of the rhetoric of China as solidarity with Africans, but that doesn't mean that everybody in the continent thinks in the same way or thinks in a homogeneous. So I think I try to particularly use this as a thinking of it as a critique and not necessarily as, you know, this is the lay of the land and all Africans are thinking in this same similar homogeneous way. So no, I, I want to say something about um, uh, this also, uh, that uh, you know, there's this uh, sense of familiarity that confuses us, right, about what China is, who is China. But then also, what is China, who is China? I mean, it's a big question, right? And so we will always be confused uh, and we will always kind of be hanging in uh, false beliefs uh, in some way, right? It's, uh, I, I don't know. I've been studying China. Who is China? What is China? Uh, it's so so broad. It's so big. So many actors uh, involved uh, in the relationship between uh, you know China and, and and Africa, and so many so many ways to receive that to yeah to relate to that. You want to say something? Otherwise, I go to the other yeah. And and then I think um, regard to, to the other question about. Uh, uh, the phases of history, right? That China is kind of redoing what uh, the West has done in some way. And that's been true. I think there's been a learning curve. I mean, but all countries have done a kind of a repetition of uh, um, older, I think, you know, and is China is different. I think it has some of, some of its own uh, um, peculiarities and that's a hope. And I also believe in people uh, shaping things and in institutions were not, uh, uh, dominated by institutions, uh, determined by institutions, uh, but the, there are in this idea of development, right, modernization that China kind of absorbed uh, uh, and uh, you know is trying to propagate it also uh, abroad. Uh, I think there are some steps that you know are kind of necessary, and China is is, is copying and and it's uh, developing using some of the previous uh, uh, model and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, if you allow me, I think I'll, I'll, I'll actually want to say two things on the on the, your your idea of false familiarity, which I think is a very a very useful one, a very good one. And um, going off of what Adele mentioned of false narratives, I think one of the texts I work with is is, is a late nineteenth century text, which is uh, a story that even some Chinese historians have published and written things that oh, it's the first kind of Chinese explorer of, of Africa, et cetera, about um, a, a group, a, a couple of, of Chinese uh, explorers who travel with uh, a, a, a European diplomat and cross Africa uh, from um, 
Zanzibar, across the Congo Basin, all the way to the Atlantic coast. And this uh, text is actually a Chinese rewriting uh, and translation, translation and rewriting of the memories of Henry Morton Stanley, the, the Welsh American um, uh, explorer. And this, this idea, I think this text really symbolizes a way in which both Africans and um, Chinese, because of the way they were, be, uh, I think both specifically in terms of, of African China, but I think broadly of Asia and, and Africa, in which they were engaged in each other through the colonial framework and with uh, Europe as an intermediary for knowledge, for understanding each other. So the way the Chinese, uh, the Chinese society came to learn of, at least uh, the elites came to learn of, of, of Africa in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was through uh, colonial um, geographies, colonial ethnographies and the like. So I think this is still an issue about, even though today we, we, we like to speak of new frameworks, people say, oh, China is, is trying to create a new world order. It's not clear that it's really using tools that are different from the ones of the existing order. And I think we should interrogate, I mean, I think there are different views in, within China about where this should go, but uh, we should interrogate uh, um, the differences between this new, the new changes to the world order that are being pushed and the ones that were being pushed in the um, framework of Bandung, the Afro-Asian movement and the new international economic order. Um, and that the one being dominating, I think, today in China is not tied to sovereign equality as a founding principle. It's, 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 it presumes uh, an additional legitimacy to shape in international rules from being a world power. It is one that is, I think, in my view, willing to shape international norms on the basis of a bilateral uh, China-US relationship. Um, they're sending voices in China, but I think that's, that's something to, 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 to um, think about. Sorry, to your point about uh, de development uh, 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 ec ec economists and when they got wrong, I don't s study development in you know the the, the post World War II period, but what I do, and I but I suspect there are similar problems in that period than there were in the 19th century and the mistakes that uh, Euro European colonial empires made in their plans to uh, e extract a lot of value from Africa, but also just develop giant industrial projects in many ways, and is the one about labor. There were historically vast uh, overestimations of the Afri of African population density and African populations uh, in the 19th century, and the difficulty and the cost of African labor. Right? There was this presumption that these, these people, like labor in Africa, is cheap, but it is not. Uh, is is, there, is 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 the reality? So the 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 difficulty of obtaining labor in many regions of Africa has been uh, uh, a frequent obstacle uh, that um, people making grand plans for development have underestimated. And it's one that didn't present itself in the same acute uh, ways in much of Asia. Thank you. Let us open up to the audience. There is no question. Maybe we'll take maybe about two, three questions <coughs> if we have that and then they would respond. So I've seen one hand. Any other hands? Two? Okay. Okay, so why don't we start with two, so you and then, and then uh, I like to be democratic, so I'll come to the right, and so the right, please have some questions ready for me. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for this uh, panel. I am from the Center for European Studies at Harvard University, and actually I study the connections between Vietnam and Eastern Europe and the global socialism. This has been like a very inspiring panel, and it seems to me that what might be kind of a gluing all of these uh, interventions is that perhaps there is a need to not just kind of unearth, excavate, you know, you know the connections between Africa or imagined Africa and China, but also to maybe rethink the vocabulary that we have. I'm a historian, and the kind of basic tools that condition our thinking, such as periodization. So you talked about this kind of global Marxist, you know, intellectual project. You talked about development, industrialization, and I wonder to what extent these are still I'm sure they're very like, inf like good tools for analysis, but perhaps you could be a bit more daring in thinking about new, new ways of describing and analyzing those developments. And here the affective term, right, comes in. 
and talking about memory studies, right, and the kind of public history. And then the way you talked about this kind of ambivalent positions of this, you know, pan-Arab movement, for instance, and their positionalities. And my question is like, really, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do we really need new terms, vocabularies? Do we need them to reimagine the field, but also to give like a different framing of those connections at your study? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, thank you for all the excellent presentations, interesting presentations. Uh, my question is directed to uh, Lena, if I, if I may. Um, what you're describing is something that, you know, I've I, although I'm, uh, I'm uh, Abadir from the law school, um, so I don't study history, but, but I'm from East Africa, I'm from Ethiopia, so I, I see the discourse that you're describing primarily in the ministries of foreign affair type of discourse. And then it does leak into public discourse. And, and something that's something that I see both in Ethiopia and other African countries. Um, and what I wonder is if you also see the tensions and the critique um, both in, you know, in the uh, officialdom kind of discourse and in the public discourse. And the reason I'm saying this is specifically because um, I follow political cartoons in uh, Tanzania and Kenya. And I see a lot of that you know, tension in terms of China-Africa relations, labor, industrial uh, uh, parts and, and investments. And, and, I, and, I, um, and I wonder if you see that in both in the official discourses and, and public discourses. May, may I? Uh, start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay, so uh, to respond to the question on vocabulary, I would say, sure, <laughs> I like to invent words. Um, but no, I think it's a very important, um, perhaps, a realization that there, there needs to be a different, uh, so my, my field is international relations. International relations as a, um, as a, as a field of study it has predominantly come from experiences that were organic to histories the way they were experienced by Western powers, by Euro-American powers. The concepts that come from that, the theories, the lenses, by definition, they came from that particular context. Now, w when we shift the attention and try to look at these perspectives from, you know, from the global south, from the African continent, from the margins, from we are put against really this question. Do I really just use the same concept and pretend it works? Do I invent a whole new wheel and try to impose it on the rest of the canon that has been going on for ages? How do I position myself in terms of really, do I do a little bit of both? Do I, these kind of really in-betweenness, these, these areas of ambiguity, do I embrace that? grayness of that where it works in some places and it doesn't work in other places and it's messy and it's not clear and it's not going to speak for the global south just because I invented a word. Um, it, all of these are very legitimate and I think that I think that as far as I'm concerned the more hybrid the better it is because because there needs to be a, recon a, a reconciliation that there we, need, we are in a different mindset we are in a different place in a different place of thinking Right, so it is, it, and I think that that really is, um, it's, it, it, it is where the trend is going, right? So that's, that's where I see a lot of the interest in work and interest in, um, and there's an ethos that comes with that as well, because then you have to reconcile, you know, questions of, you know, uh, who are we bringing into the dialogue and the discourse? So who, who is this alternative way of thinking that we're bringing as opposed to all the other options that could also be in, you know, uh, part of this new repertoire or new kind of you know, index of theorists and thinkers and, and literary you know, figures and people that we are in conversation with. So there's, there's, there's a lot of that that I, th I, think, I, think the, you know, I think to me, really, the more the words, the better. Um, and not the other way around. Um, now, with the question directly of the critique, um, 
do I see, do we see, I mean, I think it, it, it really depends. For instance, when you take the, the case of COVID-19 as a particular just moment to see the levels of critiques and where they were, whether they were coming from the official level, from we, we, we see all of the above, right? So when you see, for instance, in Nigeria, the association of the medical uh, kind of uh, doctors association just you know put in pressure on the parliament to reject uh, medical aid, you know, and teams of of doctors coming from China to uh, to you know exercise. Uh, you see that kind of a level that's a, you know official enough, and you see you know you know parents association trying to put pressure on parliament to you know. Um, create some sort of pressure on the government. So we, we, it's just going to be really a mix. However, we, we know that a lot of these experiences of China in, 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 uh, maybe in a, in a bit of a generalized way uh, from the African public tends to be a bit more vocal about the critiques than the official level. Um, there are lots of reasons for that, and we can dig into whether that's because the order of incentives is different, or whether it's kind of a put in, a, you know, kind of a diplomatic facade to things. We can discuss, you know, what the what the the different reasons behind that. But certainly, one can absolutely take one issue and observe that there are two levels of reacting to it from within one same African con uh, country. And that would be sort of a, an official level and, and a more of a civil society organization level or kind of public level or political cartoon level. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting that there are oftentimes a sort of binary ways of kind of looking at the same issue. Thank you. Yes, uh, your, your question about uh, vocabulary, it change, need to change our vocabulary brought to my mind uh, the uh, Eurocentrism of geography. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, who decided where uh, Africa ends and Asia begins? It is Europeans, right? Uh, Europe also, of course, named continents and uh, oceans and so on and so forth. Uh, um, so uh, if, uh, another example is why is Madagascar, Mauritius, part of Africa while Yemen is not. So there is a arbitrariness in the Eurocentrism of geography, but is this reversible? Uh, I don't think so. I, I really doubt, yeah, I really doubt it is rever reversible. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, one could as well have named uh, the Indian Ocean, the African Ocean, right? If it had not been for uh, Europe's obsession with the sea route to uh, Asia and so forth. So uh, uh, I, I think the issue you raised is related to broader Eurocentrism of geography, which is, I think, difficult to reverse in my view. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's the, the question of your terms is, 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 is a good one. And I think, I mean, as uh, a historian primarily, it's really about which terms apply to which period, or which, which moment. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, I think it's important to, to create new terms when they're necessary, but I also, also think it needs, we need to be conscious about the utility of comparison or of analogs, um, in which case we can define our terms rigorously, but using the same terms is important to uh, identifying similar or connected um, uh, ph uh, phenomena or processes across societies. What, I'm, what I tend to focus on more so than terms is really the units of analysis I'm working with, right? So I mentioned earlier in terms of geography, depending on what period we're, we're, we're working with, we need to have these alternative conceptions of geography because that's just not how the people involved were thinking. They weren't thinking necessarily in terms of the continents as we, as we can see them today, as, as Professor Adam, I think, um, uh, pointed to. Uh, but also in terms of whether, depending on the sp specific, you know, uh, movement or process we're talking about, whether something like Afro-Asia is a proper uh, unit. So you mentioned that if we think about global Marxism or global uh, socialism, sorry, global socialism, it may not be um, Afro-Asia. When we're thinking about BRICS, is Afro-Asia the, the right uh, framework or is it something that is global south, is something that's non-Western, like what is this? Um, and so Afro-Asia is definitely part of these um, histories and these um, legacies, but it, it, we can think critically about what, what the right frame is. I've been thinking also like when, when we organized this conference about 
term, context geographical terms, but also development, agency, modernity, what does it mean, right? That they're so uh, consumed in some way, right? So uh, everybody's projecting like different meanings and uh, uh, and I wish we can just move and, and have a different terms, but again, who chooses the term? Uh, maybe it's better to have more terms. Uh, and I think there is always an issue of, um, yeah, I mean, power also behind all, all this, right? Who decides this term? And uh, yeah, but I'm also tired of this, I wish we can, you know, but then it's also, uh, for instance, with China, right? Development, development is what they're using themselves, right? So maybe they have different understanding, uh, different meanings. And also, I mean, uh, looking, I mean, working with different languages, like how this uh, translates also in different contexts, right? Where there's particular histories also that emerge in this. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what is uh, what is solution. Again, you, you replace it with a new term, and then this new term becomes also burdened by all these uh, different meanings, right? And uh, uh, that, that they, they are projected into. into it. Thank you. I'm going to move on to. Struck uh, by your earlier comment. That in the 19th century, China or Chinese and Muslims, Africa still rules in us. Mm -hmm. Africans and Muslims, China still rules in us. Mm -hmm. And I think about my academic colleagues in South Africa who really gamble about decolonizing knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah. And I'm I'm thinking <coughs> about two huge continents. Perhaps the two most populated continents, Asia and Africa. Uh, should I should I leave with the impression that we still it is it is the epistemic hegemony of Europe that still frames how we understand each other as continents? I mean, I think so. To this day, I mean, look at where we choose to go study when we leave our homes, <laughs> um, both, you know, Africans and Asians, this is, we tend to prefer somewhere else. Like, there's, it's sad, I think, in my view, that I chose to study China in the US, as opposed to <laughs> in China, for example, but there's a reason why I did it. Um, but I, I, we, I don't want to also um, erase efforts to overcome these uh, frameworks. It's very, very hard because these are structurally like embedded in, in everything, in, 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 in the way education works, in, 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 in the economy, everything. And, um, but I do, I think there was in the, um, in, the, in the period of decolonization, a more powerful critique of civilizational narratives that was linked also to a, uh, more, I think you, I think you mentioned um, yesterday a notion of, uh, someone mentioned some, a notion of cultural humility or something else, where there was more general engagement with um, interest. I mean, it was superficial to some degree, but I guess the, the idea, it was valorized to think about reading the works of African poets in many parts of Asia, or even like within Asia, uh, the works of Tagore in, in China and things like that. I think today, um, the, especially with a turn towards civilizational logics in many uh, regions, there's a, there's a sense of superiority that goes along with that. Um, um, and that is difficult to, 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 to overcome, so yeah. Um, uh, questions from, yes, uh, Caroline and two. So we'll take two and then, and then uh, we'll respond. There is also there. Sorry? There is a question for you. Okay, three questions, and then <coughs> maybe that would wind us up. And, and please make your questions uh, uh, brief, Wait, and okay. their responses will even be briefer. <laughs> okay. okay, you know, I'm not, I don't know much about this uh, theme um, of Africa Asia relation, but can I ask you? a speculative question. Uh, just from a point of view, this morning, I think it became clear that this time around, 
um, Chinese engagement in Africa was opened up by structural uh, adjustment policy of the 80s. And you were talking about how can we can look genealogically, okay, before there was socialist and other, but genealogically th this time around. And that neoliberalism have changed the whole thing. So they came in th through that window. My question is, is that from point of view, engagement with civil society. So, for example, when Asian investors come in from Hong Kong or wherever, they bought, for example, land in Africa. They have a hundred years lease. So, if you're an African living on that land, whose citizen are you? Citizen of Ghana or citizen of Malaysian or Chinese investor? What is the ethical responsibility of, of the Chinese investor who just says, I, I'm not concerned about government corruption, I'm going to intervene with uh, exploitation, killing gays, I'm not into human rights, I'm just here and because I'm not colonial. So what is the ethical responsibility or accountability for the local places, for citizens? Uh, whose citizen are you? You know, just, just from that point of view, judging from in th the wind on which China come back through a structural adjustment, takes advantage of minerals, land, and corruption. Thank you. Th thank you, Caroline. Uh, we'll take the second question. Don't worry, we have legal scholars here. <laughs> um, I was struck by this conversation about nostalgia and memory, and I was reminded about a trip to the Lusaka National Museum and there was uh, an exhibit on the Tazara, and it said celebrating 40 years of um, you know, friendship between China and Africa. And what was striking to me was, of course, the exhibit was you know, supported by the, the Chinese embassy, the local embassy, but it was funded by one of the construction companies, Chinese construction companies. So in this effort that, uh, Adele, you mentioned, you know, we need to break down and see what China are we talking about? What is global China? We understand what the government of China is doing. Uh, we, we are trying to understand what the government of China is doing in this effort of rewriting and fictionalizing or celebrating the shared history. But what is the role of construction companies and corporate China in this process? Can we make that distinction or does it not matter? Thank you. And then we have a third question. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. I'm a Chinese, so I would like to ask a non-Chinese question. I mean, we are our topic is African Asian, so we talk about a lot of it, a lot of it about China. But what I want to ask is about uh, how about that the uh, new players, especially Asian. We have uh, Japan has is a very important player. We have Jaka, we have uh, Ticket for a very long time, and then we have India. We have uh, and a Korea, who uh, also in uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, they all launched a new summit with African. It's the very similar to Chinese Farcock. So, I mean, how do we assess uh, those new players, their role, their impact on African development? Because this is very relevant to, to how we assess the Chinese influence. Because we have the new, there's, I'm in Harvard for quite a while. I, I heard a lot of sort of uh, original saying narrative for Chinese uh, engagement with Africa. So I'm asking, the new players, they are generally democracy, the American allies, the, uh, they uh, maybe adopt some DAC, uh, uh, OCD DAC countries, some not. So some ahead of China, some below, uh, behind a bit. So I mean, if we kind of uh, adhere to a kind of standard that is specified or tailor-made for China, then they, we have a problem to to assess the, the, their new or to evaluate the roles of the new players. So I want to say, how do you, how do you read? Yeah. Thank you. For the, yeah. So Thank you. Wi widen the lens. <laughs> okay. Uh, responses. Um, I think so. With regard to the lease territories, uh, you know, China is leasing territories. The Western powers did the, the 99 years come from Western practices. But then if China leaves a territory, for instance, in Sri Lanka, there was a, this case, right? This lease of a port, how much of the port? Uh, the sovereignty is still of the Sri Lanka government and the people living in there, they're still uh, uh, Sri Lankan citizens. So even if the land is leased to a Chinese company, the sovereignty of Sri Lanka still holds, citizenship of uh, Sri, Lanka, um, Sri Lanka people still hold. 
Uh, sometimes uh, uh, there is some jurisdiction involved, like extra jurisdiction that China can have in the, in the lease territory. Uh, but that's as, as far as it goes, and it's decided always by Sri Lanka government. Um, and then uh, with regard to the private uh, um, uh, enterprises, like uh, the private companies, uh, they have their own interest. Uh, so it's, it's very uh, fascinating to see the clashes sometimes between interests of the China, even, even within the Chinese government, state-owned enterprises, uh, there is sometimes a mismatch between what the government wants uh, and what these actors want and do on the ground, to the point that the government has to go and kind of scold them at a certain point, right? If they don't, if they misbehave or like so. Um, and then, of course, you have all these private actors. Sometimes they uh, play with the, for instance, BRI because it's money coming in, uh, but they're very pragmatic. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes yeah, they play along, but they don't really believe in all this. They see advantages in, uh, in playing along with, the, with these narratives and rhetoric. Can I add something to what Adele yes, just said? So actually, just to add a bit to the to the scolding of the private companies sometimes by the by the uh, public or state-owned enterprises, there there are even cases where you see Chinese private companies in Africa, for instance, taking on a project that's funded by the World Bank or funded mm -hmm. by the IMF. And uh, Ujun, uh, who is a, a Yenshin uh, Harvard Fellow here last year actually works on some of this and in some of the instances actually what you find is Chinese private company is when they take the funding from World Bank what they're doing is they're actually enacting norms and standards of operating that are OECD based they are of the World Bank they, so they are upholding essentially what the status quo in terms of these norms international norms is whereas if you didn't know that we would perhaps think all Chinese companies are out to get the world in terms of really, you know, spreading Chinese norms and values and ways of doing things, which is quite interesting. When actually, when we dig into these uh, again messy areas, the gray spaces, we find that that you know it's a lot more complicated than than might meet the eye. Yeah, but also one one last thing is that uh, there is this idea that China has its own order, its own laws, its own is it actually follows pretty much what again has been established uh, already and. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, e even they abide a lot by norms uh, of the host country uh, and also with the World Bank uh, good practices. And there is all a, a, an improvement also of the BRI in terms of legislations, guidelines to promote good governance and standards that are like of the World Bank, etc. So uh, it's not that China goes in and uh, plays by its own rules. Its own rules very often are modeled on Western uh, rules. Uh, and uh, I think a lot is, uh, is done like looking at the World Bank examples. And very often they also collaborate, right? There are instances in which, uh, as uh, Lena was saying, yeah. So may I turn, I'll let you close this out. May I turn to Sefuddin, since yeah. your recent yeah. book uh, also looks at Japan okay. in okay. terms of widening the lens a bit. Okay. And then I'll let Idris have the last one. Yeah, word. so uh, uh, as far as why uh, our panel did not focus on other major powers of Asia, I think two reasons could be mentioned. One is uh, uh, that uh, China, of course, buys more, sells more, and invests more in Africa, right? That's the economic aspect. And secondly, unlike other powers, China is the, uh, uh, has a hegemonic ambition. Hegemonic ambition. It's an emerging superpower, let me put it that way. So this also justifies, I think, the focus we gave, it, we gave China in this panel, in my view. Yeah. Yeah, um, I hope. I, mean, I was trying in my <coughs> intervention to, to widen the lens and think about Africa and Asia more broadly, but I think, first of all, Japan and if you want to talk about Taiwan, cannot be described as new players. Japan was in Africa in the 1970s. Uh, Taiwan was obviously used relationships with African countries to make its case for being the legitimate um, representative of, of, of China on the international st stage. Uh, uh, the, the, the KMT government did that. So um, India, to a certain degree, is new, but in some certain degree, it's very old, as I mentioned. Um, not India, of course, as, a, as, a, as an independent state. Even then, it, it, the, the relationship is complicated, but you know, the, 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 as I said, the, the connections and the engagement between uh, India and, and Africa. So I think all of these, um, so I guess the first part is, 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 is it's, not, it's, not, it's not 
they're not necessarily new players, so to speak, but I also want to strike a hopeful note. So I said, okay, we don't understand each other, and I think part of the problem is actually a lot of Africans don't know the difference between these different players and what their different objectives are, or, you know, um, and that's, that, that's, that's, that's an issue. But one thing that I, I love is every time I, I, I go um, and I spend time, you know, whether it's in, in Morocco, in back in my home country of Côte d'Ivoire, in uh, Kenya, wh whatever country, and also in, um, yeah, anyways, um, the number of new shows on television that are like either like K-dramas or like Chinese dramas that are like dubbed in, in like Darija or something like that, or, uh, <laughs> or, uh, or I mean, with a long, much longer history of, of Indian film and series. And I think, I wonder what that's gonna, Sometimes I think it just doesn't work. It, like there's, for some reason, there's no, uh, Chinese shows or Korean shows don't seem to be as popular, at least in my country, as like ones from the Philippines, or from Turkey, or from uh, Latin America. But I think there's something interesting going on there. Of course, students. Uh, I studied, um, uh, even though I did most of my studying in the U.S., I studied in China, and I, I, I met, I had a lot of other African um, friends there, and I know African friends who were studying in Japan, in Korea, and the like. And I'm, I wonder what that's going to lead to, and I think that's um, we, the future will tell. Please join me in thanking our panelists. We applaud for them, we applaud for you. This has been wonderful, and I think it's lunch time now. Okay, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Manuel.
our three uh, panelists. Uh, Kumiko Makino from the Institute of Developing Economies uh, of the Japan External Trade Organization. She has done a lot of work on Africa. Uh, Xiaoyan Tan, uh, directly from Beijing uh, Tsinghua University. And uh, uh, last but not least, Veda uh, Vadianatan. Uh, from the Institute of Chinese Studies in Delhi, but also Princeton. You spent some time, that's, you just finished, okay. Uh, so, welcome you, and uh, I think we can welcome you with a, a round of applause, like we did with uh, all the others. And so, the topic today is like reconceptualizing agency, and agency is a, uh, is a term that uh, uh, emerged very often when we um, when we see Africa vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis great powers, uh, um, and I often have a sense that it's a bit paternalistic sometimes, right? Because we don't talk about uh, United States agency, right? But we talk about African agency. And that's a way um, partly to address the gap in knowledge, right? Like how do we define like, this gap in knowledge of, uh, I don't know, African vis-a-vis -vis China or like other uh, Asian actors. And, um, and yeah, so today we're here to uh, hear uh, our three uh, panelists, uh, their takes on agency from their experience and research and work. And I leave the floor to the first one, Kumiko Makino, please, thanks. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, and I would like to express uh, my sincere gratitude for the uh, organizer of the conference, um, the Center for uh, Asia Center and the Center for African Studies at Harvard University. Uh, and it's an absolute uh, my pleasure for me to be part of this uh, panel. Um, uh, as, I, as I was introduced, I'm a, I work as a, a researcher at the Institute of Developing Economies, uh, which is specializing in, in area studies and my work, uh, most of my work, uh, is that kind of nature, and my main research field is South Africa. But uh, besides those um, area studies uh, work, uh, for the past 10 years or so, I have also developed my uh, research interest in the history of uh, South Africa-Japan relations. Uh, in particular, I've been interested in the history of anti-apartheid movement uh, in Japan. Uh, how the ordinary people, citizens in Japan, try to build alternative kinds of relations with South Africa, uh, people of South Africa. So today I would like to share some of my research findings about Japan Anti-Apartheid Committee, a loose coalition of civic anti-apartheid groups across Japan, which uh, was started uh, in 1960s and existed up, up until mid-1990s. So it's not about, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, the, the African agency, but it's the, uh, about the agency of Japanese citizens. But it's, it's uh, I, I want to highlight uh, the agency of Japanese uh, people, which are different from uh, the Japanese state and the mainstream uh, relation with, uh, with Africa, uh, particularly South Africa. So um, the, for the background, Anti-apartheid activism uh, was one of the most important uh, global and transnational social movements of the 20th century. And there is a growing uh, research interest in the global anti-apartheid movement. However, until recently, the literature primarily focused on the Western anti-apartheid movements, including uh, those in the UK or Nordic countries and North America. And um, anti-apartheid activism in Japan has been largely overlooked, uh, in my understanding. And Japanese anti-apartheid activism has not only has been not only overlooked in the global anti-apartheid literature, but it has not attracted much attention either in the literature on South Africa-Japan relations because they are they tend to focus on the government and the economic uh, side of relations between the two countries. So um, yes, Japan's relations with South Africa in the apartheid era or in Cold War era were similar, very much similar uh, in nature to those of Western countries, 
both in terms of its Cold War geopolitics as well as economic relations. So the Japanese anti-apartheid activism can be understood as a kind of counter movement against the friend, that kind of friendly, nice relations with the Japanese government and business had with apartheid in South Africa. Uh, so it was a counter movement against that. And so in that context, it was natural that the Japanese anti-apartheid movement shared some characteristics with Western anti-apartheid movement due to the similarity of the uh, geopolitical context and so on. In terms of its like tactics and the modality of activism, there were some similarities. Uh, those include like uh, calling for uh, economic, tighter economic sanctions and consumer boycott uh, of South African products and so on. Then if the Japanese anti-apartheid movement were just about that, there will be nothing new to add to this global anti-apartheid literature. However, for me, uh, the Japanese anti-apartheid uh, movement is an uh, interesting case uh, for the history of um, global anti-apartheid activism in the sense that it was located at the intersection uh, between uh, the Western and Afro-Asian uh, contexts. So, what I'm trying to say is that J Japan was not only part of the Western bloc under the Cold War, but uh, the context of Africa-Asia relations was very important for anti-apartheid activism in Japan. The, to illustrate that point, uh, the one is uh, right from the start, the context of Afro-Asian connectivity was very, very much crucial to the beginning of Japanese anti-apartheid movement. The first encounter between the South African liberation movement and the progressive Japanese activists apparently took place in 1963 uh, on the side of um, uh, Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Conference. According to a participant in the meeting, the ANC African National Congress delegation criticized Japan for being the only country in Asia and Africa that did not support the UN uh, resolution for sanction uh, against South Africa and urged Japanese people to start uh, stand against uh, racial discrimination, stand against apartheid. And those who met with the ANC uh, at that conference started the first anti-apartheid group after returning to Japan. That's the origin of the, the activism. And also for those who engaged in anti-apartheid activism, um, I would argue the issue of so-called honorary white uh, was always very central. <coughs> honorary white uh, was not a legal term uh, in South Africa, but it was widely used in media reports. Uh, to describe the controversial treatment of Japanese people living under the apartheid regime. So in the newsletters or at anti-apartheid rallies, the activists often provoked the sense of kind of shame about Japanese people being regarded as honorary whites and called for rejection of that label. So activists would say, if you accept by accepting the honorary white label, you place yourself on the side of white South Africans and you are complicit in oppression of black South Africans. So you have to reject that. We have to reject that. that. And in my interviews, when interviewed uh, former activists, former anti-apartheid activists, I have noticed that theme of this honorary white often function as very powerful motivation for them to continue their engagement in the anti-apartheid activism. The term honorary white reminded them that apartheid uh, was not just what was happening in South Africa, far away, but it was also directly related to themselves, to the way Japanese people exist in the world. 
anti-apartheid movement was not just about giving support for people far away, but it was also very much about changing themselves, changing Japanese people and society. Um, if, if I may uh, add one, another point, uh, anti-apartheid movement in Japan also had orientation towards uh, solidarity with Asian people as foundation of solidarity with African people. One example is the anti-apartheid Asia Oceania workshop, uh, which was held in Tokyo in 1988. As the organizer of the workshop, the Japan Anti-Apartheid Committee invited activists from uh, various Asian and Oceanic countries, uh, in addition to representatives of ANC, PAC, and the United Nations, and discussed uh, not only the issue of apartheid, but issues of Asian people themselves were facing, such as human rights abuse, ethnic discrimination, and democratization. Uh, because um, they believe that these issues are interconnected and without uh, tackling those problems, uh, they could not, they believe they could not build uh, a powerful anti-apartheid activism either. So to conclude, um, in this presentation, I wanted to highlight that the Japanese anti-apartheid movement was not just a, like a copycat of the Western movement, but it uh, tried to build its own way of activism, different in focus and the framing uh, from the Western anti-apartheid movement. And it was also about resisting the mainstream Japan's perspective about South Africa and negotiating the, the alternative uh, relations with people of South Africa. So, yeah, I, 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 could, I, I will stop here. I, I couldn't um, explore fully, but I uh, hope this presentation would uh, help reconsidering the agency uh, in Africa-Asia relations, it's, which is unmediated uh, by the West. It's just, just uh, one case uh, study about that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, yeah. <coughs> so when it comes to the agency concept, uh, in international relations, there's a, there are some uh, kind of uh, definition saying three, po uh, three factors are important. The first is uh, intentionality, so have purpose. And the second is uh, to have a social context. And the third is uh, then some uniqueness, like a unique role in the whole system. And uh, I would like to um, yeah, use uh, this uh, rough uh, definition as the basis uh, for my discussion on agencies in the current uh, uh, Africa-Asia uh, interaction. And especially then, uh, using the knowledge sharing or knowledge transfer as an example. So, and also then <laughs> to look at uh, actually the state and the enterprise and the individual, three different levels, how these different levels of agencies uh, work. So because uh, as uh, we also already saw uh, in the morning sessions, uh, actually people, uh, uh, yeah, the panelists were discussing like uh, what uh, China really means, because this uh, China, the world, sounds always like a big uh, monolithic uh, concept. But in fact, the China or African countries, on the country level, some of <coughs> some of their intentions and policies, they do cannot really be implemented. For example, the both country, both sides, they promote knowledge transfer or knowledge sharing among each side. And uh, saying the, like the Africans, uh, then uh, yeah, China is willing to share the development knowledge with Africans. Meanwhile, also saying that Chinese uh, should learn from Africans. But these uh, political rhetorics often then face some uh, challenges in the real social context. <coughs> For example, uh, although the Chinese government spent uh, 
uh, yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, every year to have to train the African technicians, uh, like bring them to China and uh, uh, officials to uh, like uh, come to China for weeks uh, or months uh, to learn. But actually, what I heard, yeah, when I went to Africa, I uh, visited some of these uh, early trainees. And I found the effects of this training are quite problematic. For example, an uh, interesting point is that they often say the Chinese show them the most advanced technology for uh, like the uh, digitalized administration. But often in this uh, rural area in, and also small, small towns in Africa, <coughs> they said, uh, we just uh, saw this uh, very sophisticated technology and uh, the software. We learned them for several weeks, but after we come back, we have almost uh, nothing to do. We can do almost uh, do nothing because uh, this uh, uh, digitalized uh, and uh, computer-based uh, uh, yeah, uh, administration skills, uh, they require a uh, lot of uh, like uh, infrastructure from the past stable power to or to like uh, your uh, whole system and <coughs> the the whole system need to be digitalized so that you can work uh, you can really streamline uh, yeah, the whole process but uh, this un did not exist in Africa and so therefore what they saw uh, in fact uh, was just uh, like a demonstration and uh, they didn't really get these techniques. And also <coughs> when it comes to the training of uh, some technicians uh, or the African students, uh, yeah, often they also complain when they uh, yeah, come back uh, to Africa from after getting bachelor's or master's degrees in China. Actually, in Africa, they cannot find a really the place for them to apply their knowledge because there are no uh, enough uh, uh, faction enterprises or positions for them. Often, they just uh, became uh, a translator and, uh, in Chinese companies. So this uh, <coughs> just uh, shows uh, how the government uh, spend, had uh, this intention. This government agency spent money and a purpose but then you know, when it comes to this uh, individual and enterprise uh, uh, agencies, then they can, uh, due to their social context and uh, their purpose of, uh, yeah, uh, like uh, beside the politics, uh, they have this uh, more economic and uh, yeah, pragmatic uh, purpose. And that uh, actually deviates from the government uh, agency's uh, intention. But on the, <coughs> on the other side, uh, there's also another way. So sometimes when the individual and then the enterprises, uh, they want to, uh, their training and uh, their like, uh, sharing of knowledge, so they also depend on the larger context. For example, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, enterprises, uh, they go to the uh, Africa and uh, yeah, they, want, they invest and they train the local workers, employees, and uh, trying to um, get the, uh, uh, yeah, to have this uh, uh, knowledge and uh, yeah, to try to like, uh, have this uh, enterprises operating in Africa. <coughs> But then, uh, the, uh, however, the knowledge they, uh, they teach, often these are rather like a fragmented. It's uh, only for, um, yeah, the, like, uh, for, for this, uh, uh, only when, uh, so the African, because of this uh, Chinese investments, they in Africa, then at the beginning were just uh, like uh, uh, en uh, enterprise by enterprise, it's more like a scattered. And uh, every worker or manager can just uh, learn a small part of the knowledge. 
which they feel uh, not really like contributing to the, it's all very simple knowledge, repetitive, and uh, cannot uh, really like, uh, yeah, it's uh, just uh, always do the same thing for year long, then people say that's not really knowledge, just a repetitive uh, work, labor. But however, the Chinese government, uh, we know they with this partnered with some African government, on this uh, uh, industry zones, also on the sector uh, policy, so that it's not only the individual enterprises invest, but they uh, intentionally brought uh, a number of uh, enterprises together in the uh, in a zone, and also then uh, along upstream and downstream along the value chain. So this all together actually make this uh, simple and uh, repetitive uh, skill actually becoming an important uh, part of the whole value chain. Because uh, the so-called uh, industrial skill, it's uh, rather about uh, the uh, systemic uh, yeah, uh, like operation. When you, have the, although everybody just uh, do the simple ones, but when the whole uh, value chain or the cluster, they come together, then you understand uh, like uh, the role of each uh, worker in assembly line or the uh, role of this uh, each uh, enterprise in this value chain. This makes uh, sense for the whole picture. And uh, when Africans, uh, they, are, uh, not, they are small and uh, it's, it's a repetitive uh, skills, then are situated in this cluster and then the uh, economic zones. They can uh, finally understand the importance and the significance of their skill and the knowledge. So, but that actually is indispensable from some uh, policy push from this uh, state level so that they can really understand uh, how this uh, whole system uh, is working. So this is <coughs> just uh, two ways to show the, uh, how this uh, no, uh, knowledge transfer, this uh, uh, practice and the intention on different levels of uh, agencies. They are interrelated and uh, sometimes uh, this actually maybe uh, distracts uh, uh, from each other, but sometimes they also work together with each other. And uh, I think it's uh, currently just uh, like a, a preliminary study to see this difference. Maybe I think it's related uh, to also about the whole industrialization or the modernization of uh, uh, Asia and African economies, how they really learn about this. It's actually never say, or the, even in China, it's never a, like a, uh, just a from top down, this monolithic agency and uh, say everything and then everything is done. So there's always uh, been this uh, diverse and uh, very interactive uh, relationship between the different levels of actors. And uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, complexity uh, now also then demonstrates itself in Africa and uh, through this via this uh, Asia-Africa interaction. And uh, uh, but the more uh, important, I think the their each uh, uh, act, each agency's uh, role and uh, this uh, interagency's mechanism in this uh, capital-driven uh, modernization maybe wor is worth further investigation. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so when I got this topic called Reconceptualizing Agency, and I think Adelie, you were the one who wrote the brief for it. Yeah. The last part, she ends the brief to um, us with this question, right? How can we formulate alternative frameworks to understand their contributions to international society? So when I read this question, I thought, let me try and break this down into two other questions. So two questions that I'm going to try and uh, address today. One is, how is agency gained by actors who have been excluded from mainstream policy making? And two, how do you transform agency to action? 
So to try and sort of answer these questions, what I thought I would do today is, I was just talking to someone else about this, uh, international affairs scholars tend to sort of stick to meta narratives. So what I thought I'll try and do today is take two case studies that we looked at in two completely different projects. So these case studies by themselves have uh, its own background and context and none of which I'm going to discuss today. Um, but I'm just going to present these um, two separate stories because I think they're very interesting in sort of trying to find answers to these broad questions. So the first one is about um, the Social Work Research Center. It's this NGO that's, um, that is um, situated in Rajasthan in India. Just by a quick show of hands, has anyone heard of this place? Because in India, a lot of people have. Okay, it's also called the Barefoot College. Yes, okay. So essentially what happens here, a lot of things happen here, but the one thing that I'm going to talk about today is something called the Solar Mamas program, right? So there's this problem. There are many villages in India that are not electrified, that do not have access to electricity. There are many women who live in these villages who are um, not educated. They don't have formal education, they're unlettered. So what this uh, institute does, what the Barefoot College does, is there's a whole system to how they go about this, and I've written about it extensively, but they essentially pick 60 women from these villages. They bring them to their campus in Thelonia, in Rajasthan, which is a very rural village, and in six months, they train these women who have had no formal education to become solar engineers, right? So these women fabricate, install, um, uh, maintain household solar electrification systems by the end of their training. Now, why am I interested in this as a scholar of international affairs? This model becomes popular, right? This model becomes popular, and countries in Africa, governments in Africa, come to this tiny NGO in India and say, hey, hang on, can we send women from our villages to rural India? Can they be trained, right? And this isn't one, it's not a one-off or a two-off. Now, there are MOUs signed with over 36 African countries, right? And who's training them? These women in Rajasthan, in Ghungats, who are from exceptionally conservative families, you know, who have not stepped out um, of their homes until this training, are teaching these women, these African women, how to install these solar lamps, right? And then now these master trainers from India, these women, are then going to Zanzibar and Nairobi and Dar es Salaam and helping set up these solar factories, right? So I go there because I want to see how is this Rajasthani-speaking auntie G, you know, teaching a Swahili-speaking auntie G how to build solar systems. And it was so fascinating, right? By the end of six months, kinships are formed, relationships are built, they don't speak the same language, but that's just a minor detail. No one's worried about that, right? This I thought was really interesting because at this point, until this point, the government of India isn't involved, right? And then suddenly when this model becomes important, suddenly the government steps in. So now the Ministry of External Affairs funds a part of it. You know, other aid agencies are involved. A lot of other funders have come, and now it's taken on a whole other sort of um, life of its own. But what was interesting for me is this shows us a model that by sort of finding these are very specific problems specific to the developing world, very specific vulnerabilities, and which are very specific to different contexts. And yet, from a village in India, this problem can be solved in villages in other parts of Africa. So by constructing new paradigms of knowledge, these actors, these NGOs, aren't in decision-making spaces in foreign policy in India. And yet now they found a way to have their voice heard and they found a way to sort of address a very specific problem, which I think was a very um, sort of exciting example of we're talking about agency, right? Where none existed and then you try to find a way to formulate a space. Another case study that I wanted to sort of discuss while asking these big questions is um, the Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association, which is this environmental group based out of Harare. Now, they do a lot of activism uh, in Harare. Uh, very famously, in 2020, they um, held this campaign against a Chinese company that was mining in the Huangwei uh, National Park. Um, they led the protests. They filed uh, an urgent appeal at the Harare um, High Court. Um, they do a lot of work like that. So I got involved with them a few years ago. We were doing this project um, looking at um, Chinese mining in these specific communities in Zimbabwe. And what was really interesting was Suddenly we had a group, a collective of lawyers and activists and, uh, and academics, and all of us trying to sort of do this study. And at the end of the study uh, came out with a handbook, and the handbook was then used to do capacity building for Zimbabwean um, you know, parliamentarians and bureaucrats to say this is what we found on the ground, right? 
And so the field work included, like, talk, we, I think they conducted over 200 interviews of like tribal chiefs and community members. They had more than seven focus group meetings. And all of these findings went into this book. This book was then used as a capacity building measure to sort of spread the word. And then now what happens is Zela has been called into um, the government processes when they are discussing new laws for all, ways to alter um, existing environmental laws, right? So this is an activist group that really isn't traditionally where you would go to as you know, a, knowledge, a center of knowledge creation, because you, you would imagine that it's a realm that's sort of um, you know, I kept with uh, academia or think tanks. And yet they sort of find a space for themselves there, and then they're sort of now somehow involved in a minute way into larger, broader decision making or policy making in Zimbabwe. So, and there are many, many examples like this, right? The state that I'm from in um, Kerala, we have something called the Kudumbashri Mission. Kudumbashri um, is this self-help group, um, this women, women's empowerment, poverty eradication scheme that started in Kerala, was very successful in Kerala. And then suddenly you had the government of Uganda come in and the government of South Africa come in. And these women from Kerala went to Kampala to do a <laughs> workshop to sort of um, talk about um, you know, stories that, or models that worked in these environments. There are many different case studies of actors who in international affairs have been in the margins, who haven't really been mainstream, but who are sort of slowly building their voice to sort of at least influence or inform mainstream decision makers. Now, none of these um, case studies are perfect, right? That's not at all what I'm trying to say. The barefoot model, is it sustainable? When you have solar panels that are going to be very, very cheap, does it make sense to fly 60 women from Ghana into India? Probably not. So there are many issues within this, but I think what it does um, sort of throw light at is that when you discuss agency, and when you discuss agency of actors, I think there are several structural limitations, right? There's a huge power dynamic between actors who are donors and donees, and there's a lot of asymmetries. But what these kind of case studies help us do is to sort of at least gives us the freedom to imagine possibilities, new possibilities, right? Um, the fact, it also throws light on the fact that a traditional knowledge systems or traditional um, or, or like modern ways of thinking about traditional um, issues, you know, problems that have been that have plagued these communities for a long time. There are innovative ways in which you could think about it, and also the idea that, like I think the previous panelists mentioned, that we need to when we discuss agency, when you talk about agency, there is a need to look beyond the state and beyond state agencies. Because these interactions between Asian societies and African societies, they're happening at so many different layers, right? How many of you knew the government of Kerala sent 10 women from Kerala to Kampala, right? So these interactions are happening at so many different levels, and there are so many micro stories in all of these um, geographies. And there is a need to, I mean, all of us, me included, we've all talked about the African agency, right? We've all written about it. But there is a need to sort of um, deconstruct it and sort of look at the smaller stories. Because I think my economist friends would say, so what? So what if this one case, you know, it doesn't mean anything? Sure, it doesn't. But it just gives us freedom to at least imagine um, solutions to very common problems facing the global south. Now, a few months ago, I wouldn't have thought that this was worthy of you know, conversation. But I will not tell you where. But I went to this one particular country in the West, and it was about development cooperation um, in Africa, because Europe is where you discuss these things. And I was very, I mean, I was very struck by the fact that a lo lot of the conversations on development at that conference was about aid, right? And it was only about different mechanisms of aid. And not, not only was that a point of um, a point that sort of struck with me, but also the idea that developing countries, the solutions that they were coming up with to face developmental issues, didn't really make the cut, right? It was largely about, okay, how do we restructure aid? How do we sort of, so then I thought, no, there is a space, when there are spaces we need to talk about the agency of all of these countries, the agencies of actors in the margins, agencies of um, these NGOs and grassroots organizations, which don't really make international affairs um, headlines, but um, should be sort of talked about. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, the three of you, and uh, there's some, uh, uh, a lot of uh, points that can be connected together. And I will start by asking each of you one question. And um, 
and then I'll open the floor for uh, more questions. Uh, and uh, with uh, uh, Makino, so <coughs> what was the impact uh, of this uh, anti-apartheid um, activism in Japan, right? Because you said like it was from, I mean, 96, 99, but what was the relationship with the government, with the Japanese government? How did they react? Did they, try, they tried to suppress it. Uh, uh, were they able to um, influence it in, in, uh, in some ways? Uh, um, and I really like this, this thing that uh, like this Japanese are mediated <coughs> by the West uh, uh, and like how this uh, apartheid was not just happening in South Africa, but also kind of redefining Japanese, like who, 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 uh, who, who uh, we are in the world. Uh, um, and if you can say a bit more about like this uh, mediation also from, from the West, because it's still, you present it as a, a part of a global uh, no, movement and uh, you know being between Afro Asian context and and the West, and then for um, uh, Tan Chao Yang, I, um, I would like to know a bit more about the um, the agency, if you want. You talk about inter agencies, uh, but then what African workers think, right? Because a lot of your discussion was about uh, China attempts to transfer knowledge, right, and different techniques, different ways. Uh, but then like in this uh, interagency mechanisms, right, where the, if you want, agency of uh, Africans, uh, African government, African workers that actually have to undergo this, uh, these processes uh, of training uh, comes in. And then uh, for Veda, um, I have questions about agency. So it seems that, and this is a bigger problem, agency is only for actors in the margins. Mm. Right, so you need to be in the margins in order to get agency, right? And then once you get agency, maybe you don't need it anymore. And so, uh, also, how is agency exerted? You said that we need to get out of the state, uh, um, but then you also say it, it, there is sort of this assumption that you need to inform uh, the policymakers, right, mm -hmm. to have agency. That's how uh, the, the cases you, you, you discussed uh, <coughs> manifest. Uh, in some way the agency, but then you also say that we have to deconstruct it and there are other ways. But so I want to know a bit more about like, again, agencies for whom mm -hmm. uh, and how do we manifest it? What are like, is it just in the state, policy level, other ways? Uh, yeah, so I think we can start, uh, maybe we start from Veda, let's do this. Uh, yeah, no uh, pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think everyone has agency, right? But I think in this specific um, context of how is it exerted, it becomes important to, or the reason I think the ones in the margins get sort of discussed is because usually things happen to them mm -hmm. and they have no say, mm -hmm. right? Like in the Zela example, for instance, in the study that we did, these were like eight communities in Zimbabwe that we looked at. Mm -hmm. And th th these were huge corporations coming into mine in their uh, villages, right? And so when we spoke to um, like the tribal chiefs and the community leaders, they were not at any level part of the decision-making process, mm -hmm. right? So their water, I mean, there were, there were issues, environmental issues, all kinds of issues. And this isn't particular to Chinese mining. Let me say that mining is a dirty business. It's particular to all kinds of mining. But the point is the investments were sanctioned. Mm -hmm. These investments were happening they were not part of the decision making. It was happening to them, right? A lot of them had to move, a lot of them were losing cattle, a lot of them have had issues which actually affect their every day. Mm -hmm. So I think what I mean by that is the reason it becomes important to listen to the margins is how do we get them to have a say in what's happening to their lives? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which isn't often discussed, I think, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because who cares about the agency of that corporation? the corporation has sufficient power to move lives around and change things around, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little bit of that. So and it's, and I, I don't think it is that once you come to um, the decision-making space or that is the end all of it, mm -hmm. um, or, or the fact that um, this, in this particular case they were able to inform decision-makers, that wasn't the win, mm -hmm. but that should be a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. 
that should be the minimum, right? All of these actors and all of these um, should have a stake, should have a say in what's happening. And then there are, then the game, I mean, then the, the um, conversation becomes agency within the decision. That's the next level, I would imagine, right? But now we're talking about, no, you can't let things happen to um, folks and not sort of hear them out. And therefore, it's important to keep stressing on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to African agency <laughs> regarding this uh, knowledge uh, sharing, and uh, I find uh, mm, there are several cases. For, for example, when it's about the uh, Africans uh, or wants to learn knowledge, wants to yeah, in, in both in China, coming to China for degree study or to learn knowledge uh, uh, within Africa. And then uh, one the thing is uh, how they can really find the, um, this uh, knowledge learned to apply them. So that's uh, about the question of uh, <coughs> to uh, really have impact, not only to learn knowledge, but to also put it in a social context. And then that's uh, uh, sometimes actually, uh, yeah, they are often, I would say maybe 50%, they cannot really find a very uh, helpful context and uh, some uh, like uh, go further to uh, Europe or US uh, to, uh, yeah, to uh, for further degree and to find a job there. There are often cases like this. This is a brain drain uh, scheme, uh, the scenario. But uh, <clears throat> there are also cases when the Africans, they <clears throat> Uh, manager to uh, put it into the social context for some part, some usage. Like, uh, uh, f for example, I w visited a pharmaceutical company in Ethiopia, and then they find uh, to have after having joint venture with Chinese for quite a few years, and they believe, uh, yeah, the Af local workers, employees, they say they have almost fully uh, mastered the techniques. But actually the Chinese have a little bit of different opinions on this kind of uh, uh, mastering the skills because they said the <coughs> thing, the local technicians, they haven't got enough experience. Actually, a lot of this knowledge, it's not really about a theoretical knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's more in the social practice and also even when you repair machines, it's just a through like a decade long and a very, uh, yeah, to meet uh, this uh, different uh, occasions, different conditions and uh, you learn how to do the get, grasp this uh, manufacturing and machinery skills in practice. That's uh, the case for Chinese, but also for Europeans, it's uh, German technicians as well. While in African context, often these uh, uh, workers, they just uh, lack enough uh, like uh, the uh, industrial experience or this uh, uh, practice for them to uh, really like uh, grasp that uh, in depth. So that uh, makes, uh, even when they feel they are uh, capable of daily operations, but due to the lack of practice and experience, maybe the, uh, they are not really like uh, the same, can reach the same level as uh, the uh, foreign technicians. And there are also, even when we, if we look at uh, uh, at state level, actually the African uh, officials, sometimes uh, they uh, have this, uh, like when it comes to this industry zones, they also have their uh, initiative of uh, learning this knowledge and apply to their own context according to their own uh, country, uh, yeah, this, con uh, this uh, policies or uh, the circumstances. This is a very positive uh, idea. But however, the question is again then, 
uh, what's the result? Yeah, it's uh, the knowledge to have this initiative. It's like to see this purpose and put it in the context. That's exactly shows this agency, the role of agency. But actually, that's always the question of effects and uh, real impacts. I think we still need the time to see. Because uh, the, like this, uh, uh, to borrow Chinese uh, development model, this is uh, also uh, or borrow the East Asian model. This has been already yeah, discussed for quite a long time. But uh, how much, uh, to which extent, Africa can really like uh, uh, get the uh, result? It's actually not really knowledge. Exactly, it will show in the effects. Only when the Africa really develops, then we can say, okay, they learn the knowledge, right? It's actually paradoxical, and uh, you do not uh, say, I, I just got knowledge, but actually you uh, still cannot uh, show this uh, sustainable development, then this knowledge may people say it's still like, a, yeah, uh, not a really a knowledge for in this African context. So I think for that uh, case, uh, for, uh, yeah, we then still need to see the, uh, this, how this African agency and this initiative really become a sustainable trend. I'm confident, but however, we still need to need the time to see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kimiko. <coughs> Hey, uh, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, regarding the impact of the, uh, the movement, uh, I would say the, the most uh, directly visible impact was that the, some success of the, the boycott campaign, including like, you know, the, after the popular campaign about uh, boycotting South African products, some uh, super, uh, major supermarket chains, department store chains, uh, stopped uh, dealing with the South African products like food and, and so on, and juice and so on. And also uh, there was a, a campaign uh, about the illegal importing of uranium uh, originated from Namibia. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was actually, uh, it was not uh, public. Uh, and uh, so, so the Japanese uh, major uh, electricity company, they uh, actually imported uh, uranium from Namibia, but um, the origin, the the place of origin, mm -hmm. was not made public. But uh, the the activists uh, cooperated with, I think, uh, activists in the UK. Uh, they cooperated each other and uncovered that it was actually from Namibia, and uh, it. Uh, it, it was, and, and after those uh, exposure, um, the, yeah, the, the uh, import from the, uh, importing the uranium from Namibia was stopped. So, so that's the, the most visible uh, direct uh, impact. And in terms of changing government policy, I would say uh, you may, maybe no direct impact. Uh, however, uh, when I looked at um, the, um, diplomatic archive documents in, in Japan, I found that uh, actually uh, during this, this period, the, the MOFA uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs officials were very much sensitive about the criticism uh, by the, uh, presented by Japanese anti-apartheid movement activists who often were invited to United Nations conference about uh, uh, apartheid, and and so at the United States, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean the United Nations, or at other you know like NGO conferences, uh, in many occasions, uh, Japanese anti-apartheid activists attended and criticized and what criticized uh, about the Japanese government and business, uh, and what so they did research and presented what what they were doing. And that, that kind of criticism uh, actually scared, was a threat to the Japanese government. So indirectly, maybe it, um, you know, uh, maybe, it, I, I cannot say it for sure, but indirectly it had uh, some influence on the, the uh, government uh, 
policy uh, about uh, South Africa. And, um, and about the unmediated, um, medi um, yeah, it's, so, yes, um, this Japanese, li like I s just said, that Japanese uh, anti-apartheid movement uh, had uh, continuous uh, relations, uh, exchange uh, relations with uh, Western anti-apartheid mm -hmm. movements, especially uh, the UK, uh, anti-apartheid movement, uh, it's, it's like an international hub of the, uh, the global hub of the anti-apartheid movement. And so it got a lot of information from the UK and also learned a lot uh, in terms of like tactics and uh, the way to uh, the, the modality of the activism. Uh, however, the, those Japanese activists also felt uh, a bit unhappy or bitter mm -hmm. about how to, maybe I was um, somewhat like pater, maybe paternalistic. They, the Western, 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 like UK uh, anti apartheid movement, sometimes like uh, not pressure, but um, encourage Japanese uh, activists to their activism in a certain way, which was not, which was not simply affordable in 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 the, in the Japanese context, mm -hmm. and so, and also um, they were. I mean, the Japanese activists were unhappy, uh, felt unhappy when they attended those international conferences and see so many Western activists, but they saw few attendance from uh, like Asian, uh, like Korea or Philippines or, you know, a Asian countries. Uh, so uh, they, so that, that's, what of, that's one of the reasons why they wanted to hold this anti-apartheid, uh, as I was saying, a workshop uh, to, to build the basis of uh, the anti-apartheid movement in Asia, not only in Japan, because they are so invisible in the global anti-apartheid activism. So that's, so, so it's, so it's, it's just, it's not uh, like, uh, uh, not related to the West, but it, it is, it was very much in connection with the Western anti-apartheid movement, but they wanted to expand mm -hmm. and they wanted to do some alternative way of mm -hmm. doing. So that's why I wanted to highlight. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. And I think I open now the floor to questions from uh, uh, the public. No. Any question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, thanks. You know, really interesting. Um, I was thinking about, you know, the concept of agency, because uh, in many different, um, at least in some, um, uh, you know, themes of historical interest, like say, the histories of slavery, let's say, right, we're moving away from agency as a useful concept because um, it kind of, it removes the kind of structural limits to what is possible in any, you know, for any kind of actor so there's been a move more to turn, you know, in terms of talking about, say, subjectivities, perhaps, uh, but not so much agency. So I'm kind of interested to hear from all of you. I mean, I know, you know, we can define it in different ways, etc. But what the, um, what the conceptual, um, you know, what kind of intellectual work do you think agency does for you in your own work? Because, uh, a again, at least in certain, you know, areas, we're moving away from that as a useful term, and kind of it's being discarded really when talking about trying to, you know, recover. Uh, past lives or anything like that, agency is increasingly not being used as a conceptual framework. Big question. Yeah. I'll leave the floor to you, so whoever wants to answer um, and start, uh, maybe or, or the three of you have uh, some... Uh, I think it also ties back to the earlier panel, right, about creating and finding new words and mm -hmm. finding different language systems or even using different language. Um, 
I think how it works for me is in this particular um, very niche subject that I'm studying, there are deep, um, very deep power asymmetries. And I think as long as those asymmetries are being studied, um, the word agency has value. But of course, like you mentioned, it of course depends on context and who you're using it and all of that. Um, but I think that in this particular niche subject, it isn't without value because um, the relationships are very deeply asymmetrical. So yeah, so I wouldn't say that it has no value, but I definitely think that a reconsideration, not just about the word agency, but a lot of words that are being used in this milieu definitely needs reconsideration, but I don't think it's beyond its time. Uh, I, I would say, uh, actually, Maria should answer that question in the panel because uh, she hard, raised yeah. uh, this <laughs> proposes this uh, concept, and I, <coughs> for me, then I just uh, use this uh, concept uh, as long as the academic circle is discussing about that. And uh, I saw, yeah, some uh, articles uh, talking about it then. And uh, it's actually developed also from the international relations theory. There's some <laughs> history in it, but uh, I myself in the real, um, uh, yeah, uh, in the real practice and the current these uh, problems. Uh, I think sometimes, like uh, Veda said, you can <coughs> use it as a perspective, although it's not. Uh, really uh, cannot uh, really like uh, answer all the things. Yeah, it's just a way of uh, spirit, uh, the intellectual uh, reflection, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, what I presented today, maybe I could argue the same uh, story without mentioning the concept <laughs> of agency. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's not, it was not necessary, maybe, but I think this, this concept uh, was at least uh, very useful to highlight, I mean, in terms uh, uh, in, for, for this whole panel, uh, the, to, to focus on agency. By focusing on agency, uh, it was, I think it's useful for us to, to, to be very conscious about the complexity. I mean, uh, like it's, it, if, if I talk about Japan, it's not, Japan, the very general big Japan, but I consciously uh, differentiate between the, the state uh, the, and the business and those civil society initiatives. And other panelists talk uh, or was also about, very much about, you know, it, how the people's uh, agency were different from what the state or government, you know, uh, tried to to achieve. So I think in, in that sense, the concept is still useful, but, but maybe another wording can be possible. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I think as uh, Veda was saying, this goes back to the question of like uh, terms, terminology, what concepts to use, what words we can use. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think ultimately it's about uh, how we reconceptualize, like putting all the dots uh, in, in the right places and we can still use agency or other things that are very contested and so forth but like and they are still useful right uh, sometimes to think about certain uh, problems even if we're tired of hearing them or like there's more this uh, paternalistic element sometimes um any other question from uh, yeah oh yeah sorry yeah Thank you so much for the panel. Um, so we we can see that agency is a very fluid concept. It changes from basically each one of the um, examples uh, that you were telling us. My question is if you can reflect on the intersection of agency and positionality of a researcher. Uh, if you can tell us how uh, the, your positionality as a researcher, perhaps uh, if you have um, it, stories or examples to tell about whether that made studying and looking at agency easier or harder in different contexts or what, how, in what ways um, your positionality as a researcher interferes with the way that you look at these questions of agency. Mm -hmm.
Um, in this particular example, um, I think it's, I, I'll talk about the specifics because I think it's interesting. Um, how it interfered with it was because, so this uh, Solar Mammoth program, right? Yeah. It's interesting because it's international affairs playing out in the grassroots in rural India. I went there with a certain questionnaire, I went there with a certain frame of mind, with a certain, and I go there, and this word agency maybe, in, they were speaking in Hindi, so it doesn't really translate to agency, but the effect of it. Um, a lot of the conversations was about the lack of that word, whatever it means, right? For a lot of the women who were there, this program or their ability to go to Kenya or their experience of going to Zanzibar was so empowering. And it was so much about how building, it was not about solar lamps anymore, right? My questionnaire went right out the window. It became this story about, you know, um, this woman who is um, a Dalit, who is from a lower caste, was telling me, you know, I used to sweep um, the streets in my village and, you know, people would not even give me food and everything. And then this uh, group lands up in our village and tells us about this training program and I come here and I'm the first woman to not only step out of my village, but I'm the first woman to be earning money. And then it becomes tales and stories and stories of how this one little program has completely transformed villages. It's upended generations of oppression, right? It's upended generations of how particular things were conducted in these rural villages. So these women talking to me about how their lives have turned or changed after um, having agency or having uh, achieved whatever that word is, right? Freedom and things like that. So I think um, I, I thought about talking about that case study at this panel today because that was a recurring theme during the time that I spent in, in Rajasthan. And it wasn't just about individual agency, it was about the community, it was about um, how a tiny um, you know, program uh, had effects that it probably didn't even consider it would have at the beginning. So, so how, how does it, um, it didn't interfere really, but it just made me like open out my, I think uh, Professor Widener at Princeton has this wonderful um, chapter about qualitative research, right, and how you do interviews. And she says, when you're a qualitative researcher and you do these interviews, um, you can't say that, oh my God, this, this interview went in spaces I had no clue about, right? You kind of need to be able to um, know the wide spectrum in which they're going to go. But in this case, I had to disagree because it just went into realms that I didn't imagine at all. So it didn't really interfere, but it was just informing me about, again, multifaceted nature of agency. I, I would uh, say that my positionality uh, makes me uh, not uh, thoroughly uh, having knowledge of the agency's intentionality and uh, say, uh, uh, social context that's, yeah, which are important to understand uh, the agency, but however, I will try my best to see as broad as I can and uh, to uh, just uh, like uh, think about their intentionality. Yeah, so it's uh, certainly it's uh, I, I am also just as a researcher, uh, I have uh, also my own intentions and purposes, which is uh, uh, limits uh, my views of the real, like this uh, purpose of the agents. So therefore, yeah, I would uh, say this uh, agency view, it's just a perspective, maybe help people to uh, remind people of like different levels, for example, uh, in this uh, whole uh, picture of Africa and uh, Asia, there are so many different uh, views and uh, different uh, roles. I think this uh, agency concept may help us, uh, may remind us of this uh, diversity and this uh, uh, openness or alternatives. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not uh, answering directly to your question, but in, in my case, um, Actually, those for, uh, former activists, uh, many of them are actually academics, uh, former academics and uh, current academics. Actually, the, those who were uh, student activists in 1980s are now, some of them are leading Africanist scholars in Japan, actually. And, but, uh, so, so they, 
they did uh, anti-apartheid activism and they did research, they did writing about the problems about Japanese government and business, but they really wrote about their own activism as, an, as a researcher. And I, I was not part of that, uh, but I'm indebted to those uh, academics uh, when I study about uh, the African issue. And, and uh, actually the reason why I started this research is that I, at one time I've noticed that those people, this one, this one, this one, those senior people are all you know, had the history of the anti-apartheid activism, but it is not well known, or it is not written, and it will be forgotten you know, after, uh, after a decade. And I thought, I felt like, you know, I'm indebted intellectually to them, and I had to write about you know, what they did. So that's how I started. So I cannot say much about you know, the positionality as a researcher, because they, they, they themselves were actually researchers. But my positionality of a like, you know, latecomer researcher uh, compared to those former activists, uh, maybe the, this positionality enabled me to, to write about this. Because without those personal um, connections that I had, <coughs> even before I started this research, it, it, without that connection, I, I, may, maybe I couldn't do this research. So it's, it's very much you know, um, a kind of, uh, it's a, about the timing. I, I, I was there in a very good timing. Uh, you know, they, wanted somebody, they wanted to leave um, their, um, they wanted to, they were concerned about, you know, what they are, they are done is completely forgotten, but they, but they were not very much uh, eager to write the history themselves. So then I came in, I wanted, I want to listen to you, what, what you did. And so, so that's how my, my research went. So. I, I don't know, it's, it's about positionality, but um, yeah, that's my, yeah, how I related to those people. Uh, thank you, uh, this is a great panel also, and um, yeah, I really enjoyed all your presentations. I was wondering in sort of, uh, maybe it's not a new question, but it's just in what, what Pedro was bringing up in terms of the use of the word agency. I'm just wondering because what I don't like about subjectivity, it, or rather subjectivity has something else because that's like the the, the perspective or the, the person in that, but there's something in agency which is also an action, I mean, even if Veda, I, I like the way that you sort of connected it to, well, when does it then translate into action? So I was just, I, I yeah, I'm at a, a bit of a lot at a loss for what, what word, I mean, the best that comes to mind is from social media influencer, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, it's somebody who, who does affect some kind of change. But anyway, my, my question to, I guess, most of you at least, but is also, you're you're very much using micro histories, which is something that I also like to do, or rather within history, it's called micro histories. So so looking at these individual cases, or looking at these individual uh, people, or this movement, and to me that is a way to get around models. Uh, but that's of course because I'm an historian and you know, cultural, social historian, so I don't, I'm always very suspicious of models. So my question to you is, in your cases or micro-histories, do you see this kind of, that it's countering models, that it's showing other patterns than what we are being, nor or the bigger narratives, or is it more that micro-histories sort of support the meta-narratives in what, in your findings? I think it's one or the other, to be honest. I think sometimes it does support the meta-narratives, there's no doubt about it. But I also think that 
like when you discuss, when you talk about something like India's development cooperation, right, um, or India's, um, the model of India's development cooperation, and it goes back to like the 40s and the 50s and what you read about it and the, the kind of capacity building programs that were designed um, and the kind of development projects that are undertaken, um, this model of grassroots organizations informing India's broader development cooperation is also a narrative that's used. And it's not um, entirely, um, I, I wouldn't entirely dismiss it, right? Because in this, in this ecosystem, in that particular ecosystem, uh, this case does have a place. So, I, so the direct answer to your question would be, um, I wouldn't say it's this or that. I think it's both. It's not mutually exclusive at all. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think uh, now this panel goes to more like a discussion of uh, <laughs> academic research methodology and uh, like conceptology like that. And uh, <coughs> I would say, yeah, this uh, uh, model, uh, it's uh, for me the model often it's uh, actually the stereotype which should be uh, broken, yeah, so therefore, I think this uh, micro and uh, this uh, diversity of uh, yeah, the reminding of this diversity and openness and uh, help us uh, to break up some models. It's often when we come to agency, it's uh, when we have a very uh, yeah, uh, stereotypical like view on us. China the just uh, like, uh, 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 giving all uh, yeah the Chinese government uh, how make a strategy to uh, call her to uh, get the whole Africa etc. But when we look at uh, how these uh, ideas really like are implemented on the ground, we see this uh, very different uh, types. So I think it's uh, just uh, this. Uh, uh, agency as a uh, yeah this uh, break up of this uh, stereotype yeah um, I'm not sure if I can uh, answer well but um, for me uh, my, my my case uh, it's it's not going to uh, be the alternative uh, model but it's 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 actually uh, to for, for me, it's more about uh, let me say. Um, I think that my 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 case st um, study uh, it's reflected uh, reflected the, the bigger um, like um, uh, the structures um, in Japan's. Uh, were situated in, in, in that particular time. Uh, and so what, what I wanted to show is that there were people who wanted to resist uh, those uh, mainstream, uh, what were the Japanese government business had with South African. But, but it, it's not like, uh, uh, it's not denying that there was there. So it, it was more like a, uh, just to highlight uh, the the people, the what the people try to to change, and and actually by highlighted that maybe it might contribute uh, more about what was the uh, that that had to be uh, fought against. So in, in that sense, that I I think. Uh, yeah, um, so my, my case study is not, not about the, the, the to, 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 to go to the alternative, yeah, thank you. Okay, same sir. Yeah, thank you folks for that uh, wonderful conversation, very rich. Um, I had a question with uh, for you. Um, I wanted, first of all, I wanted to, um, you know, thank you for bringing to our attention this case study, which is a wonderful case study of, you know, South-South transfers as opposed to, you know, Europe coming, you know, transfer of technology. But I did want to pick, pick up on your um, 
discussion or uh, you know reference to the conference that you went to in Europe uh, with the development economics. When I was growing up in, in East Africa in Dar es Salaam in the 80s, early 80s, we were surrounded by foreign experts on working on various projects that were primarily at that point being funded by many of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and then the structural adjustment programs came and then all of these experts kind of disappeared. Um, so I haven't kept up with with the rhetoric on, on aid and development economics uh, you're from, since from that era. And I'm just, can you give us a little bit more of the flavor of, of that conference and those discussions? Um, I'm curious to know whether the needle has moved at all since then. Gaurav, that's a very controversial question. <laughs> this is being recorded and I have no comments. <laughs> Let's talk on the sidelines, no. Um, what I will say is I think I was struck by this because I think I've had the privilege of um, inhabiting the African studies space in India uh, and because of the, the Harvard Yenching Fellowship in China and as well um, at Harvard. And so I kind of thought that I had a pretty good grasp of conversations and narratives predominant in these academic spaces. So uh, Europe was a new um, frontier for me. Um, and I think I was struck by a lot of the colonial baggage, right? Like I come from India, we're pretty um, vocal about our feelings about the British um, and so on. But I think I was struck by um, a lot of things, but I think I was uh, mostly about the, the, the tonality largely being pretty, what is the word Maria you used? Paternalistic? Paternalistic. Yeah. You know, so I think that sort of struck, and um, there were only five of us from the developing world at that conference, um, four gentlemen from different parts of the continent and me. And so every time, you know, those tones were sort of adopted, we'd all sort of look at each other and be like, did, did someone just say that? Like, can, can we still say that? So I think um, um, on a serious note, the, it, was, it was different. Um, largely because of the fact that the focus was largely on, we have all this money, we're spending so much of aid, how come nothing's changing, how can we restructure aid, was the beginning and the end of it. Um, there was no reimagination or any of it. So I think it's, that was what struck me. Uh, and also the idea of, um, it was very much not serving and helping the South. Um, yeah. Uh-oh, this question has led to another question. Just briefly, Veda, please. You talk. You divided agency in two types: with rural, with certain women, through exclusion. Then, once the women are trained, they become inclusion. And then, become agency of change. I was wondering if, actually, particularly for India and Africa, that relationship, the, 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 how feminist activists. Um, were a part of that mobilizing inclusion, women's subaltern, women's uh, excluded perspectives, how they encouraged and trained. And then once women got trained and gained re empowered, that's where the exclusion, inclusion, and then they became agents of change once they were quiet, who went around training other rural women. And I was just thinking about the, the SE by Gupta and Ferguson on how that bypasses the vertical state, these, these activists work. I mean, they were f feminists who actually mobilized for subaltern women. Was that the women involved, the feminist advocacy and, and training? You, because of the division, you made exclusion, then training inclusion, then making the women come and go and retrain others on agenda. Sorry. Sorry. No, no. I'm asking if the, if the, the women you're talking about were uh, um, their inclusion perspective came about also through the support of feminist activists by passing the state, so they become agents of change generally through bypassing the vertical state. So this is a bit. Sorry. Excuse. No, no, no. Um. Not so much in this particular case, because I think that when I talk about this one program, what I'm not doing is I'm not, and this is a disservice to um, the, the institution, is that they already do so much work in India, in rural India. 
So um, that's what I said at the beginning. I'm not introducing a lot of context and background to these case studies. Um, in this particular instance, there was already um, a framework that was being followed, which dealt, dealt primarily with rural communities, um, people in rural communities and uplifting those communities. So in this particular instance, I wouldn't say it was a result of the feminist movement in India. It was a result of this particular organization and the way they functioned. Um, uh, and this, this tiny program within this broad organization focused only on women. So, um, so I think I can maybe sh we can talk a little bit more about how this organization and this program came about, but it wouldn't entirely be accurate to say it was a result of that. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you for for these wonderful uh, presentations and and case studies. Um, I found it interesting that in whether you 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 frame it in terms of agency, subjectivity, empowerment, uh, whatsoever, um, there was all a sense of either success or failure in your discussions. And it's not just that these are sort of external measures you're, you're, you're imposing uh, in reading these narratives or, the, or, the, or, or these studies. It seems that it's coming from the people themselves. Uh, so whether it is the, the rural women exchanging with each other, there's a sense that they themselves feel like there's a success, there's a change, or whether we're talking about uh, trainers and, and workers, there's a sense that there's something failing, something that's not, or I mean, you, you, you seem to, f to, to, to state the, the measure of success as um, the f like African economic development, like transition, econ uh, African uh, economic transition. Is that felt by the people themselves, or is this, once again, an, an external measure, and I think there's a similar um, question to be asked about the uh, anti-apartheid activists. What were, to what degree were these self-imposed um, measures of, of success? Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, I have to really think about it, but uh, in terms of successful, oh, I I think I. I follow what those people, uh, former activists, uh, would say uh, about the failure or like the, the impact they could make, or uh, or failure that uh, that that uh, what they wanted to achieve, but they what uh, what they didn't achieve. Um, and actually, I, in my observation, I think. Um, those activists were a bit too humble about their <laughs> achievement, but if they felt that they couldn't do uh, in much, I mean, couldn't do enough, maybe I, I, for for me, I, I think I should write a, a note that that was per, that that was their perception. So. Yeah, but, but but maybe unconsciously, maybe I also judge uh, their failure or success. And I always like mm -hmm. you you, you uh, asked about the impact. Mm -hmm. And I, when I present about the story, in almost every time I mm -hmm. have the question about this impact mm -hmm. and what what they achieve or mm -hmm. what kind of thing, and uh, I have to kind of um, try to answer uh, in a positive positive and ne mixed of positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And in, in structuring the answer, maybe I'm kind of uh, making my own judgment about the movement. But, 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 but basically, uh, my intention is to follow what the, those people uh, say about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see this question not as a external criterion, but rather as a the agency, as I see it, it has, they have a intentionality, have the purpose, and also their own social context, uh, etc. But in regarding this uh, purpose, then I would uh, judge it uh, uh, from the effects. 
So what they really did in vis-a-vis -vis their purpose, do they really reach their purpose or not? And uh, uh, yeah, sometimes it uh, reaches, but uh, even when, like uh, I said, uh, the, some uh, uh, African technicians, they said they have already grasped these uh, uh, skills. But still, uh, from the effects, we can actually see it from a more broader uh, context, like say uh, in the long run how much and uh, like from a broader uh, uh, view than how much. So in this way, I think we can make this uh, aging, because the agency, maybe uh, another word, this subjectivity, it shows rather this uh, subjectivity, while this uh, uh, effects and impacts can uh, put them in this uh, more, uh, yeah, as a complementary perspective of uh, object, so-called objectivity. But of course, these are still very controversial terms. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea of something being a success or a failure was was part of the the research notes, was part of the inputs that I was getting, their own assumptions of what was working, what wasn't. And I think um, my role came in late, much later on, looking at these you know, hundreds of pages of transcripts to say that m maybe that's not a metric we should be using, or maybe, you know, um, but from their individual um, <coughs> interviews, uh, to answer your question, the feeling was very strong of their own metrics of, um, how they, you know, how they evaluated their impact or the success of it or not. Um, but would I really adopt that metric? Not, not so much, I think.
So welcome to our fourth and last uh, panel um, with the title The Vernacular of Everyday Infrastructures. And uh, we're uh, honored to have as moderator Annette uh, Lienau and uh, uh, as panelist uh, uh, Daniel Ag uh, Agdiboa from Harvard University. I think I must mispronounce your name. No? Good? Okay. Um, Garav Desai from University of Michigan and Pedro Machado from Indiana University Bloomington. So uh, let's welcome them with a round of applause. And the floor. Okay, I'm going to begin. My, um, welcome everyone. I'm Annette Linau. Thanks to Adele, to Duncan Tenzin, and uh, everyone else at the Asia Center and the Center for African Studies for their hard work in organizing this. Um, the set of exchanges, and thank you to our panelists, of course, for joining us, um, and to the Asia Center for this invitation to moderate. I'd like to begin by sharing the common set of questions that our panelists have been asked to address today. How do everyday infrastructures, defined and understood through local vernaculars, influence social, economic, and cultural dynamics, both within and, and across Asia and Africa? And and they've also been asked to share their impressions of how everyday infrastructures from public transportation and local markets to digital networks and informal housing influence uh, re transcontinental relationships um, through the lens of their unique disciplines and research interests. So just to remind you of the format, we'll begin with a brief set of opening remarks from each of our panelists of no longer than about 10 minutes each before moving into a broader uh, set of questions and answers. I'll begin with a couple of prompts before opening up the floor. Um, so we'll begin with Daniel Agdiboa. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's been it's it's a pleasure to be to be here and share a few thoughts on the vernaculars. I must say, when I saw the title, I thought I recalled my upbringing, and for Nigerians, vernacular evokes pidgin English. And it was something you never spoke at home. So I don't think my mom would be too impressed that I'm on a panel on the vernacular so <laughs> of infrastructure because you were supposed to speak Queen's English and vernacular was not part of it. But vernacular was spoken at the motor parks and bus terminals, so I'm sort of rebellious. So that's what I'll be talking about. I did come with some opening remarks, which will run for about 10 minutes, and I look forward to conversations after. So I grew up in a world dominated by popular taxis locally known as downfall, uh, which in Yoruba language means hurry up. Uh, indeed, my parents owned a downfall which they used for their side hustle. These taxis are the vernacular form of post-colonial automobility in urban Africa today. And I would imagine the same is true for Asia. My colleagues from India may recognize them as simply rickshaws or the, the Kali Pilis, the black and yellow cabs that don the streets of Mumbai. In Africa, these popular transport go by various names. Trotro in Accra, Daladala in Dar es Salaam, Kumbis in Johannesburg, Matatu in Nairobi, Car Rapid in Dakar, and Espiritu de Morto, Spirit of the Dead in Kinshasa, so named because of their tendency or propensity for deadly accidents. In Lagos, where I grew up, and which is also Nigeria's commercial capital and Africa's largest metropolis, it is impossible to imagine city life without the always and everywhere yellow downfalls. Even if people want to talk about Africa, often on the cover page you'll see the yellow downfalls. Um, they are the subject of news, gossip, rumors, and urban myths. They open a window into the pleasures, the dangers, the limits of neoliberal urbanism and global modernity in Nigeria and more broadly West Africa. It is true that popular forms of transport in Africa, sometimes derogatorily called informal transport or paratransit, are linked to corruption, chaos, criminality, and violence, uh, which has bred a hygienic form of governmentality and infrastructural modernization, one that is both elite-driven and that savagely sorts and expels so-called undesirable elements uh, in the name of creating a world-class city. Lagos, in this sense, is very similar to Vision Mumbai, where local authorities pulled down numerous slums in a matter of weeks, rendering an estimated 300,000 people homeless all in the name of making Mumbai a world-class city. The municipality officer, officer who led the demolitions declared that it was time to turn Mumbai into the next Shanghai. And to do so, I quote him, we want to put the fear of the consequences of migration into these people. We have to restrain them from coming to Mumbai. Yet popular transports are much more than the spectacular languages of modernization and stateness, of disorder, of renewal, of mega projects and transformation. 
popular transports are run by people. And that's the first thing to say. Uh, of course, the next thing to say is that they are also so-called dirty workers, uh, who are the infrastructure that stitch African cities together and keep them on the go. The vehicles themselves embody values that transcend mere utilitarian function. And if there's any regret I have about transportation, it's because it's always trapped in this utilitarian functional analysis. They provide employment for many youths who are waiting to acquire social adulthood. In Nairobi, the Matatus embodied the era of cosmopolitanism, multi-party politics, neoliberalism, global hip-hop. In the city of Durban in South Africa, the Kumbi taxis became a powerful symbol of post apartheid freedom and an important arena for black economic empowerment. Growing up in Lagos, my own experience of these vernacular transport came through Nollywood movies, Afrobeat, stand-up comedians, and the social navigation of transit spaces like motor parks and bus terminals and checkpoints and roundabouts. I experienced the downfalls as powerful visual tropes and vibrant meeting points for daily conversations about bribery and corruption, endless traffic jams, uh, party politics, heated soccer punditry, which I particularly enjoy, <laughs> and police brutality. In short, they offer the window into the political, economic, and affective dimensions of city life in Africa, reclaiming the African city uh, as not just a site of modernization, but also as a site of fantasy, of desire, of imagination, as the Cameroonian thinker Shilin Bimbi notes. At the same time, in them, I often experience what Bruce Robbins calls the smell of infrastructure, a smell that derives from government ne neglect, from a lack of maintenance culture, but which also extended to the several anonymous thoughts that kept me attentive in the downfall. Amidst the popular chaos of city life and smell of transport, there was a logic of practice, a vernacular form of order that organized and animated this popular transport sector. This order is most visible, I think, in the vernacular slogans that adorn the bodies of these transits. In Lagos, for example, the form of downfalls often conform to the slogans painted on them. Old rickety downfalls, often with squealing brakes and ball tires, tend to be driven by older men. And they bear slogans like, it still moves. <laughs> Slow but steady. No shaking, which is no cause for alarm. Tested and trusted. Experience is the best teacher. And all that glitters is not gold. Conversely, newer looking downfalls are often driven by younger men and generally bear slogans like Lagos to Las Vegas, Starboy, Fresh Boy, Obama, Land Cruiser. In Lagos, statistics show that 99% of downfall drivers suffer from hypertension. And survey evidence suggests that more than 22% of downfall drivers are partially blind, a health challenge that directly relates to the demanding and dangerous nature of their work. Somewhat ironically, many downfall slogans announce to passengers their potential fate. Slogans such as, carrying me home, pray and hope, see you in heaven, home sweet home, free at last, Remember now thy creator. <laughs> Remember your six feet. Now, downfall slogans shape the moods and choices of commuters on a daily basis. As one commuter woman told me, and I quote her, when I see a downfall slogan like relax, God is in control, or fear of God, I feel good about entering it because I feel the driver trusts in God's powers and not in his abilities. <laughs> Here we see how slogans hold insight into how popular transport workers develop and communicate a unique competitive edge through their textual choices and artistic preferences. Popular transport in Africa lends a new grammar to contemporary urbanism in Africa and Asia, one that sees and reads the city as lively archives of expression and aesthetic vision, one that defamiliarizes common sense imaginaries that too often treat non-Western cities as problems to be resolved, as sites of the ungoverned or even ungovernable, or as not quite cities because they haven't met the expectations of modernity. That Du Boisian concept of always of double consciousness, of always looking at uh, African cities through the eyes of the other. Uh, finally, um, popular, in a conference like this one that puts two continents in conversation, we can look to uh, the popular transport like the downfalls for theoretical inspiration of how to innovate and adapt and advance this relationship. I say this because the downfalls themselves are typically fashioned out of chassis and engines derived from pre-owned Mercedes-Benz, uh, Bedford and Volkswagen buses imported from Europe around which the local steel frame is then constructed. So constructing the outer body of a downfall is very much a process of hybridization that, af uh, that reflects the astute capacity of ordinary Africans to absorb, revise, and even discipline ideas from the outside. 
We must not forget that the black arts or aesthetic movement in the US in the 60s and 70s uh, were greatly influenced by the radical group of critics from Africa who sought to decolonize African literature. What you may not have known is that these critics drew inspiration from the vernaculars of the wooden lorries that preceded the Danfo, known as Bole Kaja, which quite literally means come down and let us fight. Uh, we are Bole Kaja critics, they said, these African academics said, outraged touts for the passenger lorries of African literature. My hope is that conferences like this will afford more than a convivial space for friendly chat and conversation. Um, that Africa and Asia can truly interrogate each other in the vernacular spirit of Bole Kaja, that we can come down and wrestle and have a proper dust up. Thank you, Daniel, for that incredible opening um, set of remarks. Now we'll move to Gora's uh, yeah. presentation. Thank you. That's, a, that's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> that was great. Wonderful. Um, We'll have lots of conversations about the bajajis um, on the streets. Um, so I'm a literary critic, and when I was asked to do this, I had no idea as to why I was being asked to speak on something that I don't really normally work on, uh, things like infrastructure. you know. Um, but the more I thought of it, the more I realized that what I do work on um, is uh, the ways in which uh, people have represented themselves uh, historically in terms of negotiating infrastructure or the lack of infrastructure. Um, so the infrastructure that I'm going to be talking about really is uh, our communities uh, and the affiliations and affiliations between people and how they, uh, how they manage, um, you know, ha have managed and, and how some of those things are still with us and some of those things have broken down, are no longer with us. Um, so as a critic, I thought what I'd do is, is let you take, take you into a world um, which uh, the novelist uh, M.G. Vasanji uh, cre you know, created for us in 1989 when he published his novel, The Gunny Sack, which was like the first major, although there, there had been fiction written about East African Asians before, uh, this was the first major epic novel that dealt with that community. So I'm just going to read you a, a passage from that, and then we can d dwell in deeper. <clears throat> a year after his arrival in Zanzibar, Dhanji Govindji landed at Bagamoyo. While the, Europe while the Europeans, the hunters and porters, the seasoned Swahili traders went inwards to seek greater fame or fortune, my forebear joined a small caravan going southwards on the slave route. 36 miles on foot and donkey later, he unloaded his stuff at the village of, of Matamu. The caravan marched on towards Kilwa, and Dhanji Govindji walked into the nearest store and asked, <coughs> Where is the Mukhi's store? There was a Mukhi wherever there were a few Shamsis. And the Mukhi would, would put you up. He would introduce you to the others of the community. And he would show you the ropes. There is still a Mukhi wherever there are a few Shamsis. There's a Mukhi in London, in Singapore, in Toronto. There is still a Mukhi in Matamu, but there is no longer a Mukhi in Junapur. History has seen to that. You could land in Singapore and call up the local Mukhi. Mukhi Sahib, you'd say. I'm new here, and I need, your, and I need a little help. Where are you staying? The Muki would ask. He doesn't let you finish. No, 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 that, won't, that simply won't do. Are right, listen to me. You come here first, and then we'll see. Which is exactly what Danji Govindji did. Muki, Rag, Muki, Ragavji, Rag, sorry, Muki Ragavji Devraj, formerly of Jamnanagar, welcomed him to Matamu. And after a suitable interval, a small handwritten sign went up outside the empty store. Dhanji Govindji of Junapur and Matamu's only street boasted another Indian dukan. The Mukhi found him some, the Mukhi found him some broken down furniture and gave him merchandise on credit to start up with. And for good measure, he threw in a servant at a cheap price. So the reason I read this passage to you is, is because it shows, it, it, it kind of shows the networks of community um, you know, for new migrants coming into East Africa and as they go to, into the interior. Um, and I was thinking, you know, uh, of, of how, how such 
you know, uh, uh, affiliations continue to be made. Uh, I, in my book that I published on this, I look at uh, life narratives of, of uh, traders who went into the interior. Uh, and the ways, in, there were no hotels back then, um, you know, so, so you had to rely on community. And, and what community you, you uh, became part of or, or connected to uh, was kind of uh, concentric. You know, you'd, you'd go into a place and see if there was somebody who was of the same faith as you. You know, it might be, uh, you might be looking for an uh, Ismaili person if you're Ismaili or, you know, Aga Khani. Or it, it might be a Hindu uh, uh, merchant who had been gone, uh, who had been there. Perhaps there was nobody who uh, was part of your community. Then you kind of extended that, that sense of identity wider. It could be any South Asian, um, you know, who was there, et cetera, et cetera. And you see these things mapped out in these narratives um, in the, you know, when people were go, you know, traveling into the interior for trade purposes. Those kinds of community linkages um, continue to, to take place, uh, although you know, in very different kinds of forms and shapes. When, I was, when my family moved to, to East Africa, for instance, one of the first things that happened was we joined what was called the Marathi Mandal. And the Marathi Mandal, and those things still continue to exist right now, right? So Marathi Mandal is a group of Maharashtrians, Mar Marathi being the language that, of, of our community, um, who were, would, it, it, back then in the 80s, uh, they were cross-religious. There were Muslim Maharashtrians, there were Hindu Maharashtrians, but they, what had, they had in common was the language, and th they would help you settle into, the, into, the, into your new surroundings. Um, there, were other, there were other networks. Um, I was just looking this up because I didn't, didn't know whether it still functioned the, the, you know, the way it used to. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, the, the road between Nairobi and Mombasa? Has anyone traveled by car on that road? Um, you, then you will know that there is a Gurudwara uh, right there in, the, in just about the halfway point between Nairobi and Mombasa. And every Indian traveler, regardless of religion, uh, faith, uh, would, that would be the place they went to have langar. Uh, and langar is the, um, you know, kind of a, a you know, food that is offered. And uh, I, was looking, I was looking up this Gurudwara on the internet to see whether they still function. It, the Gurudwara was built in 1926. Um, the com when you know, uh, right because there was a there was a railroad uh, junction there, uh, and then the community moved away. But then they came back and they built this you know built a bigger gurudwara, and it has served for several years now as the as the kind of stopping point halfway between Nairobi and Mombasa. It used to be primarily Indians, but over the years, of course, now all communities come, you know, um, uh, African uh, communities, Asian communities, um, you know, European travelers. It's the place to go and have a meal, right? Regardless of your uh, kind of religious um, beliefs, uh, they have certain uh, requirements, like you have to have your head covered and things like that. But this, these are the kinds of institutional networks that, that you know, Pre, you know, predate the world of hotels and, and restaurants and cafes, but they continue um, to, to have a real pr uh, presence. And then there are others that um, have gone away. Um, one of the big community things uh, that at least the South Asian community did uh, when I was, uh, you know, a teenager uh, was uh, every Saturday um, uh, a, a night out at the drive-in. Uh, because they'd always have Bollywood movies uh, at the drive-in, and every Saturday the community would get together, um, and uh, and and we, and a lot of African teenagers uh, would show up as well. So it was not just an exclusively South Asian, um, uh, um, uh, you know, experience. But the drive-ins, at least in the one in Dar es Salaam, has has gone away, so that that no longer uh, takes place. I want to mention one other um, institution that you know predates uh, the formal banking sector. Um, uh, and that is the ha Hawala system. Does anyone know, uh, know any, you, Pedro, know about the Hawala system? Um, but this has become, um, this has become something that's uh, on the uh, US government and, and various governments alert systems now since 9-11 uh, and since the Patriot Act. The Hawala system, for those of you who don't know, is essentially a money, money exchange system where um, a person who needs to send money, let's say, back home from Kenya or from wherever, um, would actually go and make a payment to somebody, the Hawala person, the person who you know, does these exchange in, let's say, Mombasa. The money actually never physically moves from Mombasa to Mumbai or wherever it's going. Uh, but the agent in Mombasa has a fellow agent in Mumbai who 
the, gives the money, pays the, makes the payment to the relative or to whoever it is in Mumbai uh, who wants, um, who is to be paid. The f money physically never uh, transfers. They just settle accounts between themselves, the hawalas. And this, this system is used by migrants all over the world. It's not just in, in, uh, in East Africa or, 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 or India. Um, this has become, gotten on the radar of the US government in particular after 9-11 because a lot of, some of that money, not the vast majority, but some of that money uh, has gone into illicit, um, you know, drug uh, trade uh, stuff uh, and also terrorism. Uh, terrorist networks have found the Hawala system to be extremely useful to, to move money around. And so it's become, uh, it's now become, um, you know, there are estimates that up to $300 billion, uh, $300 billion may be passing through the system. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, you know, as I say, uh, it's fast, it's cheap, it's informal, uh, and it doesn't deal with banks oftentimes. Sometimes it does, but it's, it's, um, it's oftentimes less bureaucracy. Um, the U.S. Treasury actually has a definition of, of hawala uh, in their uh, financial guidelines for, you know, for, for international purposes. They call it an inf informal value transfer system, which, and their goals are to bring hawalas into the formal financial system and to hold illicit actors to account. Uh, they want member states uh, of these various uh, uh, countries to, quote, license and register hawalas while putting effective civic, criminal, and administrative sanctions in place for hawalas that don't do so. And there have actually been arrests in the US of people who have served as hawala uh, dealers uh, who haven't been registered and you know, who don't, um, uh, you know, who ha whose money has been seen to trans transfer into the hands of, of criminals. Um, I say that just because I think you know it's it's really interesting to see how systems that were developed in the in the past, where fr frankly there were no banks around uh, to uh, have you know bank exchange, uh, have prevailed even in times uh, of um, you know large financial institutions being around. So anyway, I'll stop there, and we can talk more about either hawalas or bajajis or whatever. Thank you so much for that. Fascinating um, set of uh, observations, Gaurav. And now we'll be moving to Pedro's. Thank you. Um, you know, thanks to the organizers and thanks to all of you for being here uh, at the last panel. Uh, it's always tough to be, especially the last one on the last panel. Uh, so, you know, um, I hope you uh, hang in there. Um, I like, you know, Gaurav, although I'm not a literary you know, person, I'm an historian. I uh, haven't directly worked on, on infrastructure, but in thinking about the invitation and what infrastructure might sort of mean. I, in some ways, I've touched on aspects of infrastructure. Um, and so I prepared you know, something, and we'll see how it hits. Infrastructural forms and systems are shaped by, and in turn, shape architectures of meaning. that are instantiated through their materiality and are reanimated by associational imaginaries reflective of the social, political, and economic arenas in which they are embedded. But infrastructures are also architectures of circulation and establish and here I'll quote from Brian Larkin from his great signal and noise, quote, the material forms that allow for exchange over space, creating the channels that connect places in wider regional, national, and transnational networks, end quote. Infrastructures and the network systems thus advance a relational praxis between and across space that establishes the contours of itineraries of social interaction and social relationships, and that in turn are bound up with memories of past meanings, forged anew through daily interaction and engagement. And space we now kind of have come to understand and understand implicitly is socially produced, right? And it's a product of interrelations and interactions that are constantly made and remade through these relations that ultimately create enduring but not necessarily stable meanings. There's a tendency, however, to think of everyday infrastructures through an exclusively terrestrial lens, right? What I'm going to choose to call the tyranny of the terrestrial. Um, even while some scholars ask that we relinquish this bias. And what I'd like to do is propose that we think about the question of everyday infrastructures through an aquatic and specifically oceanic frame. What does thinking oceanically, particularly with and through boats and ships, open up or make possible, or perhaps disallow or close off, that a terrestrial bias forecloses or occludes when addressing the question of everyday infrastructures? Vessels of varying sizes and tonnages sail along the coasts of East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and the west coast of India, for instance, while large container ships trace the carbon geographies of oil and transport mass consumer goods, reflecting 
and structuring the logics of exchange and materializing the sinews of global capital. Ships and boats constitute infrastructural technologies that may appear hidden from view, but not, of course, for the sailors, the cooks, and other maritime laborers who spend the majority of their days at, by, or on the sea. Nor do boats, especially dows and other wooden vessels, I'm using this, um, it's a sort of a general term encompassing a wide range of vessels, you know, jahazis and others uh, um, uh, built in places like Kutch in Western India. Um, uh, you know, in order boats, especially dows and other wooden vessels that create a world of trade uh, abutting the container ships that regularly move through the waters of the West Indian Ocean, recede from view for those in port towns or cities in whose line of vision they often appear, both framing the backdrop of daily life and existing as dense infrastructural technologies laid with multiple contingent and contested meanings. As everyday infrastructures of movement, Dow's braid experience, commerce, migration, and transportation, while also being conduits of historical memory invoking older Indian Ocean pasts of cosmopolitanism. Uh, there's a, you know, I want, we can talk about this, uh, it links to, um, uh, you know, things that other folk have said in earlier panels. Uh, there's a, uh, um, uh, you know, a romanticization of the Tao, there's a sort of exoticization as well at times, um, uh, and there's a sort of, you know, nostalgic element to Tao's often, you know, um, becoming part of a kind of tourist, you know, trope of a kind of lost, um, you know, exotic kind of East, you know. Um, Dows sail between ports as vectors of connection and at times disconnection, to be sure, embodied through their capacities as carriers of people and cargo, and in so doing, enable a close relation with the ports at which they dock and the sea along and through which they move. In his well-known formulation, Michel Foucault noted that, quote, a boat is a floating piece of space, a place without a place, that exists by itself, that's closed in on itself, but that at the same time is given over to the infinity of the sea. End quote. But of course, the sea is not an empty space, right? Dows mark space and make place, producing social and economic um, relationality between different sites and people, sailing to places that container ships are uh, either unable to go or unwilling to go because of factors like uh, security or expense or regulatory you know, limits. Uh, and um, uh, one of uh, uh, you know, Gorov's uh, uh, you know, colleagues in anthropology at Michigan, Jatin Dua, uh, characterizes Dao's as functioning as, quote, an economy of arbitrage, end quote. Dao itineraries trace routes and mobilities, structuring exchanges that are constitutive of the global economy, operating to be sure at smaller scales and at times in the interstitial arenas between licit and illicit trade. Of course, these are constitutive of each other, right? They don't exist as kind of that idea of having a parallel like illicit but sort of on the margins economy um, uh, is, I think, wrong-headed. Uh, I think the illicit and the illicit sort of make each other. Um, these itineraries are also responsive to changes in state policy, of course, and shifts in national and international legal frameworks that can and do result in the charting of new routes to different ports of call, reflecting the mutable geographies of Dow economies and the changing relationalities that they make possible. Now, as technologies of everyday infrastructure, DAOs are thus embedded within larger frameworks related to political and economic developments, as I've been suggesting, that are oceanic and at times terrestrial in orientation or in certain instances both. And I'll just sort of mention one instance here um, uh, of the nearly sort of half a billion dollar deal signed by uh, the CCC, the China Communications Construction Company, the largest state-owned infrastructure enterprise, as many of you all know, to construct a 32-berth deep water container port in Lamu in Kenya. Uh, the Kenyan government is kicking in uh, around 700 million uh, for the projected overall cost of five billion dollars financed through loans from Exxon Bank in China. Uh, I think three right now. I think three of the berths have been completed, and this is part of a, a larger Lamu uh, a port in you know, South Sudan, Ethiopia, the Lapset uh, Corridor project, estimated at a cost of 23 billion dollars. That includes the upgrade and expansion of Kenya's rail system to connect coast and inland to the wider Indian Ocean. Now, this is by some measure uh, the largest infrastructural project undertaken since Kenyan independence. And it's part of, which again, some of you will know, uh, the, the Kenya Vision 2030 strategy uh, that is, quote, the national long term development policy that aims to transform Kenya into a newly industrializing middle income country, end quote. This is from one of the websites. Um, the births at Lamu Port necessitate heavy dredging while extending the land into the sea with, of course, serious ecological consequences as expressions of a form of hydropolitics 
that is transforming sea and landscapes. Now, and this is sort of where um, I'll end. Uh, whether such projects will displace DAOs from regional economies, a story that's been told more than once, right? Perhaps first uh, around the uh, kind of emergence of steam modernity in the 19th century that purportedly erased DAOs from uh, the seascape that never happened. Um, uh, it's unclear, but I think it's unlikely as these network technologies of everyday infrastructure will adapt once more and chart new geographies in a world where not every port will be turned into a container terminal. Um, you know, and I also think that the space of the DAO itself, I think sailors on board DAOs uh, um, you know, forge new identities um, that I think sort of collapse the spaces of oceanic mobility uh, and extend the possibilities of self-making and belonging that supersede those of the nation state. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you all for these, uh, these extraordinary presentations. Thank you, Pedro, for, um, for concluding the panel. At this point, I'd like to uh, begin with a couple of questions that I hope will offer some common denominators to diverse uh, presentations or, or um, you know, across these disciplinary divisions, organized in part um, and inspired in part by the key terms of, uh, of the panel, the vernacular and the infrastructural. Um, I appreciate especially uh, Daniel's opening remark that, or suggestion that this exchange be in some ways continued um, in the spirit of Ole Kaja, coming down. Um, and uh, we might uh, extend that to include the Indonesian term turun ke bawah, which means basically the same thing from a different literary context to cite Pramudiananta Tour. So this is, of course, a panel about everyday infrastructures. And I want to begin our conversation in part by turning the tables a little bit and by asking about scholarly infrastructures um, that present challenges to examining dynamics between Asia and Africa across your respective fields. Um, it's perhaps unsurprising that it's two area studies centers, the Asia Center and the Center for African Studies, that are hosting an interdisciplinary exchange like this um, at Harvard, as Asia-Africa connections don't really have a natural disciplinary or interdisciplinary home in university departments as currently configured. Um, and it's a comment that prompts me to make the following observation. On the one hand, despite the salient fact that Asian and African regions are deeply interconnected, as each of you have highlighted in different wa ways, demographically, historically, commercially, um, through the evolution of new transportation and banking uh, technologies, digital networks, and the durability of older ones, um, most scholarly institutions and universities are not quite set up or configured uh, to keep up or keep tracking those interconnections um, that are arguably intensifying between Asian and African nations and diasporic communities in global terms. I think this is true whether we're speaking about most universities in Europe and North America or in Asian and African universities directly on, on both continents. So first I'd like to hear your responses to that comment, that observation, to hear your thoughts on the work that needs to be done still on, so to speak, an infrastructural level uh, to foster interdisciplinary work in the places where we teach and conduct research on a quotidian basis. Um, this may feel like a very broad scale question. Um, so another way of asking and addressing this, of course, would be to ask for your thoughts on some of the methodological challenges of working on these transregional counterpoints um, that you know, extend beyond or methodologically challenge uh, some of our um, inheritances, disciplinary inheritance, which tend, uh, tend to overlook um, these transcontinental connections in certain ways. Um, and what do you think uh, needs and, and can change um, so that we better serve future scholars on these fronts? If you also know of initiatives underway uh, to reverse the tide, so to speak, um, it would be great to hear your thoughts on, on what's being modeled um, and what should be highlighted and upheld. I think that's uh, an excellent uh, intervention. 
And I have to say that um, part of the problem, I think, is um, the way in which disciplines are set up and the incentive structure within those disciplines. I think we have an academic system where there is no incentive to do the kind of work that you're calling on us to do. And so you're caught in this in-between space uh, if you're doing this kind of work to say, do I keep doing this work and not get tenure? Or do I shape or not get funding as well? Or do I adjust it to the dominant system? And I think every African and Asian has to figure that out for themselves. I don't think there's any right or wrong answer to that because they are real um, stubborn infrastructures uh, that die hard, uh, that are part of the system. But I think today, um, at least for myself, to be an African in uh, a Euro-America institution in an Ivy League, I, I don't think you can be one without being an activist, uh, to be honest. Uh, I think um, you have to fight to have more for example, African women to be part of departments. You have to fight to, ha everything is a fight, it's a struggle, it's bolekaja really. Uh, but at the same time, you have to care for yourself because you're expected to be the professor of Kenyan studies, professor of Nigerian studies, professor of everything. Uh, because the infrastructures themselves don't recognize or see you, because these departments themselves are created to sort of push to the side or to the margins, people who are not really recognizable within these disciplinary boundaries. And so there are issues that, um, that um, like the uh, Hawara system, uh, uh, keep reinventing themselves. Um, so I don't know, I think it's one that we have to figure out for ourselves. I mean, <clears throat> I think efforts have been made, uh, especially for instance, I'm thinking of the project at WITS with the, you know, India, Africa Study Institute. I don't know what its status is now today, but I know there was a lot of energy around it. University of Mumbai for many years had a Africa studies program that was very much looking towards East Africa and connections with East Africa. Again, Veda might be able to tell us more about what it's been doing of late, but um, so I think efforts have been made. I mean, this was Senghor's big dream. Um, Senghor's big dream was to, you know, he, he was very interested in uh, the linkages between uh, Tamil, for instance, and African languages, and, and uh, his dream was to have establish a center for the study of South Asia, you know, within um, the continent. Uh, it never materialized back then, but, you know, um, I think moves have, moves have been made uh, in those days. And of course, as you know, variety of, and Pedro would know more about this, but varieties of, um, uh, Indian Ocean networks, um, academic networks. Uh, I mean, they just kind of sprouted over the last decade or so, uh, both in the metropole as well as uh, on various um, in African spaces. But Pedro, maybe. Sure, I mean, you know, I, um, I partly lay the blame at the door of the State Department and the Cold War, uh, because at least in the US, uh, the way the sort of spatial frameworks were established post-war was an area study. So more than disciplines, I think the restrictions are the siloing through area studies training, as important as it is, with this especially which in some ways here the U.S. has great capacity in the language training for parts of different areas of the world, right? So, you know, my institution, Indiana, is a classic post-war area studies landscape. You know, the African Studies program is, you know, 60 years old, right? Um, we've got very old Russian studies, you know, programs. Uh, but that has meant that, and that's then, you know, sort of blossomed, it blossomed in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s, uh, and lots of great, you know, training, but it's meant the siloization. So to be an Africanist, only certain languages count within this house of Africa. Or to be a South Asianist, only these languages count. And to try to sort of bring trans aerially, if you will, places in relation with one another is very difficult for grad students, right, and how they're trained, because you seem to be either inauthentic or mm, you're sort of, you're not quite fully an Africanist. It's, it's still like that. Um, that I see as more of an issue, but then, you know, Gaurav is right. Even within this architecture that exists, this uh, sort of scholarly infrastructure, um, uh, those on the ground are just sort of doing the work and connecting and establishing fora and talking, you know, uh, cross regionally, 
But I think still how we train students, we're still, they're still being kind of forced in because centers like the Center for African Studies, where do they go for their money? It's to Washington and it's for Title VI money. So the federal kind of investment, that kind of geomilitary investment in what area studies brings to the kind of military industrial complex of the US is so powerful, but, but provides so much money that that's still sought after. And so we kind of keep reinscribing, you know, the area uh, sort of model every time there's a funding cycle. So it gets perpetuated and you've got to kind of push against it in creative ways, like this conference and other meetings and people just connecting but institutionally, it's very difficult because we still, I think, I think it's an issue, frankly, if I'm not saying something controversial. <laughs> so the department will be knocking on my door tomorrow morning, I'm sure. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think we need to go beyond that kind of Title VI Washington kind of model of how we, like the mental maps we have of the world and the spatial frameworks, you know, we use. Uh, um, I think on disciplines, I won't go on another 30 seconds, on disciplines, I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's also some, you know, siloing there. The language is different. The concepts are different. Uh, and there also, I think, we need more serious interdisciplinarity uh, of sort of training. Uh, I think we could do both potentially at the same time. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, the, you know, often what it comes down to is that you need to be sort of really grounded and have deep cultural linguistic knowledge of one place. That's true, and you must, and you should, and that's incredibly important. But you can get that for more than one place, especially if you're thinking, you know, sort of in relational terms, but there's still that, like, grounding in one geography. Thank you. In this room several years ago, I remember being um, invited to speak to a group of graduate students uh, with Aung San Ho, uh -huh. um, who uh, was asked about, uh, by this group of graduate students, about the uh, prospects of doing work in multiple places, as, as is the case, as is demanded of those um, aspiring to do work in Indian Ocean Studies. And he mentioned this is an incredible risk. Uh, proceed, proceed at your own risk, in effect. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, in, it's intriguing what you're, what, we're, what you're all saying about this sort of using trenched incentive structures and incentive, funding yeah. streams yeah. that really limit um, the kinds of ongoing um, long-term investment in uh, more innovative work interdisciplinarily. And I appreciate, Pedro, your comment on languages, in part, because this, this leads me to the second question um, or focus, really, I was hoping that we might address, and that is the notion of the vernacular um, and how we, um, how we might understand it in relative terms. Um, Pedro, you, you, you spoke in part about the cosmopolitan, and as someone coming from literary studies, literary history, of course, um, the vernacular is not often just framed as something subversive, certainly in the African literary context, which Daniel alluded to, uh, but one can think of Sheldon Pollock, Ronit Ritchie's work is also um, uh, inviting us to think about the vernacular relationally relative to the cosmopolitan. Um, and I think that Daniel maybe most directly, mm -hmm. uh, your, your introductory remarks drew our attention to this tension yeah. between um, which you, which you uh, I think, suggested is a, a sort of aspirational um, constellation uh, of, or, of, uh, of the, um, or attachment uh, to the cosmopolitan from Lagos to Las Vegas, for example, um, uh, among, um, among uh, communities who are also disciplining, I think as you said, ideas from the outside. So I was wondering if, um, each of you might, might say a little bit more about uh, the extent to which the notion of the vernacular has continues to have purchase for you and for your work and how it might be understood um, in relational terms or, or problematized in relational terms. Um, and, you know, if we might also extend some of Daniel's uh, observations about its subversive associations as well. Um, as, as, a, as a point of entry into the, the underclass, the subaltern against the imperial, the colonial, the neo-colonial. Yeah. Run with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I could do that. You know, I was just thinking about the debates that, that happened between two key figures in African studies, uh, Ugugi Watiungu and 
Chino Achebe uh, on the English language. Uh, and Chino Achebe, Ngugi is more in leaning towards the need to find your own local language and not have to rely on English as a, as a medium, whereas Chino Achebe actually believes that you could, um, you could discipline the English language and make it work for yourself. Uh, and who can fault him? I mean, he wrote Things Fall Apart. Um, but I, th I think this, this debate also s plays out in the field of urban studies uh, that I'm in. Um, the think Ashil Mbembe has called for what he calls new critical pedagogies uh, because he feels like the current grammar does not work. Uh, it allows us to, that the current language we have to describe African cities and more broadly Africa and even Asia, you can show that in tells us what they are not rather than what they are. So we come at it via negative uh, and it doesn't work. And so he says we have to think with things from these spaces in order to come to um, where we want to be. And this is one of the inspirations for looking at slogans, looking at transport, looking at what is happening. But I think once we look <laughs> back into those things at the local context, we quickly realize they are also a combination of ideas, a hybridization. So somewhere I like to think about um, language as this space of um, encounter, this space of um, interactions, this relationality that hits at the very heart of um, um, what the Africans call Ubuntu. You know, the, the sense that um, you, are, you are in relation, therefore your existence, therefore you are. And I think that's what language is. And, and I think if we think about it in that way, then language can be an incredibly powerful resource for bridging um, you know, for, for breaking, pulling down walls and seeing ways in which the very English language itself, we're not, we shouldn't see that as not an African language uh, because after all, Africa has contributed to the shaping of that. So I think that's, that's, that's where I am in terms of thinking about it, the way in which uh, uh, um, informal transport workers, the, the, the people that I work with have always used this um, fusion of words from different places to you know, create a reality that they recognize and adapt it to suit their own purpose. You know, I like to think of the, the words together. I like to think about vernacular cosmopolitanisms, uh, which is to say, uh, which is, you know, sometimes people confuse cosmopolitanism, you know, for uh, metropolitanism, right? Looking westwards, for instance. I don't think of cosmopolitanism that way. I think about the vernacular as in the localized knowledge, deep knowledge that people bring to bear on their lives and, and their interactions with others. Uh, but also, um, you know, connecting that with other parts and other geographies and other cultures uh, within a certain network. So you could have somebody who, um, you know, is is you know of Parsi origin, uh, but is fluent in Swahili. Um, you know can can you know have have uh, other languages, maybe English, maybe not English, right? Uh, so for me, when I'm looking at many of these actors in the Indian Ocean context and especially the Eastern African context, they're very cosmopolitan. They're very cosmopolitan, but not in the way in which we might think of cosmopolitan as in west westward looking, right? Um, so I find that to be very powerful. Yeah, yeah and you know, you raised, uh, or, or you, is it invoked? Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, Eng Seng Ho. Of course, his very famous formulation in Graves of Turim, local cosmopolitans, right? Uh, which has had a lot of, that's had a lot of purchase, you know, conceptually uh, uh, for those doing um, Indian Ocean and other work. And I kind of, I mean, I go between sort of, um, uh, you know, thinking that cosmopolitanism has some uh, you know, analytical kind of usefulness, but often because it is, you know, it's freighted with some of this other meaning, uh, it doesn't quite capture, I think, the relationality that I'm interested in kind of looking at and understanding, which is not in relation to, although that might be part of it, to a kind of West out there. It's really between, uh, you know, spaces and people uh, and processes and you know everyday infrastructures within a kind of especially Western Indian Ocean, you know kind of context where the geographies there are forever, as I said, mutable. They're forever sort of, you know, shape shifting, if you will. They're never you know stable. Again, many of you you know sort of appreciate that. Um, uh, so for me, you know, I I don't tend to use the word cosmopolitan because it also you know suggests even within the space that there was just this you know sort of historically, but also you know now a kind of like 
just, you know, the sort of brotherhood of kind of, you know, this interaction where everyone was just getting on and there was no, there were no tensions, it was all this kind of like smooth, it kind of flattens difference um, and doesn't kind of uh, allow you to think about sort of the politics of difference and how that was negotiated, uh, you know, both historically and now. With, you know, vernacular, uh, I mean, it does sort of emerge as a colonial category uh, in sort of British India. Uh, so it does have that, it's sort of freighted with that, but of course we can re, we can domesticate, you know, concepts and make them uh, 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 into, into, into our own. If vernacular is sort of twinned with kind of, you know, local, whatever that means, and, you know, perhaps uh, in kind of, you know, air quotes, uh, then I'm comfortable, you know, using it if we are, then using it to mean a kind of, um, uh, you know, relationality uh, of movement, but even when you're not moving, you are embedded within larger sort of, you know, frameworks or networks uh, where if you're a weaver in, you know, Gujarat or Kutch in, you know, 1800, uh, uh, you are as much part of an Indian Ocean world that you've never moved to like northern Mozambique or Zanzibar for which you are weaving and you understand about some of that sort of local demand. Uh, you are um, a local cosmopolitan as much as those sailors, those merchants who actually go across the ocean. At this point, I'd like for us to open up the floor to questions. Are any. And if there are none immediately, I might invite you to respond if, if those of our panelists have questions for one another. Um, I'd also like to invite you to, to raise them as well. It's always tough. People are tired. The last yes. panel, oof. Yeah. <laughs> It's also so cold in yeah, here. I'm right. shivering <laughs> in my seat. <laughs> just think we've been so brilliant that people are just like processing. It's going to take time. <laughs> we've been so you know inspirational that it's. Uh, you know. But I had a question um, for you. Um, so when you talk about the Muki, uh, who this, I'm I'm thinking about um, Abdul Malik Simon's concept of people as infrastructure that um, you know stitch communities together. Um, it also resonates, I'm thinking about the transport sector and knowing that there are so many, you could call them different brokers, fixers, uh, people who sort of go between the state and the union um, and they're doing different kind of jobs of stitching that space together. And so the more I think about it, the more I think that the, the Mookie might not be different from the, 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 the middle middlemen, and they were often men, um, who are also in the motor parks and bus terminals who are mm -hmm. constantly uh, going between. And it was always weird for me when I first started studying this space that I would see um, um, an agbiru, as they were called, uh, with a uh, traffic police inspector um, uh, in similar space, um, uh, working together. Um, and the way in which corruption within this space was so organized between this tout and this police officer. Uh, and in, in fact, people went on strike not because they were uh, being extorted, but because they wanted a standard place. Of, they want to know who is extorting, where are we doing the extortion, <laughs> and all those kind of things. There was a whole system um, here that sort of broke down the boundaries between legality and illegality, which is what Pedro was saying as well. So I think the, the role of the fixer has, um, it, it doesn't emerge within, again, going back to disciplines, however you want to, it, it, it's not a space, it, it doesn't emerge within, within a field that is too dualistic and it's about binaries and, and the like. It doesn't allow those figures to sort of, um, yeah. you know, emerge fully. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're right. And, you know, the kinds of temporary as well as long-term alliances that people make uh, within their communities, but also outside, uh, you know, uh, is, is, I mean, and, lit and literary texts give us real, you know, kind of examples of it, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, absolutely. Question, uh, Duncan, and then in the back. <laughs> oh, I, there seems to be a, a very urgent question in the very back. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your presentations, everybody at the panel. Um, so I have a comment and a question and a half. Um, 
Um, so for the comment, it is um, on the issue of uh, disciplinary boundaries. And um, even while you guys were speaking, I was thinking to myself that even conferences reinforce the idea of area studies. Like I, I would be attending the Africa Studies Association Conference, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's certain other conferences of similar um, you know, uh, uh, studies as well. So the question, which is the half question is, um, I would like it if you guys could rem imagine what an interdisciplinary, intersectional sort of field would look like in the, in, in the, within the bounds of the institution. What would that look like if a person, a graduate student, uh, you know, a young academic, um, a astute academic um, is, would be able to pursue and what, what that would look like in the future, given how different forms of tech, AI, and all these different media forms are now uh, platforms through which people have conversations. So that's the half question. The full question, which is a question of curiosity and perhaps a little bit of ignorance, is uh, directed to it, uh, Professor Desai. Um, in the ever-expansive archive of TikTok, I learned that um, the word Hindu is actually not um, a word that emerges out of India, but it's actually a product of colonization. Now, like I said, the preface is in the ever-expansive archive of TikTok, so that you can take that either at face value or whatever. Um, and so I was wondering, you, you cited, and I, I can't remember the word you used, but I think it was Guararav or something, where people go to give like a libation or something like that, or like gifts for prayers, I'm assuming. Um, in that kind of, and you say it doesn't matter what the person's religion is, that they go there. So is there a way you can explain how the word Hindu emerged, because this is just a subject of curiosity for me, um, and how it is that that frames into the Gorarav and how people, regardless of their religion, um, go to such sites to perhaps pray. Is it open to everybody who's Indian? Is it open to everybody regardless of whether they're Indian, perhaps even African? I'm just curious. So I have to confess, I, there may be other people in this room who know better about the etymology of the word Hindu. Uh, I have not studied it, so I don't really know. But I'll tell you, I can answer your question about the Gurudwara, which is a place of worship for Sikhs. Um, so th the primary worshipers in, the, in that space would be uh, you know, followers of the Sikh religion. But the, uh, the, the uh, Gurudwara is open as a place uh, you know, for anyone to go regardless of race, regardless of um, you know, religious belief or lack of religious belief, uh, to go and, um, uh, go and eat what is called langar. And langar is basically a kind of a, an offering that's, that's given. Um, you know, and it could be a breakfast offering or a lunch offering or a dinner offering um, to whoever comes, comes through the doors. Uh, and that's what I was referring to. And, and so that, guru, that particular Gurudwara, because it's, it's Halfway on the on the you know road between Nairobi and Mombasa has historically been used uh, in the old days mainly by in, uh, Indians, but today by everyone. Um, you know, if you just looked it up, uh, you know, you'll you'll see Google reviews of people who you know who who talk about what a wonderful meal it was and how clean it was and you know uh, and how welcoming it was. Uh, and this is despite the fact that today, of course, there are all kinds of you know other places to eat, um, you know, between between um, on, you know on the road. But that tradition still persists. Uh, so that, but does anybody in the room know anything more about the, the origins of, of the word Hindu? Because I don't. Um, we'll have to, that'll have to wait yeah. for <laughs> wait for another answer. I think. Um, yeah. But you guys, the, the the other half of the question, I guess. <laughs> I mean, um, do you want to go first, or? 
think you can attempt okay. it. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I'll, I'll you know, because uh, I'll get riled up. Um, uh, look, I mean, it's it's a difficult challenge because I think epistem you know, epistemologies uh, and the structures of sort of thinking and the and the kind of you know uh, map making of the world. Um, uh, are so deeply embedded in the American um, university, you know, area studies, you know, sector that uh, I think it, it will take, um, you know, a huge effort. But I think I, I think it's part of a kind of decolonial thinking as well, right? Is is uh, trying to go beyond those models. But while that architecture exists, and again, Indiana universities, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm in there. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, uh, you know, uh, take on the beast from the inside out, um, uh, not so much from the outside in. Uh, it's when I talk to colleagues, it's you know, it's a challenge. People, you know, I know and I like, but they are so invested in that model of, you know, and I'm I'm going to the South Asia, you know, the Madison Conference next week. The South Asia, the biggest like, you know, South Asian conference in the U.S. Um, uh, so it, it kind of reinforces those, you know, scholarly infrastructures as the only way to study, you know, a region. And then also what is a kind of like, um, you know, that sort of authenticness in a sense of, you know, the languages that are, you know, sort of tied to this one place or these list of languages and then, you know, not these other languages. Um, so, you know, I, that's a very unsatisfying non-answer to the question. Um, I think, I don't know if Duncan wants to say something, you know, I, I think in some ways the NYU, he's in the Gallatin School, uh, is something of perhaps a model where it's not tied to at least disciplinary, to any one discipline, uh, but also not tied to any one area. But I mean, as far as I know, the NYU Gallatin School is somewhat unique uh, in the US. Um, so it's, you know, because you've got also journals, you've got gatekeepers, you've got all the sort of other infrastructure that allows, disallows what you can or can't do, and then you know, coming up for tenure, things like that, what's, yeah, all that. And, and that's the issue. The, I, I don't think there's the incentive to do that. I, I think the incentive structure does not allow one to do that. Plus, there aren't too many people that have grown old with that kind of imaginary. So you don't have to, anybody to look up to and say, oh, this is a shining star. Not too many. The few and far between tells you that somewhere along the line, um, the system sort of ejects them. Um, so, so there could be, um, uh, as a young person looking up, um, uh, it takes a level of courage and vulnerability to do that. And I'm not always sure that's the smartest thing to, uh, to do. So, so it, it, there has to be the space where you can really imagine what it would look like. And at the moment, I don't think there's enough of that, uh, enough of that uh, space to really imagine that, um, unless you take it by force, of course. So um, I'm, I'm but, but yeah, but, 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 but this is it. So I'm remembering, wasn't it about 10 years ago or so that there was this new push in, in amongst historians for this world history kind of model? Not world history, but global history. Global history, global history. Whatever happened with that, is that still- It's like going strong. Deal? No, no, it's, uh, it's, you know, there's a journal of global history, okay. uh, which got established about 10 years ago. No, it's- Global sort of history framings are going strong beyond like trying to give globalization a history. Uh, and that is very much, you know, thinking relationally going beyond the comparative, which a lot of world history, so there is a distinction between world and global history, was about. Um, and also going beyond a kind of civilizationist, you know, thinking that also world history, and often it was at this kind of like meta level, the kind of totalize, these totalizing narratives. Uh, global history is trying to do things. So that's going strong. I mean, I will say just to, to add, like thinking about, you know, Indian Ocean studies is going very strong, but that's sort of like timing the last 10 years. There's a new journal called Monsoon. You know, there's a new African Institute in, you know, Sharjah in Qatar, uh, which has just been established from which, the, from which this, you know, Monsoon journal uh, uh, kind of emanates. Um, and so, you know, the Indian Ocean space as a trans-regional, trans-temporal space is like thriving, but that's just been... I hate to use the word, but like organically, uh, but also I think, you know, certain states, you know, in the Gulf, for instance, I think are also potentially using the moment to like reposition themselves beyond the kind of Middle East. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if 
just, I mean, uh, to share a personal experience. So I was, I was, uh, I did my PhD within the international and global history track at, at Columbia University with a bunch of other people in my cohort working across interesting uh, regions. So just naming some of the people in my cohort, someone working um, on really Tibet across China and South Asia, someone working uh, on um, sort of, uh, moder well, what is today, uh, um, uh, Iraq across kind of uh, a Persian space and an Ottoman space, uh, someone working on links between uh, Russians, uh, Muslims across, uh, across South Asia, uh, Russian Central Asia, and um, in, in, uh, in Arabia, um, in the region. And then myself working across sort of China and, and West Africa. So, and I, so I think there, there is, is a generation uh, or growing uh, group of people that are coming up with these uh, training, this type of training that is crossing across, is going across uh, traditional uh, area studies lines, but the problem is the job market. So, one <laughs> so for example, uh, one of my friends was, was trained as a as a cross as a South Asianist, a Tibetanist, and a and a, a sinologist has a job as a, a Qing historian. So she has to become a Qing historian, teach Qing history as you know everybody else does in a way. Uh, there's there's relatively little space if you know she wants to play it safe for tenure to 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 experiment. This is something I had to uh, you know. Um, think about the potential risks when I was in the and I know all my friends are, are doing so, but I think as people, as more people, you know, find their way, uh, uh, you know, um, maybe th there will be a critical mass to, to change things within institutions. If I could actually respond to the question um, about a, a vision for future uh, sort of convergences. Um, I might, uh, you know, not to draw too much attention away from the panelists, but of course, the one language that conjoins both continents is Arabic, historically. And um, if you think about the way in which Arabic studies uh, underserves the historical connections across both regions, mm -hmm. that, I think, is a potential point of entry into, into considering institutional reforms. Um, you know, if we imagine that we had a department where someone like Ronit Ritchie and Falun Gong would, or you know, their successors would be at home, authors of uh, Muslims Beyond the Arab World and uh, Islam Translated, conjoined with scholars of, um, who, were, who were doing, engaging in the kinds of work that, that those affiliated with the Timbuktu project um, mm. are, yeah? That I think, I, and I, you know, not to plug this too much, but I'm, uh, I have a book that's about to be published with Princeton University Press, Sacred Language Vernacular Difference, that actually makes a plea for a future Arabophone studies that kind of follows to some degree the model of Sinophone studies on this, a polycentric one that draws attention to um, Arabographic um, issues, issues of script and language and the coexistence between the sacred and the vernacular. So that is just one, albeit parochial um, in and in in of itself, parochial way of thinking about this. Um, how do we reconfigure our disciplines beyond European language connections? Okay, so um, there was another question from Duncan, yeah. I mean, this is just kind of in the same vein. Um, I guess a, a couple things. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the ways in which something like Indian Ocean Studies, what you just mentioned, is kind of a Arabophone studies situation. Um, like there was a big push for like Mediterranean studies a while back to try to get out outside of these area studies paradigms. So I think it's worth plumbing kind of uh, earlier formations of whether geographic, whether commercial, whether linguistic um, that get outside of those, those boxes, um, those disciplinary, disciplinary silos. Um, I guess I was also thinking about sharing my own experience um, coming out of, of the job market and everything. I uh, was really interested in doing African literature and modern Chinese literature. And so when I applied for a PhD program, I was very limited in terms of where I could apply and who I could work with. Um, really, I was limited to comparative literature departments um, and those that had an Africanist and somebody that does Chinese literature. And you can imagine how that <laughs> like made it very, very small. So I ended up on the West Coast 
um, and was very happy with the, the training I got. But then when I got to the job market, um, I had to make a very strong decision because I was also trained in Francophone, French stuff. And so I went on the market and I applied for positions ranging from world literature positions to post-colonial literature English department positions to Francophone literature department positions. And actually, I, my first time I went on the market, I was a finalist for a English department job where I'd be a post-colonial lit person but maybe more world lit, and a finalist for a francophone position um, uh, at another university. And so I had to make a decision, ultimately, which, <laughs> which one I was going to choose, and I ended up in the English department. Um, and I'd always felt like a, a bit of an odd fit for me because you know I do African literary representations of China. So how does that fit into the, you know, the kind of historical, Eurocentric, Euro-American focus of an English department. It was, a, it was an odd fit. Um, and you know, so sort of just to judge to what Pedro brought up earlier, and so now I'm at a place that's called Gallatin, the Gallatin School for Individualized Studies, some nice neoliberal logic to that. But what it is, is it's a small uh, liberal arts college that's very interdisciplinary. We're also an arts college embedded at, at New York University where we have around 60 full-time faculty, and we have everything from um, conceptual artists to volcanologists. And it's a really, actually, this sort of conversation the past two days, I felt actually very much at, at home in a way because I'm constantly asked to think across, um, you know, boundaries, even when people put together job descriptions, you know, kind of like there's a whole cohort that wants to close read the line edit the job description versus a whole other cohort that's just very much interested in larger conceptual frameworks and so on. So I think that, you know, um, all that to say is, is I think these spaces can exist. They can be, they can be uh, created, but they can, they, they're also, I don't know, the way in which knowledge is produced in the epistemological question, um, yeah, you have, to, you have to either get lucky and find yourself in a place that will recognize your scholarship and you're gonna be legible there, or you might have to think very strategically about how your scholarship is going to link up with you know, funding sources and departmental considerations and, and legibility in whatever field or method that people are going to uh, ultimately, you know, um, engage with you in. So it's more of a comment than a, than a question. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Thanks, John. Could I add something just real quick? I mean, I think, you know, I want to encourage perhaps a violent image, but creative destruction mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like, you know, rethinking areas uh, through kind of process geographies uh, that just don't fit into these models, but we should blow them up, you know? And I will say on a positive, non-kind of violent image, um, note that as Duncan was sort of suggesting, which, you know, happened to me, but uh, a few years back now, um, you can potentially sort of sell yourself on the job market in different ways, potentially opening up, like, more jobs that you can go for, actually, then sure, then when you take X or Y job and they want you to do X and Y te you know, teaching, then okay, that's, you've got to make a decision, but you can potentially actually sell yourself as an Africanist, as a South Asianist, as, I did, as a global historian. So I, I ended up, I mean, timing is everything, getting lucky, all that kind of stuff, but I ended up getting job offers in all of those, you know, uh, because although at one point I thought I'm an in, like an Indian Oceanist, I fall between two stools, Indian Ocean was sort of gathering some heat, but it wasn't quite there. So like I'm probably gonna you know land on that job, and in the end it was like this you know it was also again the moment right and jobs are now fewer and the COVID hit and all of that stuff and so um, you know uh, uh, um, also the ethical element of training an overabundance of grad students not to fit jobs is something else we could maybe talk about but maybe some other you know uh, some other time um, but I would sort of encourage those who want to do trans regional work keep doing it uh, um, because I. I think it's only by sort of you know, pushing that we'll get there. I mean, I think the formal training uh, that Idris was talking about doesn't happen in too many places. You know, there's a, PhD, there's a PhD minor at Indiana that I sort of manage, run, but it's a minor. There's not, so the kind of program that you came out of, they're not too, you know, they're not too many international slash global history training programs like that. So Columbia's, you know, that LSC tie up it has, you know, is again, kind of unique, but it doesn't mean that you can't I think the frameworks, the reading, the publishing that we are doing that th the students will read, I think, is going to encourage the sort of 
different kind of spatial geographies and these different kind of ways of thinking um, that then you can bring to bear on your own work and, yeah, you know, continue to embark on creative destruction. Sorry, it's probably also more a comment than a, uh, it's indirectly a question. Coming from Denmark, I'm a little surprised at not hearing anything about global studies um, because that's what we have and where there's both all kinds of disciplines as well as areas. We have an MA program where basically we, we combine the areas so people have to learn about their own, I mean they each, it's language based, so each student come in with a different language or group of students, and which means that when we're discussing waste, for example, in history or in global history or whatever, then uh, the Russians will be, or the Russian students, will be reading texts in Russian that they will share with the Brazilian, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Indian studies uh, students, and so, so that they learn about also themselves or their areas in the context of the world. And we also have, when we're looking at Africa, where it's basically looking at Africa from these different regions and discussing so what, wh how does different African countries play into these different areas, Brazil and Mozambique, for example, or Angola. So, so I'm just, um, and I guess the funding landscape in Europe may be a little bit different in the sense that we're very much looking for multidisciplinary work, uh, looking for collaborations between researchers else, I mean, in other regions outside of Europe, uh, to include them in the grants. But I guess my, my main answer to your question would be that this is not something that should be happening in Europe or in the US necessarily only, but it's much more the, the, the movement I've been a part of also with, with establishing Asian studies in, at African universities and African studies at Asian universities and, and, and seeing it happen elsewhere than in the US and in Europe. Sorry, so that's more a comment. Mm -hmm. There's another, oh, uh, sorry, there was another couple of questions here. Hi, um, my name is Zebib. I am in the Masters of Urban Planning at the Graduate School of Design. Um, I have a question directed to Daniel, but also to all the other panelists. Um, I lived in Lagos about two years ago for three months, so I was riding the Danfo, I was in KKs and Okadas um, and everything, and so I was just thinking about informal public transportation in cities like, like Lagos across Africa in India where there's so much traffic and congestion and um, informal public transportation has arisen because of complete lack of formal public transit. And what does it do to our cities when like, the downfoos have to arrive because there's nothing else to take people from place to place in cities? Recognizing that and all the jobs that they provide, how, what do you think about the need for public, like formal public transportation infrastructure and um, moves by the government to ban um, informal public transportation in different forms. Um, yeah, I guess I'm wondering about that tension between pollution from danfos and everything like that and needing public transportation but acknowledging that these are people's jobs and we can't just snatch it out from under them. I think part of the problem, I think the, the policy solution really is to look at the downfall itself and look at the way in which I was talking about the hybrid way in which it's constructed, right? It's a blend of ideas from multiple spaces, multiple worlds. And I think the thing with not just governors in Lagos, but in many African cities is that there's a sense in which they're not proud of these uh, forms of transport. So often the way in which they talk about them are uh, a degrading form of transport, not befitting of the status. And many of them anyway are in the hallways of Harvard and MIT always looking for new ideas that they can take back to their own spaces. I mean, remember I was in 2016 in Quito, Ecuador, <laughs> when governors from around the world, including, including Asia and Africa, uh, gathered together to, to think about the city. And the message that was put out there was really that they should go back and formalize the informal. 
And many of them went back and started, you know, banning these uh, vehicles, pulling them down. I, so I don't think the value of these vehicles are really appreciated. Um, and I think the, it's a very narrow conception of these um, forms of transport that is very utilitarian, very functionalist, but doesn't see, for example, the way in which the Kumbi was always part of one of the few ways in which black people first asserted their agency, uh, their entrepreneurial uh, spirit, uh, all of those, the way in which they're woven into, they're intextualized, they're part of the Afrobeats, they're part of Nollywood, they're part of culture, they don't see these. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's really the language of modernity, modernization, crisis. It's very spectacular, the language that is used. And, and I think, um, I think that go, goes back to the question of language and, uh, and, and, and the way in which um, I know you talk about uh, it's not always about the West uh, and shouldn't always be, and I agree, but I think when it comes certainly in these spaces like Lagos, uh, I think it's very clear the way in which those policies don't accommodate, they, they see the downfall as an obstacle, not as part of the problem. I give you the example of the bus rapid transit systems, which was an, an idea for Bogota in Colombia. Um, when it was brought to Lagos initially, funded by the World Bank, the, the whole, the, 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 the downfalls, the Okadas, they were all seen as obstacles. It was like, now we're going to create a dedicated lane for these bus rapid transit systems, and we're going to completely remove these guys from the road. There wasn't a system of, oh, could we have, uh, can they coexist within the same space? Um, it wasn't that. And, and, and again, it, it's, it's this very simplistic idea of just transplanting, trying to become a world class. It is why I am personally suspicious of words like global and mm -hmm. international and the rest. I mean, talk about global cities, but is Lagos a global city in that kind of discourse in the academic sphere? Um, so some of these, some of things don't really see, they don't see what is going on on the ground. It's, very, it's still very narrow in the way in which they are. Um, understanding it. And the only example I could give for policymakers is to really look at the downfall itself. And if you look closely at the downfall, you can figure out how things work because they themselves, you know, whether in slogans, in terms of the, um, the framework itself, it's, it's adapting something. They can bring a, a Bedford to Lagos and realize that, well, we have too many people. So they would go take it to the welder and change the seat arrangements and everything in a way that works with the potholes on the road in a way that allows more people to sit in the, in the vehicle. So they're adapting it to suit their own purpose. And I think what we have, unfortunately, is what Fanon says. There's an intellectual laziness, an inability to innovate out of uh, models that are brought from the outside. Uh, uh, and this is, part of the, this is part of the problem. I think we have time for one last question. I just wanted to ask a naive question. You know, you, the way you talked, especially about relationality, it seems that, for example, the discipline of political science is not represented. But you talked as though everyday infrastructure is where the domain of politics, where everything is being borders crossed, there's trans. Um, Culturality, there's hybridity, there is uh, conviviality, profane things are taken from different places, high culture, all disrupted by everyday life and borders crossed. And my, my attitude is, my thinking is that it's not in the, within the university disciplines where actually uh, transdisciplinarity will take place, but it's already taking a place, borders are being crossed and hybridized things taken from even languages, you don't know, Hindi, brought. Uh, so can you talk about how in the relational thinking you're talking about, where political, new political cosmologies or political ontologies are being created actually beyond, and, but you're not listening to where uh, everyday infrastructure configuration are taking place in terms of political, you know, political cosmologies through interaction and relationality, disarticulation, articulation with different regional kind of discourses or whatever, through images and te new technology, lower level technologies, and within a situated context, relationally, sorry, through interaction. Sorry. No, 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 um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sort of talk as if this is like a frictionless world right, where people just move and things move. I mean, there are, and here, are, you know, of course, the power of the state comes into play. There are regulatory, you know, frameworks. 
There is, you know, law and the violence of law in terms of, uh, um, you know, what it, uh, you know, allows or, or disallows with, you know, with the Dow trade, for instance, um, the liberalization uh, in the early 90s uh, uh, of certain, you know, trades that were kind of uh, in a quota system for Dow's, the liberalization of that, the removal of that was kind of somewhat devastating for the Dow trade. And, and that was an India state, uh, you know, change that uh, had an, impact and DAOs had to sort of uh, uh, adapt to that and, uh, uh, you know, there are all sorts of outcomes from, you know, from, from, from that. I think, uh, you know, the question about political uh, ontologies, did you say? New political cosmologies. Yeah, I mean, I think, and we don't know enough about this, I think the experience of those mariners on the boats themselves that are going to different, you know, catches, going to you know, the Gulf and to coastal Somalia and, you know, Mombasa or Lamu, um, how their kind of, uh, how their political cosmologies might, you know, shift through that experience, that kind of transformative, you know, experience, which is not necessarily, like I said, kind of tied to, you know, India or even, you know, Western India or Kutch even. Um, I, I don't think we know enough about that. Again, something of an unsatisfactory answer, but I think there's um, more work to be done ethnographically, I think, especially, um, even as folk like Nidhi Mahajan have done great work. I think there's need for even more work. I think, unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but uh, wait, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Um, yeah. thank you. One second, my 30 seconds of uh, concluding remarks. Uh, so as we bring our discussion to a close, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and extend our gratitude to everyone who played a pivotal role in making this event a success. Uh, firstly, uh, we'd like to mention that unfortunately the faculty director of the Harvard Asia Center, uh, James Robson, could not join us due to unavoidable travel but he was with us in spirit and he uh, uh, sends uh, his uh, uh, regards to us. A special thank you uh, goes to the Harvard University uh, Center for African Studies. Uh, our profound gratitude to the former director, Emmanuel uh, Achapong, uh, the current director, Ruth uh, Okedici, associate director, Rosaline Salifu, and Lina uh, Ben Abdallah uh, for their valuable insights and contribution. Um, uh, also, we'd like to acknowledge uh, Don Kan Yoon for his role through the conference in brainstorming themes and speakers. Um, they, and we're in support of the Harvard Asia Center, especially the executive director, Liz Liao, and the dedicated staff um, has made uh, this uh, um, uh, conference really possible uh, behind the scene uh, and on the scene. Um, and our sincere appreciation also extends to the Kumba Singer of Harvard University for gracing our event with their uh, talent and to the educational support service staff, uh, your commitment to ensuring seamless tech support made a significant difference uh, for this event. Thank you. Lastly, a, a heartfelt thanks to all the co-sponsoring centers and institutes for their collaborative efforts and to all the participants here uh, whose engagement has been really the lifeblood of this uh, uh, conference. Thank you all for uh, being part of this conference and we look forward to uh, more uh, meaningful uh, engagements uh, in the future. Safe travels and good evening. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes.